Yeah, yeah. Let's see a uh, second party inside. Yeah. 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 I'm in PD and you sound better. Oh, if that's the case, I didn't know if it was Yeah. 
my allowed to use that? Yeah, that's your seat. Maybe I'm like 90% sure. sure. That's Kennedy Stafford's seat, right? Um, that yeah, one. we're about to put the signs out. Okay, perfect. So we'll know in just a minute. Okay, perfect. Andy, you met, this is Heather. Mm -hmm. We met the other day. Yeah. I picked up my badge. Yeah. Oh, good to see you guys. Yeah, I don't know okay. if I have the uh, adapter for the outlet. Check, please. The plan for me, testing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 1, 3, 2, 1, by some step. That is. One, this is a very three, long four. Four. Get through uh, this, and then we're good. It's tomorrow's so session, not 30 o'clock. Night, tomorrow's 10 o'clock. You go down to witness people? Yeah. Yeah. I believe all witnesses tomorrow will go back. As far as I know, we have only four right now, as far as I know. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully you should be getting more classes. Right. I'm wondering if we should position the TV a little, so bit. A little bit askewed yeah. so they can see them up front yeah. when the witnesses are there. <laughs> You're way ahead of me. I'm sorry. No, why should this be on your okay. All right. And then they'll put your name on your seat. Yes. this a little bit better out so you don't have to you can drop that testing one two three four five six seven eight nine ten ten nine eight seven six five four three two one microphone check Chrissy say one two three four five six okay. seven eight nine ten right. ten nine hey Bridget can you take the white and just walk up here with it for camera three? I think he's getting some of the daylight coming through the door behind you. Okay. Keep going, keep going. Go, 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 go. go. No, right there should be her. Okay, you can go back and sit, please. Okay, he's calling in.
I'm over in room if you want to do a check. Mic check, please. This is a mic check. One. This is a mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Microphone check for the fan. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Isn't it Derby now? Chair? I think it's Derby. Chairman? Oh, can you come up? Yep, you can come up. Mic check, please. This is a mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Microphone check for seat fan. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
A confirmation hearing for Merrick Garland, President Biden's pick to be America's next attorney general. Garland is a federal judge and once worked at the Justice Department, he is now nominated to lead. Today marks one of the highest profile confirmation hearings for President Biden's proposed cabinet. This is a Washington Post special report. I'm Libby Casey. Welcome. Well, Garland's appearance before the Senate Judiciary Committee comes five years after he was denied an audience with them. At the time, he was President Obama's nominee to sit on the Supreme Court, but Republicans blocked him from even appearing for a hearing. Well, joining me this morning to preview what's to come today from Capitol Hill, congressional reporter Rhonda Colvin at the White House, political reporter Joyce Coe, and Matt Zapatosky, who covers the Justice Department for The Washington Post. Welcome to you all. Um, Rhonda, let's start with you. You know, today's an opportunity to learn more about Merrick Garland, but it's also a chance for senators to take center stage, sometimes playing politics, sometimes revealing their goals and agendas. What should we expect today? Well, today what we should expect is that Mayor Garland has received pretty widespread report, support uh, here on the Hill as well as off of the Hill. So this hearing is likely going to be fairly streamlined. I know that Democrats and Republicans both want to get him at the helm of the uh, DOJ very quickly. They've even expedited the process uh, that happens in the confirmation process for an attorney general, the committee work that will happen after today. So I would expect that this is going to be a pretty straightforward hearing. However, it will be a, an opportunity to see some partisan politics. We know from at least two Republican members, Senators Grassley and uh, Senator Graham, they plan to bring up Hunter Biden, the president's son. Uh, we remember back in December, Hunter Biden did announce that he was being investigated by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Delaware. That falls under the uh, DOJ, and so Republicans will likely bring up how Mayor Garland will handle that investigation. Democrats will likely bring up how will Merrick Garland handle any investigations, current or future investigations, of President Trump, his uh, actions on January 6th, and as well as some of his uh, tax dealings and the Trump Organization's uh, financial issues. So they, Democrats will likely press him on that issue. But in terms of uh, one bipartisan issue that you're likely going to see both sides of the aisle discuss is January 6th. Both sides want to know how Merrick Garland will handle a sprawling investigation into the insurrection uh, here on Capitol Hill. So you will likely hear that uh, starting off with the, uh, the leader of this committee, who is Dick Durbin now. He uh, is the top Democrat, and he will say in his opening statements that the issue right now is figuring out what happened on January 6th and hearing from Merrick Garland on how he's prepared to handle that. We know from Merrick Garland's background that he did uh, lead the investigation in the Oklahoma City bombing uh, event, and he is very well versed in extremist groups, and that is sort of a feather in his cap that uh, both Democrats and Republicans are looking for him to give insight on today. So that's what we're likely going to hear. And uh, in terms of this confirmation being fast-tracked, uh, this week, after he testifies today, tomorrow there will be witnesses, and then the committee will work on getting his nomination out of the committee. They plan to vote on that nomination a week from today. So early next week, we could see the full Senate vote on Mayor Garland. Mm, thanks so much, Rhonda. Uh, let's go to politics reporter Joyce Coe now, who's live at the White House. So Joyce, what priorities will be top of mind for Garland if he's confirmed? Well, Libby, there will be a number of key priorities for him, but as uh, you heard Rhonda mention, the Capitol insurrection will be top of mind for Merrick Garland. Uh, he will be discussing that today as well as being questioned by senators. Uh, and, and this is something um, that he will be overseeing. He will be supervising both the investigation and the prosecution uh, of the hundreds of uh, insurrectionists that stormed the Capitol on January 6th, and we know that that is uh, one of his main priorities. He called that a heinous attack uh, and that sought to disrupt a cornerstone of our democracy, he said. Uh, and as you heard Rhonda mention, back in the mid-90s, Garland was uh, the lead uh, overseeing the uh, Oklahoma City bombing. And so he has extensive knowledge and experience in the realm of uh, domestic terrorism cases. He also went on to uh, build a system at the Department of Justice that was used for uh, terrorist attacks like 9-11. 
7-Eleven as well as mass shootings. So uh, he, this is an area that he has extensive knowledge and experience in. The other main priority for him will be civil rights. Uh, we know that in his statements that he will be giving, he'll talk about uh, how America does not ha yet have equal justice. Uh, in his uh, excerpts that we received, he said, quote, communities of color and other minorities still face discrimination in housing, education, employment, and the criminal justice system, really uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, tackling injustices uh, systemically, which is, of course, what we saw uh, those countless racial justice protests um, over the course of the last year uh, speaking out about, that systemic racism um, that is pervasive in this country. And so he says that he will be um, uh, really tackling that as it relates to uh, the criminal justice system um, and how the um, communities of color face the brunt of the pandemic, pollution, and climate change. So we know that those two are top of mind for him. And then in addition to that, the way that he will be navigating sort of the political wa waters uh, of this confirmation process will be to, to mainly uh, send the message that he wants the Justice Department to be uh, an independent entity working, uh, you know, in a fair way, uh, aside from sort of the political and partisan influence, he says that he wants to uh, the department to remain independent and, quote, strictly regulate communications with the White House. Libby? So, you know, Joyce, the Biden administration is certainly focused on Merrick Garland, but there's also a, a lot else going on with the nominees, and they're scrambling on another front as they try to secure enough votes for Neera Tandon, their choice for OMB director. And that position leads the Office of Management and Budget. So what's the latest on Tandon's nomination? Well, there has been controversy with Neera Tandon over her tweets that she has sent and things that she has said uh, politically on both sides, um, on, on Twitter and social media. And so today we found out that Senator from Maine, Susan Collins, will be voting no on Neera Tandon, uh, joining with Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. Uh, Collins released a statement today that said in part, Neera Tandon has neither the experience nor the temperament to lead this critical agency. Her past actions have demonstrated exactly Exactly the kind of animosity that President Biden has pledged to transcend. Libby. Thanks so much, Joyce Coe at the White House. Let's go back to Rhonda on Capitol Hill. I mean, Rhonda, Neera Tandon uh, is, you know, uh, someone tight with Ron Klain, someone that President Biden has said he does want to see in that job. Um, what does it mean to have these two centrist senators coming out against her right now? Well, two things. It shows the strength of uh, Senators Manchin and Senator Collins, uh, because now we're looking at Mitt Romney and Elisa Murkowski to see how they're going to vote. And these are those uh, moderate Republicans that are going to be courted on, from both sides of the aisle when it comes to really tight and important votes. So uh, they, of course, showed their strength during the impeachment uh, proceedings uh, uh, the week before last and, and how they were the ones that led uh, some of the, uh, the criticisms and, and questions of the uh, defense team and uh, they voted to convict uh, President Trump. So they are kind of showing their strength. And and this also shows that uh, there are other people, too, on the Hill who are also a little concerned about Neera Tandon's um, her conduct online, her rhetoric against Republicans. It actually came up during her uh, confirmation hearing a couple weeks ago. Bernie Sanders, he has not given any indication on how he's going to vote. But in that meeting, he did scold her for her conduct online and saying it was divisive. So there are others out there. I'm not sure if they're going to follow uh, uh, Senators Collins or Senator Manchin, but uh, there are others who are concerned about Tandon's uh, rhetoric and, and wondering if this is a moment where it may not be a, a nominee that Biden gets through. You know, Rhonda, it's so fascinating to watch because on one hand, President Biden has called for you know, a, a real um, elevation of how people are treated in Washington as well as around the country. But we just saw the last president, not people he nominated or wanted to see work for him, but the last president bullying, criticizing, using rude and juvenile language to talk about people on social media. So how are the senators talking about that in terms of what was OK a year ago to some Republicans and is not OK now? Yeah, I think that's something that it will be addressed, especially if this keeps coming up, because you're right, this is a different standard that we are holding this president to that we uh, perhaps did not, the Senate did not 
hold uh, Trump to. And also with some of Trump cabinet uh, nominees, you'll remember that some of them did not have uh, direct knowledge or experience in the cabinet uh, level agencies that they were going to oversee. And there was a little bit of criticism with that, but they initially uh, ultimately got through. So there was also that too, that Neera Tandon does come with uh, some level of knowledge and expertise uh, that she can apply to OMB. And she's certainly been around Washington for a while, uh, but yet it's her rhetoric that now is being uh, part of the focus of and possibly putting her nomination in jeopardy. But it's something that I think uh, senators will likely bring up too when this is uh, discussed or brought up for a vote is how this is far different than how Trump's confirmations were handled and also how Trump himself was handled here on the Hill. Yeah, Rhonda, I mean, she has so much experience um, and as someone who sort of played that knives out game of politics for many years, which gave her the experience, but also is putting her in this in this political fray right now. Some uh, Democrats are saying also she's a woman of color and that Republicans are being tougher on some of those nominees who are not white men. Um, well, Merrick Garland is a, is a white man, Rhonda, so I just want to go back to you for one moment, Rhonda, to remind us the hearing starts at 930, and we do have kind of a, a, new, a new committee here because uh, we have a new Democrat leading the committee, someone who's been on it a long time, of course, has a lot of experience on Capitol Hill, but is a new face to run this committee. Tell us about the changes. That's right. So now that the Democrats run the Senate, Dick Durbin uh, just recently became the leader of this committee. So if, if people were watching uh, some of our other coverage of this committee, uh, I'm thinking back to the Amy Coney Barrett confirmation hearing back over in the fall. Uh, that was led by Lindsey Graham. But now it's Dick Durbin at the lead of this committee. And uh, you also have a few new senators, too, on this committee. You have Alex Padilla, who has taken over uh, Kamala Harris's seat. He will be on this committee. And you also have John Ossoff the uh, newly elected uh, senator from Georgia. So it's always interesting, too, to watch these uh, hearings because you're seeing uh, sort of um, the tone that's being set by a committee. And, and this is the first time that we're seeing this brand new uh, Judiciary Committee. And uh, it certainly will be a different dynamic now that it is being led by a Democrat. And uh, I know from uh, what Dick Durbin has announced about how he will handle this committee, he's uh, very interested in uh, civil rights and uh, equal justice issues. He's uh, met with uh, leaders of black organizations to discuss some of their priorities when it comes to the judiciary. So uh, that's some of his focus right now uh, in leading this this hearing. So that's something, too, for people to uh, watch as we uh, get underway at 930, that this is going to be a brand new Senate Judiciary Committee. All right, let's bring Matt Zapatoski into the conversation who covers the Justice Department. Matt, what does it mean for Merrick Garland to be appearing for this committee and be considered to run a department that he used to work in, the Justice Department? I think it means a lot to him. He said in his opening statement, a written copy of his opening statement that he'll deliver in just a couple minutes here, that this sort of represents the culmination of his career. You know, the Biden administration, I think, really liked him over some of the other candidates that they considered to nominate for the attorney general job because they thought he sort of brings a credibility and he sort of brings a, a restoration of the independence of the justice department you know he's not a sort of far left person he's not super progressive on things like criminal justice reform at least his judicial opinions haven't led led you to think that he would be like that so he represents just this restoring of the, the justice department's traditional independence that many people feel was eroded in the Trump administration as Trump talked about ongoing criminal cases involving his political allies and the Justice Department took steps in political cases involving President Trump's then President Trump's political allies to help those political allies. Merrick Garland represents the abandonment of sort of that and a return to a Justice Department that will just respect the rule of law and, and get away from politics to the extent it can. So I think that's what it means today. I, I expect that he'll have pretty wide support because he is so moderate, though there are some thorny issues that he'll have to answer for. The Justice Department is still conducting some political, politically sensitive investigations that he'll be asked to probably make some commitments on. I doubt he will make any commitments on those things, but he'll certainly be pressed about that today. Um, and, and you know, and and we'll see what happens. I do expect that he'll, he'll probably be confirmed um, with bipartisan support. And, you know, as I said, as he said in his opening statement, it will mark sort of a culmination of his, his long career. Yeah, we have seen those opening, uh, opening remarks. We do have a sense of what he plans to prioritize and talk about, Matt. 
You, know, you covered Merrick Garland's career prosecuting domestic terrorism cases, and as we've been hearing from Rhonda and Joyce, that's in sharp focus on Capitol Hill now in the wake of that January 6th mob attack. So tell us more about how his confirmation could affect the investigation process that's already underway. I'm sorry. Um, Matt, so how could this confirmation process and Merrick Garland getting in that AG job, okay, I think we lost Matt there. So let's go back to Rhonda Colvin. Rhonda, we've been talking about that January 6th attack and how Merrick Garland, you know, could end up overseeing this process that's already underway. Um, so what would it mean to have him in charge of that? Well, it's something that senators from both sides of the aisle say that he is uniquely qualified because of the, the devastation that he witnessed and led the investigation into uh, the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, he's calling that his uh, the most important case that he ever worked on. He was very moved and asked to be the lead investigator on that back in the 90s because of it involving so many children. You remember that there was a daycare center that was uh, part of that explosion and children died and, and 200 people overall died. So he was on the ground, and that's something that his colleagues say uh, was a, a moment that also showed his humanity when it comes to these, these really horrible issues. So uh, this is something that he will probably discuss at length when he is questioned today because he is uniquely qualified in, in understanding extremist groups and white supremacy groups, which were also a part of the planning of that bombing. So uh, it's something that it seems to be a straight line that he's able to draw and connect between then and now, and I suspect a lot of senators will want him to really discuss that. And also the January 6th insurrection investigation is something he will be walking in the door to if he is the, uh, the nominee that is confirmed for this. And we expect that he will be, of course. But uh, this is something that he will be have to work on on day one. And uh, there won't be any time for him to, to get uh, training or anything like that. So they're really going to uh, try to get inside uh, his mind on how he will handle that so quickly because it's a very big investigation. We know that 200 people so far have been uh, questioned and arrested in, uh, in, uh, their, because of their actions here on January 6th. So uh, this is a widespread investigation involving multiple units uh, that are under the DOJ and he'll have to oversee all of them. Well, let's go now to my Washington Post colleague, reporter and attorney, Mary Beth Albright, joining us now. So Mary Beth, how is this confirmation hearing going to differ from the hearing that Merrick Garland would have received when he was a nominee for the Supreme Court back in 2016? Libby, it's a great question because, you know, to a lot of people, a hearing is a hearing is a hearing, right? Uh, there's somebody who gets up, hold up their right hand, lots of cameras take pictures, and then they answer a bunch of questions. But the attorney general is a very different job than a Supreme Court justice. The attorney general is the chief lawyer for the federal government. And Joe Biden, every time a new president comes in, they get to bring in a new lawyer, like the head of any organization, you bring in your own people. And um, the attorney general also provides that legal advice to the president and to the cabinet. And so it's a very different job because it's an advocate for the law rather than an interpreter of the law, right? The Supreme Court justice just interprets the law, but the attorney general gets to come in and say, here are my priorities. Here's what we're going to focus on. And in service of that, Merrick Garland would oversee a Department of Justice with 113,000 employees. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a sprawling department, right? And it's a very um, horizontal department. Like there are a lot of people who are of equal sort of, um, stature, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word. And so the management of all those sections of the Department of Justice can get a little tricky. Um, and it's diverse, right? Because it's the FBI, it's the ATF, it's the DE, sorry, it's the Federal Bureau Invest Investigation, it's the Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms Division, it's the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. So there's a, it's a wide diverse, it's as, as diverse as a legal profession itself. And most of the people who work at the Department of Justice 
are known as career employees. So most of the people who are here now working at the Department of Justice were the same people who were working under Bill Barr's Department of Justice. And so, as I said, it's a very different job. And the Attorney General, as I said, gets to come in with priorities, right? So think about, um, just to name some former attorneys general, think about Jeff Sessions' priorities versus Eric Holder, Holder's priorities. Think about Robert F. Kennedy's priorities versus Bill Barr's priorities. Partisanship aside, it, they're just they're very different focuses that attorneys general will have. And the great thing about Merrick Garland and uh, Rhonda and Joyce and Matt have alluded to this, his legal career spans so much. His legal career spans being a prosecutor. It spans being a defense attorney when he was in private practice at, Ar at Arnold and Porter. And it covers being a, a, a judge. I mean, he has right now, what we really haven't talked about, Merrick Garland has one of the best jobs in the legal profession right now as a, a judge on the Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit. And to, to, to give up that job and to go be attorney general in a time that might be the most um, hot time to enter the Department of Justice since maybe Watergate uh, for a new attorney general. Um, it's a big deal and you need somebody um, who is going to be well respected. And if you remember back in 2016, when Obama um, nominated Garland for the Supreme Court in March, um, he was thought of as the centrist choice. Obama, there was some discussion in Obama's administration about naming a woman, naming a person of color. And Obama named Merrick Garland because he's very even, I mean, he's very even tempered. Can you imagine how patient you have to be to go through the nomination process, which he did of being being a Supreme Court justice, but no hearing, right? And, you know, times are different now. Amy Comey Barrett went through from nomination to starting a first day of the job in a month. But back then it was thought, okay, well, the Republicans fought um, a, a nomination in March when there was going to be an election in November and a new president um, in January. So um, he, I do think that even though Merrick Garland is a centrist candidate, he will face sharp questioning. It's a different world. Um, now than it was uh, five years ago. And when you're a Supreme Court justice in that kind of a hearing, you can answer questions with like, well, I can't answer hypothetical. Well, it depends on the facts of the case because it does, right? But for Merrick Garland, he is expected as attorney general to come in with priorities. And so this hearing is going to be a formality. Um, we all expect Merrick Garland to get confirmed, but it's a formality with a lot of important um, insight into where Mer Merrick Garland is going to put his priorities. Mary Beth, as you mentioned, you know, these career attorneys are in the job regardless who's at the top. So what are you hearing from those career attorneys at DOJ about how a change in leadership could change their work? Well, the change in leadership always changes work, no matter what organization you're with, right? Um, you get a new boss, it's exciting. What are the new boss's priorities going to be? Where's the new boss going to focus energies and resources? And I spoke to career attorneys at DOJ who date back to Janet Reno. And um, I think that it's even more exciting for them because Garland used to be a DOJ attorney. He knows what the ropes are. It's a very different department than it was when he was there 25 years ago, I think it was. But um, but whenever you have somebody who comes through the ranks and then becomes the boss, I think there is a, a, a specific excitement and anticipation surrounding that. And that he will come in and he will understand their work and he will understand their processes. And at the same time, there's an expectation of career attorneys, as there should be on the part of every citizen, that there is a solid wall between law and politics. You need the rule of law. And yes, he's a political appointee and he comes with uh, priorities and agenda, but there needs to be that solid wall between. And people look for, the career attorneys really look for um, an enforcer of the law and not an enabler of the president. And I spoke to several people who saw Bill Barr as more of the latter, the enabler rather than um, the enforcer. And so there's a lot of anticipation. The Department of Justice is, decide, is divided into sections. And when there's a new attorney general, traditionally in the first few months, 
the new attorney general goes to each specific section and um, they give presentations, right? Every department gives a presentation about like, here's our work, here's why it's important, Here why, here's why you should care. Um, so there's a lot of sort of anticipation and excitement around that, um, particularly for people who were in departments that were not necessarily prioritized in their minds, such as the Department of Environmental and Natural, Natural Resources at the Department of Justice, such as the Civil Rights Department, the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. So the questions they really have are, is the Attorney General going to get what I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Is the Attorney General going to have a political agenda? And is the new boss just gonna let me do my job? And so that those are those are the questions. They're all very normal questions that I think all of us would have if we got uh, a new boss. Mm, Back thanks, to you, Libby. Thanks so much, Mary Beth. We'll continue to check in with you this morning. Let's bring Matt Zapatowski back into the conversation, this time by phone. Matt, are you with me? Yes, I am with okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt, for rolling with this. L listen, uh, we just heard from Mary Beth how, of course, a change in leadership changes the direction of the department. A lot of people are making a comparison to the post-Nixon era right now. Who, who's making that comparison? Why are they motivated to make it, and what does it mean? Well, yeah, I think that, um, as, as I was sort of mentioning earlier, there is this feeling among Justice Department insiders, as Mary Beth just alluded to, and among just outside legal observers, Justice Department veterans out in the world, that the historic independence of the Justice Department had has been eroded under President Trump, under now former President Trump. Um, you know, even take something that happened late in then President Trump's tenure, where there's a guy who's running the Justice Department Civil Division named Jeff Clark, who is a little more amenable to pursuing the president's unfounded claims of voter fraud. He and the president sort of talk about an idea that would have him be installed as the acting attorney general and then maybe taking steps on voter fraud that would uh, that would allay the president, that would benefit President Trump and political officials in the Justice Department. President Trump's own appointed people threaten to resign en masse to protest this, this sort of uh, reminds people of the Nixon era when President Nixon sought to fire a special counsel investigating him or a special prosecutor investigating him, sparking what is now known um, as the Saturday Night Massacre. So, you know, people are seeing parallels between these, and then they see Garland coming in and restoring the Justice Department's independence, a lot like what happened in the post-Nixon era. You had all these sort of controls placed on, you know, the relationship between the White House and the Justice Department. And people hope, even if Garland doesn't institute kind of new policies, he just returns to those old policies and old norms, some of which might have to be codified. You know, I think one thing we saw in the Trump administration is if there wasn't sort of a written law against something, the president didn't mind pushing the bounds of just what was considered normal or acceptable. So maybe you would see some codification of some things to strengthen those norms. But to answer your question, I think that's why people are making that comparison. They see Garland restoring the independence of the Justice Department from the White House because they think that that was really eroded under the Trump administration. You know, Matt, in his legal career, Merrick Garland's been known as a consensus builder. Uh, but if you look at the priorities for the Justice Department he'd like to run, uh, they're among some of the most contentious uh, but top priorities for Democrats issues of our time. You know, policing, racial discrimination and sentencing, um, some things that really have to be hashed out here in America. So what are you hearing from inside the Justice Department about Garland's ability to move forward on a sweeping agenda? Yeah, look, you know, I think he will be confirmed pretty easily with bipartisan support because he is more centrist than some of the other picks that, that could have been, that President Biden could have, have picked. Um, but as you mentioned, these are not easy issues. You know, he's not coming into a Justice Department where all Republicans and all Democrats agree on what should be done. I'll just give you one example. You know, in the Trump administration, Jeff Sessions got away from doing big pattern or practice investigations of police departments to force reforms at those places. And how the Justice Department and past administrations would force reforms is they would get into court-enforced 
consent decree. So a police department would sit down, hash out an agreement with the Justice Department. They'd file it in court, and then the court would make sure police did more training, you know, got more technology, did whatever they needed to do to reform. Jeff Sessions instituted new policies to say we're not really doing consent decrees anymore. It just made it much more difficult to actually do that. I think people expect that Garland is going to come in and undo that, but that's a very contentious thing. Republicans today, I'm certain, are going to ask him about that and press him not to do that because they sort of see that as an infringement, you know, a big bad federal government infringing on states' rights or the rights of local police departments. Uh, You know, there are lots of issues like that. This isn't so easy. Of course, you know, he, in his opening statement, he talks in big platitudes about things that everyone mostly would agree on, you know, ending racism. Most everyone would agree on that. But when you get down to the details of what he wants to do, these things are contentious. Inside the department, I think much of it is welcome. There's one challenge inside the department uh, that I think he's going to have to wrestle with, which, which could be thorny, which is the charging policy. So under Eric Holder, the Justice Department, by policy, got away from charging crimes in such a way that they would drug crimes in such a way that they would trigger mandatory minimum sentences. This was very popular with progressives and liberals. It was not so popular with prosecutors in the department who thought, look, when we charge mandatory minimums, it's because the people we're dealing with are bad people. So that's a thorny issue that that Garland is going to sort of have to wrestle with. Does he upset the workforce and return to this holder policy? Does he modify it in some way and upset sort of the left flank of the Democratic Party? We'll see. Even after he is confirmed, he is going to face some thorny issues. And even if he won't commit to a lot of things today, as I expect he won't, I expect we're going to hear repeatedly, I can't talk about that because I'm Mm -hmm. still a sitting judge. I can't talk about that because I haven't been in the department, haven't had a chance to study this issue. He eventually is going to have to confront all these issues. And we'll see both today and going forward, you know, how he walks this sort of Tightrope. Yeah, Matt, it's important to point out that, you know, he is a federal judge and not all attorneys general have that past experience. So Merrick Garland both has a legitimate excuse and a reason to say I can't answer that because I sit on the federal bench, um, but also he brings to the job that experience of, of what it's like to deliberate and decide justice, not just argue for one side or another or maybe, you know, be a college professor and talk about it. What does his experience as a judge bring, give him, as he, and what, what does he bring to this job? Yeah, and the role is just so different. So I wrote a story, actually before he was nominated, about how some progressive criminal justice reform groups were sort of met on, on the possibility then of his selection, because his record as a federal judge was not so great to kind of the defense community. But his defenders very fairly pointed out, look, when you are a judge, the role is different. He's just interpreting the law and applying the law as it's written. And while, you know, progressive criminal justice reform minded people might not like the way that shook out, it's not as if he's supposed to institute policy from the bench. When he is attorney general, he will have the opportunity, actually the duty to implement President Biden's policies on a lot of areas. You know, this isn't just him sort of in in criminal matters. Of course, it is him just fairly enforcing the law and having that experience as a judge, you certainly would think would give him um, the kind of experience needed to do that. And also, kind of the credibility to do that. You know, he's not just a career prosecutor. He's also not a career defense attorney. He's supposed to have been judging a lot of these issues neutrally. And and as he does that in criminal matters in the Justice Department, you would think that would lend some credibility to his decisions. But he also has policy agenda that he is supposed to implement. The attorney general is kind of a unique position in the cabinet, because even though there is this historic independence. They're a member of the cabinet. They're supposed to implement President Biden's agenda. And we'll see how he does that. Because he has been a federal judge for so long, it's sort of difficult to know where he stands on a lot of issues. And because he is still a federal judge, uh, and because he won't sort of resign that until he's confirmed, I'm not so sure we're going to get a lot of clear answers today for where he stands on some of these issues. We'll see over time, but his being a federal judge really, you know, shields us from knowing a lot about 
where his head is at on some of these political issues, where he'll actually be able to make kind of a policy decision, not just about enforcing the law, but like where do we want to be on a particular issue? Yeah, Matt, so different than when Bill Barr uh, was uh, was in this uh, same position to be attorney general, and we were all looking at writings he'd done before being nominated to that post that almost seemed like an audition tape for, for President Trump to pick him for that role. We had a lot more insight into just what he thought, um, although certainly some of what Bill Barr did surprised even the Democrats uh, who had him in this room in, in the confirmation process. So always fascinating. Uh, Matt Zapatosky, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time. You're watching Thank a you, special Lily. report. Thanks, Matt. You're watching a special report live from the newsroom of The Washington Post. It's a little after 9 o'clock right now. We'll be right back. Sometimes you have to see to believe. Sometimes waiting isn't an option. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written with our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you. We're looking at a live shot of the Hart Senate office building, room 216, where preparation is underway for Merrick Garland's confirmation hearing for Attorney General. That hearing starts at 9.30 Eastern time, just under a half hour away. This is a Washington Post special report. I'm Libby Casey. With me this morning, Rhonda Colvin, Capitol Hill reporter, and Ann Marimo, reporter covering legal affairs. Thanks to both of you. Um, Rhonda, so less than a half hour here till we see senators take their seats and we see Merrick Garland uh, raise his right hand and be sworn in. Um, what will you be listening for in terms of lines of questioning coming from both sides of the aisle? What are their priorities? Well, we've already said that he has had been receiving uh, very wide support from both sides of the aisle. But of course, these hearings often uh, become a little bit of uh, political theater. And from Republicans, you probably will see some hard hitting questions about Hunter Biden. Uh, Senators Grassley, uh, Senator Graham also said that they will uh, go after him on Hunter Biden, how he will handle any investigations about the president's son. Uh, we also know that Senator Cruz has mentioned that he wants to ask questions about the uh, New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, uh, investigations into how he may have diminished the numbers of nursing home deaths in in uh, New York. So there are going to be some partisan politics that do come up. From Democrats, they uh, will likely want to seek assurances from Merrick Garland that he will uh, investigate President Trump, uh, any current investigations going on with his taxes or business dealings, and also potential um, investigations into the January 6th insurrection and what uh, role President Trump might have played there. So those are things that I'm not sure if we will hear Merrick Garland confirm how he will handle those issues, but those are some of the partisan politics that we might see um, here today. Uh, one issue that might come up because it is sort of a, a deficit in Merrick Garland's uh, career is his stance on uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, that's something that I know Senator Booker, who sits on this committee, said that he did talk to Merrick Garland about before today's hearing to talk to him about uh, racial injustice in judiciary, racial injustice in, in incarceration. And it, from Merrick Garland's very long resume, there, there aren't really any clear answers about how he will handle handle issues of civil rights. In his opening statement, as we've mentioned before, he will talk about um, his desire to uh, seek better uh, civil rights and equal justice uh, issues in the DOJ. But uh, from his resume, you don't see any clear cut um, experience where he has uh, had any sort of um, uh, cases about uh, policing and how he feels about those things. So since that is one very big issue that the, the Department of Justice has been dealing with in the last year, especially uh, in the wake of the George Floyd uh, killing, this is something that he will likely be pressed on by Democrats. Let's go now to Ann. Um, Ann, you've been uh, profiling Merrick Garland, look, looking at his career, and a line in a piece that you wrote struck me. You, you wrote that the Justice Department is facing a domestic terrorism threat that has metastasized with white supremacists and conspiracy-minded anti-government types emboldened by their acknowledgement from former President Trump. So walk 
our viewers through what Merrick Garland's experience has prepared him to talk about in this current national climate. Right, so back in April of 1995, Merrick Garland was one of the top Justice Department officials um, who quickly learned about the Oklahoma City bombing and became uh, one of the top prosecutors overseeing that case. Uh, he went to Oklahoma City, he was on the ground and saw what domestic terrorism looks like up close. Um, so for him, it's very personal. Um, so he understands what this threat is, how it affected families and children, um, and but he also understands the law and how you need to be meticulous to build a case. Um, and so as attorney general, that's what he'll do. You know, talk to us more about his uh, experience with Oklahoma City, because it is sort of remarkable that that's one of the things he was sort of best known for, um, uh, you know, in legal circles prior to becoming a judge. And, you know, it, it's coming at this moment when we're talking about white nationalists and domestic terrorism. So tell us more about what he did then, Anne. Yeah, so he was on the ground very early, um, handling hearings from um, Ted Kaczynski, or sorry, Timothy McVeigh um, early on, and also at the blast site working there and just seeing the effects of it. Um, it really required him as an outsider from Washington to bring together various law enforcement agencies. Um, and that's something he'll also have to do as attorney general. Um, early on, uh, there were questions about whether this was just a single act or um, part of a national rebellion. There were other threats. So he understands how to launch one of these big investigations. You know, you mentioned Ted Kaczynski as you were, as you were talking about yes. Timothy McVeigh, <laughs> but that is something else that Merrick Garland had experience in the Unabomber case. That's right. He was also one of the top prosecutors in the Unabomber case. So there are all these parallels uh, from the 90s when he was at the Justice Department previously. And so he brings that today um, and also his experience on the bench now for the last 20 plus years. Mm. And as you've been doing your reporting and talking to people, um, what insight did you get into how Merrick Garland might handle the questioning today as he goes before these senators in such a high profile moment? Right. So he spent the last 24 years as a judge on the influential Court of Appeals in Washington. So he's used to being the one on the dais asking the questions, um, not being the one on the receiving end. So I'll be really curious to see how he handles those. Um, he always comes across, even when he's on the bench, um, as having a ton of humility, very modest, very centrist. Um, sometimes he gets emotional, so we may see that too. Um, and he may be a little bit reluctant to answer certain questions um, because he is still a sitting judge and will still be a sitting judge until he is confirmed. What can we learn from his record as a judge about how he might approach the role of attorney general? Is it is it something you can deduce? Is it is it harder to tell than if he were, you know, just had been serving lately as a prosecutor or someone defending people? Right. It's a very different job. And so I think it's hard to know. Um, as an appeals court judge, you're really constrained by Supreme Court precedent and following what the law is. Um, his opinions were not flashy, um, but they were very uh, technically admired. Um, Judge Garland always sent many uh, law clerks on to the Supreme Court. So he's a lot of respect in that role. But it's very different than setting policy and, and leading a department. Um, he also did serve as the chief judge, though, uh, sort of the head of the court. And the courthouse really was his family, and he treated everybody that way. So I think you, you can see how he might run the department, but in terms of um, policy, it's a very different role as a judge. Let's go now to politics reporter Joyce Coe, who is outside of the White House. Joyce, what has President Biden said about what his Justice Department will look like? Well, Libby, President Biden has said that he wants his Justice Department to be the people's Justice Department. He was asked about this uh, last week when he was in Wisconsin for a town hall, uh, and he was asked whether or not he would want his Justice Department to prosecute Trump uh, uh, in the Capitol insurrection case. And he said that he does not want to be uh, involved in that or directing anyone to prosecute or not to prosecute. He wants to sort of restore the integrity and the independence of the Justice Justice Department. He said of uh, the his predecessor, um, President, former President Donald Trump, um, and his administration, saying that uh, one of the most serious pieces of damage done by the last administration was the politicizing of the Justice Department. So Biden's priority here, uh, especially with uh, the appointment of Merrick Garland and potential confirmation, is to um, take 
the Justice Department and, and, and sort of restore the independence of it. Uh, in addition to that, uh, just as a sort of reminder of what the Trump administration looked like and the Justice Department looked like under Trump, uh, you know, we saw Bill Barr, who was willing to really go to bat for Trump uh, and, and act as a Trump loyalist and sort of protect him um, legally, which is what Trump expected of his attorney general. Uh, and before Barr uh, and, and sort of how he defended Trump on matters, you know, spanning from racial justice to uh, racial justice protests to the um, Ukraine matter that sparked uh, former President Trump's first impeachment um, case was um, Ad Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who ended up recusing himself from the Russia investigation, but that also angered pres former President Trump uh, a lot because he didn't see that as a um, sort of, uh, he sort of saw it as a um, sort of breaking with um, the allegiance that he had to Trump. So uh, we really see the Biden administration stressing that they want to restore independence to the department and really stay out of matters that politicize the department further. Libby? Thanks so much, Joyce Co. Uh, let's go now to Rhonda Colvin. Rhonda, we're seeing Chairman Dick Durbin there getting prepared for this hearing, um, pointing out, as we've talked about, that he is uh, the new chairman. The top Democrat on this committee before Rhonda was Dianne Feinstein, and Dick Durbin is a spry 76 years old uh, compared to Senator Feinstein and Senator Grassley, who's the top Republican on this committee, both in their late 80s. Um, and there were criticisms of how Senator Feinstein uh, was serving as the top Democrat on this committee. Dick Durbin is going to try to bring his own approach here, uh, put his own imprint on this. Uh, what can you tell us about how his leadership will be in this committee? I would expect his leadership to be uh, more about building a consensus between uh, the two parties on this committee. Uh, usually when we have judiciary hearings, they do become events of political theater, especially when you have something like a Supreme Court nomination. And there have been, um, you know, times when uh, you've definitely seen that, that tension between the two parties on full display in the judiciary hearings. I, I think Dick Durbin wants to uh, set a tone, and he will likely set it today, of being a uh, bipartisan builder. Uh, he has worked with Chuck Grassley, who is the top Republican right now on this committee, in getting this hearing scheduled. In fact, uh, the Merrick Garland hearing, just getting to today, actually uh, had some issues. When uh, before Dick Durbin took over as chair, uh, Lindsey Graham was the chair. And right before the impeachment proceeding, uh, Durbin had sought uh, Lindsey Graham and other Republicans to help him fast track this hearing and to schedule it before the impeachment so that it could get out of the gate before they got into that trial. But uh, Lindsey Graham stalled that and said enough time hadn't passed. There usually is a pause um, that uh, attorney general confirmations take with this committee. They usually take about 28 days from nomination to the hearing. And Lindsey Graham said not enough time had passed and he was not going to schedule it. So uh, that was before Dick Durbin was officially the leader of this committee. And uh, he decided while this was while the impeachment proceedings were going on, he and Grassley decided that they would pick up with the Garland nomination um, as soon as possible. So the Senate is back this week. They were off last week. Now they're back. And this is the, really the first order of business uh, for the Senate uh, on the Hill this week. Um, so he is likely going to be someone who wants to strike a bipartisan tone as the chair of this committee. And uh, I think we'll We'll see exactly uh, what his intentions are in his opening statements today. They're, they're pretty lengthy. I, I read <laughs> what he expects to say, and I think they're longer than Merrick Garland's, honestly. But um, I, I do expect him to want to kind of tone down uh, the political rhetoric that we often hear in this committee. You know, Rhonda, he may want to do that, but there are some uh, real, real firebrands uh, on the Republican side of the aisle. To my count, four who might run for president. Uh, in the next election cycle. And we're also going to be watching Ted Cruz in particular, of course, because he has been so criticized and under the microscope after his decision last week to go on vacation in Cancun uh, when Texas was going and is still undergoing that devastating uh, weather and energy crisis. So let's talk about uh, the Republicans on this committee and who you'll be watching. 
Right. You have uh, Senator Ted Cruz. Of course, I think a lot of people will be tuning in and wanting to see him. This will likely be the first time that we've seen him uh, on the Hill or a part of Hill proceedings since that uh, the controversy of going to Cancun while his state is handling uh, really devastating conditions. So uh, he's someone that generally is usually hard hitting uh, when he uh, is questioning a, uh, a potential nominee or, or somebody in front of this hearing. Uh, you also have someone like Marshall Blackburn, who has uh, been a very close ally to uh, President Trump, and she she usually comes toward the end of the questioning uh, and usually does strike a, a very partisan tone. Um, you have uh, Senator Hawley is also on this committee. He's somebody that you've uh, likely heard his name in association to some of his comments uh, on uh, January 6, wanting to stop uh, Biden's uh, electoral college count that day. So uh, there are uh, Republicans on here that, that may use their time uh, in, in sort of a partisan fashion. Uh, it's something that, you know, you often get used to when you watch these hearings. But uh, what's important this time around is that this candidate in front of them has received so much support uh, here on the Hill, but also off the Hill. He, uh, on Friday, there was a letter submitted to this committee uh, that uh, was a letter of support from uh, AGs from the Obama administration, as well as the AG from the George W. Bush administration, as well as some of his former colleagues, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, at the DOJ. So this, Merrick Garland himself, um, at least in this hearing, uh, may present an opportunity for these senators to be a little less partisan. But of course, any time that senators are, are getting, you know, their five minutes to ask, mm -hmm. ask questions, uh, I would suspect some theater. Yeah, Rhonda, I, I, can, I can anticipate that they will use this moment to go after political issues, maybe the Biden administration generally, even if they don't try to pin uh, Merrick Garland down or criticize him directly, they'll certainly be criticizing uh, the Biden administration, like you said, bringing up Hunter, uh, et cetera. And I'm sure Ted Cruz would love to change the conversation, so we'll be watching to see if he tries to do that today. Um, you know, as we see Senator Durbin there, the chairman of the committee, he's been on this committee for more than two decades. So uh, uh, an opportunity for him to uh, steer it in the direction that he wants, but someone who brings so much experience to sitting on this committee already. Um, let's bring Ann Marimo back in. Um, and one word that came up a lot in your reporting to describe Merrick Garland is methodical. Um, so, so how will his approach likely differ from his predecessors uh, heading the Justice Department? Garland in his opening statement is expected to talk a lot about uh, bringing the independence back to the Justice Department. Um, as you mentioned, he faces some of these really big issues of our time about uh, racial injustice, fighting white supremacists, domestic terrorism. Um, I think that he will go about that by trying to bring people together um, from across the Justice Department, the Civil Rights Division, uh, the National Security Division, and just take his time and hear from everybody and try to make the right decision. Um, also following the law and understanding how any of these decisions will be scrutinized. Um, and that's what you also saw in his opinions on the bench uh, for over 20 years. Um, very technical and modest, um, not going too far um, and trying to bring people together. He often did not dissent um, and tried to bring all the different parties together. So I think we'll see that um, in his leadership at the Justice Department as well. And what have we heard from President Biden about what he expects from his attorney general in terms of that relationship? Because, of course, the relationship Trump had or tried to have with the people leading the Department of Justice, the FBI, you know, was was so weighted and politicized and criticized by Democrats. Right. Biden has said this is not his Justice Department. This is the People's Justice Department. Um, both Biden and Garland talked at the formal ceremony about the Justice Department's history after the Civil War, um, fighting the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so I think he expects Garland to take over, to be independent, um, and to follow the law and not to make decisions based on politics. Um, you saw with Bill Barr getting involved in the cases involving Donald Trump's friends um, and former advisors like Roger Stone and Michael Flynn. Um, I don't think that you'll see that with Merrick Garland and Joe Biden. Let's bring in our colleague Mary Beth Albright, who's been looking into Garland's legal career. So Mary Beth, you're both a Washington Post reporter and a lawyer. Um, so how has Garland's work been seen in the legal community? 
Well, it's interesting, Libby. It's hard to do a brief history of Merrick Garland. Um, he is 68 years old and has a long and really honored career. Anne was talking about this before, so was Rhonda, that um, he was named to the D.C. Circuit um, back in 1997, which was about a decade before Brett Kavanaugh. And even before that, he had had such a long career. It, and and the, the seat he was named to, it's interesting, was Abner Mikva's seat, um, and Abner Mikva was another branch hopper between executive, between uh, legislative and judicial, and also uh, was like a mentor to him. So it, it, to Merrick Garland. So you can actually do some sort of like a legal family tree with the DC legal community. Sometimes he was clerk to Justice Brennan. A lot of Merrick Garland's clerks went on to clerk on the Supreme Court. So it becomes the career also becomes like a little family. And as I mentioned earlier, he also wove in and out of private practice. He wove in and out of um, the Department of Justice. And we talked a lot, we've already talked a little bit about um, the Oklahoma City bombing, his role in that. You cannot overstate the importance of Merrick Garland getting on a flight right after the Oklahoma City bombing happened. He was in DC and he got on a flight and he went there to be on the ground during the investigation. I mean, attorneys are not often on the ground in an investigation like that, where there's, you know, first of all, there there are uh, Department of Justice's employees um, inside of were inside of the Oklahoma City the Murrow Building, um, so there was that sort of uh, emotional aspect to it, but also to be dealing with the state law enforcement, the federal law enforcement, um, that that sort of reigning in of the circus, and I don't say circus pejoratively, I just mean it's a lot of different people with a lot of different interests, and so his ability to do that that um, really can't be overstated. He's got a great, great temperament. So Mary Beth, you know, he's had this long legal career. He's really known in the legal circles, as you mentioned, in Washington, known in this town. So what have his nomination hearings been like before? What's been the tone and tenor? Well, it's interesting. Uh, the, the, the tone and tenor of a confirmation hearing in 1997 is very different from the tone and tenor of a confirmation hearing in 2021. We are not living in centrist times, um, and he is a centrist. And so hopefully we're still living in a, in a time of walling off the law uh, and law enforcement and politics, because that's really um, the main concern for the attorney general is to serve the people, to be the people's attorney and not just the president's attorney. And, you know, when he was on the DC circuit, he rarely wrote dissenting opinions. Um, even when he disagreed with the majority of opinion, with the majority opinion, he didn't write a dissent because of that collegiality, because of that sort of need to show that the law is um, above politics. And he was also, when he was chief judge, really into transparency. He was um, the first judge to allow recordings of court proceedings to the uh, public, to uh, allow the public to access them the same day uh, as the actual here, uh, the um, court uh, proceedings took place. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see um, how people treat that and what kind of questions people ask him. Fascinating hearing coming up. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Fascinating indeed. And we just saw there uh, Chairman Durbin talking with some other Democrats, Senator Blumenthal, Senator Whitehouse, uh, now talking with Senator Grassley, the top Republican on this committee, as Rhonda mentioned to us earlier. Of course, Lindsey Graham also has a prominent role on this committee as a Republican who has led it. Um, let's go back to Ann Marimo. Ann, you know, uh, we just heard from Mary Beth about this sort of centrist, moderate, trying to, uh, moderate trying to sort of, you know, build consensus and, and show collegiality. And yet most Americans, when they think of Merrick Garland, they think of absolute gridlock and like debacle of Washington in that he could not even get a hearing uh, before this committee when he was President Obama's pick to be a Supreme Court justice. Right, I think of this as sort of a do-over from 2016 um, and here he is again um, b before the Congress uh, trying to get a vote. Um, I do think it will be very different this time. Um, at, at that moment, um, the Senate and Mitch McConnell had said they were going to block all of Obama's judges. Um, and now I think he will get bipartisan support. As um, you've been saying, I think Republicans may use this to make other points about the Biden administration, mm -hmm. but it won't be about Merrick Garland. A mm. uh, great point. And, and why is that important for them, Anne? Why, why do they use this moment to sort of try to make other points and 
get, get, get other issues in play? Sure. I mean, this is an incredibly important role. The nation's uh, top law enforcement official handling all of these big issues of the day that will be hotly debated. And so this is a forum um, to be seen and written about um, and to handle those and air those issues and concerns. And reading the questionnaire that Merrick Garland was given and answered was just fascinating um, and, and such an insight into his vast resume, his experience, but also like his volunteer activities, what associations yes. he belongs to, um, his synagogue. So you start to get a rounded out picture of a person. Right, I'm so glad you mentioned that um, after 2016, I mean, it was very disappointing personally, obviously what he went through, um, but he's someone, family is so important to him um, and also just continuing to give to the community. Even during the pandemic, he's continued to tutor um, twin middle schoolers um, over the internet, I think on Zoom, um, and they've taught him all about their online learning platform. So he's still very much involved. Um, his colleagues, when he stepped down as chief judge, um, jokingly referred to him as the mensch on the bench. Um, he's just really beloved by all of his colleagues on the court. All right, Ann Marimo, thank you so much. Let's go back to Rhonda Colvin. Um, Rhonda, we've been talking about what an important moment this is for the nominee, Merrick Garland. Um, uh, he's taking his seat there. Also important for the senators, you know, we all know how much of a, an impact Kamala Harris made, for example, um, when she was sitting on this committee and putting Republican nominees under the microscope. Um, give us the modern day parallel here. Yeah, and I was here uh, covering Jeff Sessions' uh, confirmation hearing, and that's when Kamala Harris was that standout who questioned him with a lot of hard questions, and uh, that was really one of the first times America saw her. Uh, Rhonda, this we're time gonna, around, we're, pause we're going you there. to see... Yeah, we're going to just pause you there uh, as, the, as the committee gavels in, as Merrick Garland has taken his seat. Thank you. ...86th Attorney General of the United States. Judge Garland, I want to welcome you and your family. Uh, I want to welcome you back to the Senate Judiciary Committee. I know this return trip has been a long time in planning, uh, and you're here finally. This will be the Judiciary Committee's first hearing of the 117th Congress. Before I turn to my opening remarks, I'd like to just take a few minutes to make some acknowledgments. I want to welcome my friend, Senator Chuck Grassley, as a committee's ranking member. When I first came on the Senate Judiciary Committee 24 years ago. I was the ranking member on a subcommittee with you, and we dealt with the issue of bankruptcy. Now, Illinois and Iowa sit next to each other, and so do Durbin and Grassley. We have our differences, but Senator Grassley and I have worked together on important legislation over the years, most recently on criminal justice and sentencing reform. I look forward to continuing that work in this Congress. I want to recognize the outgoing chair and ranking member, Senator Lindsey Graham, who will join us remotely this morning, and Senator Dianne Feinstein. Senator Graham, as is true of Senator Grassley, while we don't always agree, has always been a welcome partner on many issues, including one of the most challenging issues, immigration. Senator Feinstein, I want to commend for leading the committee Democrats with grace and resolve over the past four years. I know uh, she will continue to be an important voice on this committee on a host of issues, including in her new capacity as the chair of the Human Rights and Law Subcommittee, which I was proud to chair in past Congresses. I also want to welcome our new committee members who will either be here in person. I see one in person and one probably remote. Senators Padilla and Ossoff on the Democratic side, Senator Cotton on the Republican side. I look forward to working with each of you. There are some historic firsts in the Judiciary Committee this year. Senator Padilla, our new senator from California, will be chairing the Subcommittee on Immigration, Citizenship, Border Safety. I'm honored that he's the first Latino senator to chair that subcommittee, and we look forward to his leadership. Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey will chair the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice and Counterterrorism. He's the first black senator to chair a Judiciary Subcommittee and we could not imagine a better choice at the helm of this particular subcommittee. To all of our other members who are returning to serve on the committee, welcome back. I want to thank all the committee members for agreeing to hold this committee hearing and vote on Judge Garland's nomination. It is a great honor to serve on this committee. The Senate established the Judiciary Committee by resolution on December 10, 1816, making it among the very first standing committees of the Senate. This committee has seen many consequential debates and approved many important nominations and landmark legislation. 
In the committee's history, there has only been one prior Illinois senator to serve as chair, Judge Garland, Lyman Trumbull, who led the committee from 1861 to 1872, and during his term of service was a Democrat, a Republican, a radical Republican, and a Democrat again. He was the most bipartisan senator you can imagine. His tenure was also distinguished by passage of historic legislation, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, the Freedmen's Bureau Acts of 1865 and 1866, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The last of these was introduced by Trumbull and ultimately became the nation's first civil rights law. As Chair Trumbull saw a nation torn apart by original sin, slavery, and widespread violence and injustice, that continued even after the 13th Amendment's passage as African Americans throughout the nation face racism. Our nation is still dealing with the consequences of these injustices. People of color face systemic racism, and we are still working to rid this nation of the horrific legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. This committee can make a difference. We have the jurisdiction and the opportunity to do it through legislation, oversight, and nominations including this nomination of Merrick Garland to serve as our nation's next Attorney General. There have been few moments in history where the role of Attorney General and the occupant of that post have mattered more. Judge Garland, should you be confirmed, and I have every confidence you will be, you'll oversee a Justice Department at an existential moment. After four tumultuous years of intrigue, controversy, and brute political force, the future of the department is clearly in the hands of the next Attorney General. Under Attorney General Sessions and his successor, Bill Barr, the Justice Department literally became an arm of the White House, committed to advancing the interests of President Trump, his family, and his political allies. It came as a little surprise then that the U.S. Department of Justice became the Trump Department of Justice. General Barr stated clearly that he believed the Attorney General was the President's lawyer, not the nation's. And what were the results? Too many in the department's senior roles cast aside the rule of law. Trump appointees in the department sidelined career public servants, from line attorneys to FBI agents, limited their roles, disregarded their nonpartisan input, override, overriding their professional judgment, and falsely accusing them of being members of the deep state. And the department pursued policies of almost unimaginable proportions, from separating thousands thousands of innocent migrant children from their parents to banning innocent Muslims from traveling to our shores, from defending and even ordering violent crackdowns on peaceful protesters to parroting baseless lies about voter fraud in the lead up to the 2020 election. The misdeeds of the Trump Justice Department brought this nation to the brink. In fact, as we learned after President Biden's inauguration, a senior official in the Trump Justice Department Jeffrey Clark, plotted with President Trump for one final stab at the results of the 2020 election. They were thwarted at the last minute by Justice Department attorneys who threatened to resign en masse rather than join their effort. So, Judge Garland, it's no overstatement to say that your nomination is one of the most critical in department history. When I reflect on it, I'm reminded of two previous attorneys general, one a Democrat, the other a Republican. Robert Kennedy, Edward Levy. Kennedy entered office at a time of political turmoil. Although the nation had started down the path towards civil rights, Attorney General Kennedy recognized that equal rights and equal justice under law were still an aspiration for too many people of color in the United States. In June 1863, several years into his tenure as AG, Kennedy testified before the House Judiciary Committee. He said, the demonstrations of the past few months have only served to point up what thinking Americans have known for years, that this country can no longer abide the moral outrage of racial discrimination. He continued, if we fail to act promptly and wisely at this crucial point in our history, the ugly forces of disorder and violence will surely rise and multiply th throughout the land, and grave doubts will be thrown on the very premise of American democracy. The moral outrage of racial discrimination remains with us today, as do the forces of disorder and violence. And tragically, the, the Justice Department in the previous administration fanned the flames of discrimination. 
but a restored Justice Department, a department under new leadership, can and I, I believe will meet the moment. There are great challenges ahead. The right to vote is under constant assault by those who wish to suppress the voices of communities of color. We have a criminal justice system still in urgent need of reform. And too many Americans, whether because of race, national origin, disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity, face inequality in their daily lives. It is time for the Department of Justice to confront these realities that unfortunately continue to threaten, as Robert Kennedy said, the very premise of American democracy. Judge Garland, when I think of what you face in restoring integrity and independence to the Justice Department, I also think another, of another one of your predecessors <coughs> and fellow Chicagoan, Edward Levy, who likewise assumed time, the office at a time of turmoil. Levi had, of course, been president of the University of Chicago before his nomination to serve as Attorney General for President Ford. And when he came before this committee for his confirmation in 1975, he was asked about removing the Justice Department from the ambit of par partisan politics. This is what he said. I do not believe that the administration of justice should be partisan matter in any sense, but I do not think the cases should be brought to reward people or to punish them for partisan reasons. He continues, I think it would be a bad thing for the country to believe that the administration of justice was not even handed because it was in some ways tilted by partisan politics. Why was this question asked? Why was Levy's response so important? Just two years earlier, President Nixon had attempted to use the Justice Department as his personal law firm, ordering Elliot Richardson to fire Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor overseeing Watergate. Richardson rightly refused to fire Cox, as did its deputy, William Ruckelshaus. And so each of them were fired in what became known as the Saturday Night Massacre. Richardson and Ruckelhaus refused to act in a way contrary to the rule of law. They refused to put partisan politics in the personal interests of President Nixon above fidelity to the Constitution and the principle of equal justice for all, even those who occupy the White House. In the wake of Nixon's action, the Justice Department faced a reckoning with the Department's legacy still tarnished and public confidence shaken. President Gerald Ford turned to Levy to restore honor, integrity, and independence. Well, Judge Garland, the nation now looks to you to do the same. The public's faith in the Department of Justice has been shaken, the result of department leadership consumed with advancing personal and political interests. In fact, had it not been for several Justice Department attorneys I mentioned earlier threatening to resign this January, President Trump might have gone even further than he did to overturn the election results. And that raises critical questions this committee and you must reckon with. Judge Garland, we're confident we can rebuild the department's once hollowed halls, that you can restore the faith of the American people in the rule of law and deliver equal justice. I want to close by returning to the attempt to overtone the 2020 presidential election. You probably noticed when you came to Capitol Hill how it's changed. You lived most of your life, and I've lived a large part of mine, coming to this Capitol Hill to visit, to work, uh, really to honor the traditions of these buildings. We now have established a perimeter around this building. It stretches for blocks in every direction, and a 10-foot high fence that walls off this Capitol building from the rest of America. At the top of the fence, barbed wire. Inside the fence, we have not only our loyal police force but men and women of the National Guard from all over the United States, thousands of them, still standing guard over this building. What a commentary on the current state of America that we face today. But it's needed. We were here on January 6th. We lived through it. We were lucky for most of us. We were not in direct contact with the mob. Others were, and sadly paid a heavy price for it. For months, President Trump spread falsehoods about the election and fraudulent voting. And before a single vote had been cast, he claimed that he could only lose as a result of fraud. Far too many Americans gave credence to these unproven, dangerous claims. We know the result. We saw the attempt to subvert democracy, culminating in the events of January 6th, when this armed mob stormed the Capitol, sought to disrupt the counting of electoral college votes, violently targeted Congress, our colleagues in the House, our families, 
even the vice president, staff, ultimately causing the senseless deaths of Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick and Howard Liebengood and D.C. Police Officer Jeffrey Smith. When you are confirmed, Judge Carlin, you along with the rest of the nation will continue to grapple with the January 6th attacks, but you'll be in a unique position with a unique responsibility. As the nation's chief law enforcement officer, you'll be tasked with a solemn duty to responsibly investigate the events of that day to prosecute all of the individuals responsible, and to prevent future attacks driven by hate, inflammatory words, and bizarre conspiracy theories. You know what it's like. You've been there before. You've seen domestic terrorism. You led the investigation and prosecution of the, Olympic, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, and in doing so, made the nation safer and brought made some measure of peace and healing to the victims and their families. I'm confident that given this prior experience, you're up to the task the department now faces in the wake of January 6th. In fact, I can think of few people better suited to do it. I look forward to hearing your testimony, but at this point, I will turn to my colleague, Senator Grassley. Thank you, uh, Senator Durbin. Uh, welcome to Judge Garland. Glad that you've been honored with this appointment to be Attorney General of the United States. Uh, welcome the public at large, most of them very remote, not the large crowds we normally have when we have an Attorney General nominee before this committee. I have a longer statement that I'll put in the record, and I've still got plenty to say even this morning. I, of course, congratulate Senator Durbin on his uh, new role as chairman. Uh, he has already referred to he and I getting acquainted uh, on the Administrative Oversight Subcommittee uh, and working on what now is badly needed law when agriculture is in bad shape by passing Chapter 12 Agricultural Bankruptcy Legislation. Uh, and I look forward to working with you in the future here. And I also want to express my admiration for Senator Feinstein, the previous Democrat leader of this committee. She and I have worked closely together uh, during the years that uh, I chaired and she was ranking member, and I uh, thank you for your leadership. I'd also like to say a word about Judge Garland. This is, of course, Judge Garland's first time appearing before this committee since ascending to the federal bench. I had uh, something to do with that after the death of Justice Scalia. My Republican colleagues and I decided not to hold a hearing on his nomination, in other words, meaning Judge Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court, having been nominated by President Obama. As you recall, it was an election year with a divided Congress. The position I took was consistent with previously public, publicly expressed positions by other senators and Democratic senators uh, previous to that. So yes, it's true that I didn't give Judge Garland a hearing. I also didn't mischaracterize his record. I didn't attack his character. I didn't go through his high school yearbook. I didn't make his wife leave the hearing in tears. I took a position on hearings and I stuck to it, and that's it. I admire Judge Garland's public service. Just because I disagreed with anyone being nominated didn't mean that I had to be disagreeable to that nominee. Unfortunately, that's not always the way it works in this town that has great political division. Judge Garland is here, and we're here to talk about his nomination to be Attorney General. And I extend a warm welcome to you, Judge Garland, and to your family and friends that are probably very honored uh, because uh, of your nomination. Uh, this, of course, is a worthy capstone on a storied career that you have had. Judge Garland is a good pick to lead the Department of Justice. He has decades of experience as one of the most respected appellate judges in the country, and before that, being a great prosecutor. When the domestic terrorist, Timothy McVeigh, McVeigh was executed for his crimes, we had um, Merrick Garland to thank for that successful 
prosecution. No one doubts that Judge Garland is qualified for his job, but of course, Attorney General is more than just qualifications. The top law enforcement officer of the United States must be committed to enforcing the rule of law. As our former colleague and former Attorney General John Ashcroft likes to say, the Department of Justice is the only cabinet agency whose name is an ideal. It's uh, not the Department of Law Enforcement, but the Department of Justice. Justice is equality under the law. There's one law for all Americans, regardless of race, color, creed, or connection. <clears throat> is Judge Garland up to that task? I think he is. But today, our goal is to ask him questions to find out. The Department of Justice has taken important steps to live up to these ideals expressed by uh, Attorney General Ashcroft. And, uh, and I think they've done well in that direction, particularly over the last four years. The Department has undertaken many successful initiatives to reduce violent crime in all com communities. It has sought to maintain the rule of law by reforming consent degrees, guidance documents, and sue and settle abuse. It has protected our civil liberties, in particular defending our religious liberties and pursuing elder justice. I hope that the Department of Justice continues these initiatives under you, Judge Garland. What I don't want is a return to the Obama years. I don't want an attorney general who bragged about being a wingman, and those are his words, to the uh, president. That was Eric Holder notoriously describing himself. I don't want a Justice Department that abuses the FISA process to spy on American citizens. I don't want consent decrees that federalize law enforcement and cause murder rates to soar. I don't want a return to catch and release on the border. I could come up with many other examples. Unfortunately, a lot of what we've seen so far from the Justice Department is discouraging. They have whiplashed inducing changes to litigation positions. They're going through rescinding excellent rule of law memorandums right out of the gate. President Biden is even reportedly firing nearly every Senate-confirmed U.S. attorney, regardless of what investigations they're supervising. That is troubling. That is why I am especially concerned about the Durham investigation. Starting January 2017, I began an investigation in how the Justice Department and the FBI handled crossfire hurricanes. Uh, its investigation into the Trump campaign and administration. Simply said, Crossfire Hurricane is a textbook example of what shouldn't happen during investigations. What the Obama administration did to the Trump campaign transition and administration can't ever happen again. If confirmed, you'll have oversight of Special Counsel Durham's review of Crossfire Hurricane. When Bill Barr appeared before the committee, for his nomination hearing, he said, quote, it's vitally important that the special counsel be allowed to complete his investigation, end of quote. Of course, he was referring to then special counsel Mueller's investigation. Today, you'll need to be clear about what your position will be with regard to special counsel Durham. We should expect the same level of commitment from you to protect Durham as we expected from Barr to protect Mueller. So, Judge Garland, I just want to say that I like you, I respect you, and I think you're a good pick for this job. But I have a lot of questions about how, about how you're going to run the Department of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Grassley. At this time, uh, we'll have a formal introduction of uh, Judge Garland. Uh, two of our colleagues uh, will be doing that. Uh, because of your state of rev residence, Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland will be first, and because of your roots, Senator Tammy Duckworth, my colleague of Illinois, will be second. Both are joining us by uh, WebEx, 
there will be a record statement and, and statement made by Senator Cardin placed in the record. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank you and Ranking Member Grassley uh, and all of our colleagues uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, for being here today. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to introduce uh, the President's uh, nominee for Attorney General, uh, Judge Merrick Garland, uh, who's not only a fellow Marylander, but somebody who I have known personally for many years. Uh, and I know that President Biden has picked a nominee with impeccable credentials and unimpeachable character. His experience stretches from the halls of the Justice Department to the chambers of the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And he embodies the decency, the impartiality, and the commitment to justice that our nation deserves as the Attorney General of the United States. I'm confident that if confirmed, uh, Judge Garland uh, will serve admirably and faithfully as the next Attorney General. And I'm proud to present uh, him to you and the committee on behalf of myself, but also uh, Senator Cardin, uh, who, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, uh, is fully in support of this nomination, uh, but could not join us because of a scheduling conflict. Uh, the nation already knows Merrick Garland uh, because of his Supreme Court uh, nomination and as the former judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the District of Columbia Circuit, uh, where he earned a reputation as one of our nation's finest and fairest jurists. Uh, but his tenure on the D.C. Circuit was just the most recent achievement in a life dedicated to serving the rule of law. After excelling at law school, Judge Garland clerked for the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and then for the Supreme Court. He then rose through the ranks of a prominent law firm before jumping back into public service, feet first, as a federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office during the administration of President George Herbert Walker Bush, and then later served as the principal associate deputy attorney general at the Department of Justice. As a senior DOJ official, Judge Garland was tasked with overseeing the case of the o Oklahoma City bombing, one of the deadliest domestic terrorist attacks in American history. It left 168 Americans dead and hundreds more injured. Merrick Garland brought a steady hand to an operation that involved massive amounts of evidence, pressure from the public, and a large team with diverse skills and backgrounds. With fidelity to the law and meticulous attention to detail and unrelenting focus, Merrick Garland helped bring the bomber, Timothy McVeigh, to justice. He has called this case the most important thing he has done in his life. Mr. Chairman, ranking members and, and committee members, we are going to need his experience as we once again confront the rise of domestic terrorism, particularly in the wake of the horrific events of January 6th. And the next attorney general must not only take on the rise of white supremacists and radical militia groups, but also ensure that justice is rendered equally and fairly by promoting and ensuring racial equity, rooting out discrimination in our criminal justice system, addressing police reform, and ensuring that we don't see a concerted effort to limit people's citizens right to vote in the United States of America. As Justice Garland has himself stated, ensuring the rule of law and making real the promise of equal justice under the law are, quote, the great principles upon which the Department of Justice was founded and for which it must always stand. Judge Garland has spent his career doing both, and I have no doubt he will honor that tradition as Attorney General. While his professional experiences have prepared him for this job, it's its, it's its character that makes him right for this moment. Should he be confirmed, Judge Garland will be charged with restoring credibility and independence to the Department of Justice, making it clear that the department is not the political instrument of the White House. I know Merrick Garland is up to the task. The lengthy list of testimonials speaking to his fairness and sound judgment span the political spectrum. He is respected by lawmakers, scholars, and lawyers of every legal persuasion and political philosophy. 
And on a personal note, I can attest to the fact that his brilliance is matched by his kindness. His many achievements have never gone to his head. He has always stayed humble and treated everyone with respect. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee, it's for these reasons and many more that I'm honored to present to you the President's nominee to serve as the next Attorney General of the United States, Judge Merrick Garland. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van Hollen. And now I'm calling on my colleague and friend from Illinois, Senator Tammy Duckworth. I thank the chairman. Thank you so much for this opportunity to introduce President Biden's nominee to serve as the next Attorney General of the United States. We in Illinois also claim Merrick Garland uh, as a son of our state. He possesses the brilliance and the resilience, the experience and the intellect, the expertise and integrity necessary to serve effectively as our next Attorney General. I am especially honored to be here today because I have full confidence in his capability to lead the Department of Justice in an independent and impartial manner. And he will defend the civil and constitutional rights of all Americans, no matter what they look like, who they love, how they pray, or their disability status. Judge Garland hails from our home state of Illinois, Mr. Chairman. His father ran a small business out of his home, and his mother directed volunteer services at the Council for Jewish Elderly in Chicago. After graduating at valedictorian at Niles West High School in Skokie, he won scholarships to both college and law school. He then graduated from Harvard University in 1974 and Harvard Law School in 1977. His breadth of experience stems in part from his time in private practice and judicial clerkships. He clerked for Judge Henry Friendly on the Second Circuit and Justice William Brennan on the United States Supreme Court. However, his commitment to public service is perhaps even more clearly demonstrated by his successful tenure at the Department of Justice and his current seat on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of, of Columbia Circuit. In 1979, Judge Garland joined the DOJ as a special assistant, and then after a brief stint in private legal practice, left the department as a principal associate deputy attorney general in 1997. During his tenure, which spanned both Republicans and Democratic administrations, he led multiple high-profile investigations, working on a number of issues, including criminal, civil, antitrust, appellate, espionage, and national security measures. He gained valuable experience as a prosecutor by trying and supervising numerous prosecutions and appeals. Notably, he played a key role in the prosecution of the Oklahoma City bombers, as has been previously noted. Following his career at the OJ, the United States Senate confirmed his nomination for a lifetime appointment to serve on the D.C. Circuit. Judge Garland authored hundreds of opinions that address disability rights, criminal justice, and voting rights, among other issues. Issues that affect Americans in every mile and every corner of this country. As a judge, he joined a unanimous panel decision that upheld a Department of Labor regulation requiring contractors to comply with the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This decision upheld regulations that sought to protect employment opportunities for individuals living with a, with a disability like myself. It is this legacy of public service that gives me confidence that if confirmed to be our nation's chief law enforcement officer, Judge Garland will not only modernize and strengthen enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act, but will restore and take and lift morale throughout the DOJ. Judge Garland is ready to defend the constitutional and civil rights that our nation so deeply values, and I know he will make all of us Illinoisans proud as our country's next gen Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Judge Garland, will you please stand to be sworn? Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll help you God. Thank you. Before I turn to my questions, oh, I think there's another uh, element in the program here, your testimony. Let me turn to Judge Garland. On here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the Judiciary Committee. 
I am honored to appear before you today as the President's nominee to be the Attorney General. I would like first to take this opportunity to introduce you to my wife, Lynn, my daughters, Jesse and Becky, and my son-in-law, Zan. I am grateful to them and to my entire extended family that is watching today on C-SPAN every day of my life. The President nominates the Attorney General to be the lawyer, not for any individual, but for the people of the United States. July 2020 marked the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Department of Justice, making this a fitting time to remember the mission of the Attorney General and of the Department. It is a fitting time to reaffirm that the rule, role of the Attorney General is to serve the rule of law and to ensure equal justice under law. And it is a fitting time to recognize the more than 115,000 career employees of the Department and its law enforcement agencies and their commitment to serve the cause of justice and protect the safety of our communities. If I have confirmed as Attorney General, it will be the culmination of a career I have dedicated to ensuring that the laws of our country are fairly and faithfully enforced and the rights of all Americans are protected. Before I became a judge almost 24 years ago, a significant portion of my professional life was spent at the Justice Department. As a special assistant to Ben Civiletti, the last of the trio of post-Watergate Attorneys General, as a line assistant U.S. Attorney, as a supervisor in the Criminal Division, and finally as a senior official in the Department. Many of the policies that the Justice Department developed during those years are the foundation for reaffirming the norms that will ensure that the Department adheres to the rule of law. These are policies that protect the independence of the Department from partisan influence in law enforcement, that strictly regulate communications with the White House, that establish guidelines for FBI domestic operations and foreign intelligence collection, that ensure respectful treatment of the press, that read the Freedom of Information Act generously, that respect the professionalism of DOJ employees, and that set out the principles of federal prosecution to guide the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. In conversations that I have had with many of you before this hearing, you have asked why I would agree to leave a lifetime appointment as a judge. I have told you that I love being a judge, but I have also told you that this is an important moment for me to step forward because of my deep respect for the Department of Justice and for its critical role of ensuring the rule of law. Celebrating DOJ's 150th year reminds us of the origins of the Department, which was founded during Reconstruction in the aftermath of the Civil War to secure the civil rights that were promised in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The first Attorney General appointed by President Grant to head the new Department led it in a concerted battle to protect black voting rights from the violence of white extremists, successfully prosecuting hundreds of cases against uh, white supremacist members of the Ku Klux Klan. Almost a century later, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 created the Department's Civil Rights Division with a mission to uphold the civil and constitutional rights of all Americans, particularly some of the most vulnerable members of our society. That mission on the website of the Department's Civil Rights Division remains urgent because we do not yet have equal justice. Communities of color and other minorities still face discrimination in housing, in education, in employment, and in the criminal justice system. And they bear the brunt of the harm caused by pandemic, pollution, and climate change. 150 years after the department's founding, battling extremist attacks on our democratic institutions also remain central to the department's mission. From 1995 to 1997, I supervised the prosecution of the perpetrators of the bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building, who 
who sought to spark a revolution that would topple the federal government. If confirmed, I will supervise the prosecution of white supremacists and others who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, a heinous attack that sought to disrupt a cornerstone of our democracy, the peaceful transfer of power to a newly elected government. And that critical work is but a part of the broad scope of the department's responsibilities. Justice Department protects Americans from environmental degradation and the abuse of market power, from fraud and corruption, from violent crime and cybercrime, and from drug trafficking and child exploitation. And it must do all of this with, without ever taking its eye off of the risk of another devastating attack by foreign terrorists. The Attorney General takes an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I am mindful of the tremendous responsibility that comes with this role. As Attorney General, later Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson famously said, quote, the prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any other person in America. While prosecutors at their best are one of the most beneficent forces in our society, when they act from malice or other base mode motives, they are one of the worst. Jackson then went on to say, the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who tempers zeal with human kindness, who seeks truth and not victims, who serves the law and not factional purposes, and who approaches the task with humility. That was the prosecutor I tried to be during my prior service in the Department of Justice. That is the spirit I tried to bring to my tenure as a federal judge. And if confirmed, I promise to do my best to live up to that ideal as Attorney General. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Garland. Before I turn to my questions, I want to lay out a few mechanics for the hearing. Senators will have eight minutes in the first round of questions, followed by a five-minute second round. Uh, and I ask members to do their best to stay within their allotted time. We will take uh, a break every once in a while for 10 minutes. I'm hoping the first will be sometime near 11 o'clock at about 12.15 or 12.30. We will break for lunch for 30 minutes. Uh, I beg you to stick with that schedule if you can and be back in time uh, so that we can keep the hearing moving along. So let me uh, at this point turn to questions. You were sent to Oklahoma City, 1995. What happened there was the deadliest act of homegrown domestic terrorism in modern American history. 168 people had been killed, including 19 children. Hundreds were injured. You were supervising the prosecution of Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, who were accused of being complicit and leading in that destruction. Now, if you are confirmed as Attorney General, which I believe you will be, you will face what is known as the biggest, most complex investigation in Justice Department history. And that is the investigation around the events of January 6. 230 have been arrested so far. Some 500 are under investigation. We know that the death of at least one police officer is one of the major elements in this investigation. I'd like to ask you to reflect on two things. What's going on in America? Was Oklahoma City just a one-off, unrelated to what happened here? Can you measure, based on what you've learned so far, what kind of forces are at work to divide and destroy the American dream? Secondly, when it comes to this prosecution, are there elements that we should consider in terms of law enforcement to deal with this rising threat to the American democracy? Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address the committee today. I'm grateful for this opportunity. I don't think that this is necessarily a one-off. Uh, FBI Director Ray has indicated that 
uh, the threat of domestic terrorism and particularly of uh, white supremacist extremists is his number one uh, concern in this area. Uh, this is coupled with an, an enormous rise in hate crimes over the past few years. There is a line from Oklahoma City and there's another line from Oklahoma City all the way back to the experiences that I mentioned in my opening with respect to the battles of the original Justice Department against the Ku Klux Klan. We must do everything in the power of the Justice Department to prevent this kind of interference with the policies of American democratic institutions. And I plan, if you now confirm me for Attorney General, to do everything in my power to ensure that we are protected. Judge Garland, it, it goes without saying, but we ought to make it a record. We abhor violence, whether it comes from the right or left, whatever its source. Uh, it has no place in responsible constitutional dialogue in America. Currently, though, we are faced with elements that weren't there 25 years ago in Oklahoma City. A proliferation of weapons. Secondly, social media and the internet, which serves as a gathering place for many of these domestic terrorists. What are your thoughts about how we should deal with those elements from the law enforcement viewpoint? Well, Mr. Chairman, I certainly agree that we are facing a more dangerous period than we faced in Oklahoma City at the, than at that time. From what I have seen, and I have no inside information about how the department is uh, developing it for its work, it looks like an extremely aggressive and perfectly appropriate beginning to an investigation all across the country in the same way our original Oklahoma City investigation was, but many times uh, uh, um, more. I don't yet know what additional resources would be required by the department. I can assure you that this will be my first priority and my first briefing when I return to the department if I'm confirmed. Judge Garland, several years ago, I went to an immigration court hearing in downtown Chicago. It was in a high-rise loop building. I met the immigration court judge. She'd been on the job almost 20 years. It seemed like a very conscientious and fair person. She asked me to stay for the docket call, particularly for the first clients on the docket. The first clients on the docket were a four-year-old girl named Marta. When the judge asked, that all of the people in the courtroom be seated. She had to be helped into the chair. It was too tall for her to get into. She was handed a stuffed animal to hold during the hearing. <clears throat> At the same table was a young boy with the unlikely name Hamilton, who was given a little matchbox car, which he played with on top of the table. He was six years old. They were the victims of the zero tolerance policy. We remember it well. Thousands of children were forcibly removed from their parents, separated and many times lost in the bureaucracy. Some have incorrectly stated that that administration policy by the Trump administration was just a continuation of Obama-era policy. That isn't true. The Obama administration did not have policies that resulted in the mass separation of parents and children. And on rare occasions, separations occurred. This was due to suspicion of trafficking or fraud, not because of an intentional, cruel policy to separate children. The Justice Department's Inspector General conducted an investigation of the zero tolerance policy and noted that the Justice Department was, quote, the driving force, close quote, in that policy. There is still a lot that we do not know about that policy and the accountability for the officials who were responsible for it. So let me ask you this. This committee is going to hold oversight hearings to get to the bottom of it. Will you commit to cooperate with those investigations? Sen Senator, I think the oversight responsibility of this committee is, is one of its very most important things. It's a duty imposed by the Constitution, and I greatly respect it. I think that the policy was shameful. I can't imagine anything worse than tearing parents from their children and we will provide all of the uh, cooperation that we possibly can. I thank you for that. 
When it comes to congressional oversight, uh, this committee has a role in restoring independence and integrity to the Justice Department through oversight hearings. It has a long-standing tradition of holding annual Justice Department oversight hearings. But sadly, it's been three years since the Attorney General has been called before this committee. I pledge that as chairman, I'll hold annual DOJ oversight hearings where members from both sides of the aisle can ask important questions of you in that capacity. I don't want to go into detail, but ask you, obviously, would you agree to cooperate in that commitment to oversight hearing? Of course, if I am confirmed, I will certainly cooperate. And when requests are made for information by members of the committee, I hope that I can also have your commitment to cooperation in providing timely answers. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we will be as responsive as we possibly can. As I said, I have great respect for and belief in the oversight role of this committee. Thank you. Senator Grassley? Yeah. Uh, since you're a currently sitting judge, you're bound by the code of conduct of U.S. judges. Nevertheless, I hope that we can get frank answers from you on your views. And when we talked last on the phone, you told me you would get guidance from the administrative office on what you can or can't say. I assume that you sought that guidance. Uh, if so, what did they advise you? Uh, yes, uh, Senator Grassley, I did. And they advised me just as you and I thought that they would. Uh, Canon 3 bars me from commenting on any uh, pending or impending case that is in any court, but I am free to talk about policy um, uh, with you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to the Durham investigation. Uh, at Barr's hearing, he stated the following regard to Mueller's investigation, quote, it's virtually important that the special counsel be allowed to complete his investigation. Also at that same hearing, Senator Feinstein asked, quote, will you commit to providing Mr. Mueller with the resources, funds, and time needed to complete his investigation, end of quote. Uh, Attorney General Barr answered Senator Feinstein with a one word, yes. With respect to Special Counsel Durham's investigation, I expect that he will be allowed to complete his investigation. Uh, if confirmed, will you commit to providing Special Counsel Durham with the staff, resources, funds, and time needed to thoroughly complete the investigation? So, Senator, I, I don't have any information about the investigation. Um, as I sit here uh, today, and, the very, and another one of the very first things I'm going to have to do is speak with Mr. Durham to figure out how his investigation is going. I understand uh, that he has been permitted to remain in his position, um, and sitting here today, I have no reason to think that that was not the correct uh, decision. Okay, and, and I suppose that would be an answer that he would only be removed for cause then, uh, would that be your position? Well, uh, Senator, I, I, I really do have to have an opportunity to talk with him. I have not had that opportunity. Uh, as I said, I don't have any reason from what I know now, um, which is really, really very little, uh, to make any determination on that ground. But I don't have any reason to think uh, that he should not remain in place. Okay. If confirmed, would you commit to publicly releasing Special Counsel Durham's report just like Mueller report was made public? So, Senator, I'm a, I am a great believer in transparency. Um, I would, though, have to talk with Mr. Durham and, and understand uh, the nature of uh, what he's been doing and the nature of the report. But I am um, a big, uh, um, uh, very much committed uh, to transparency and to explaining Justice Department decision making. At this point, I'm not going to take exception to the answers you gave me about Durham because I think you're an honorable person. They're not quite as explicit as I hope they would be, like we got from Barr for the Mueller investigation. But uh, I, uh, I, I think you've come close to satisfying me, but maybe not entirely. Uh, we're in the midst of a polydrug crisis. In addition to opioids, methamphetamine, and cocaine, fentanyl, 
and fentanyl analogs are plaguing our country, increasingly uh, sophisticated drug trafficking organizations, both domestic and internationally, try to skirt the law by changing their molecular structure. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Center for Disease Control has found that drug uh, overdose deaths rose their highest level ever measured during the pandemic, uh, with the overall jump in deaths being driven most substantially by drugs like fentanyl. Uh, we uh, must stop this uh, fentanyl uh, substance from entering our neighborhoods and killing thousands of Americans. So my question is, uh, as you lead the Justice Department, having oversight over the Drug Enforcement Administration within that department, and they will be addressing the spread of fentanyl analogs and related substances by pushing for continued class-wide prohibition of fentanyl. So I didn't quite make my question clear. Would you lead the Justice Department in uh, pushing for continued class-wide prohibition of fentanyl dialogues? Uh, Senator, I, I'm, I'm familiar uh, with this problem. Uh, one of my roles as um, the chief judge of the D.C. Circuit was to serve on the Pretrial Services uh, Committee um, uh, for the, uh, on the Committee for the Pretrial Services Agency for the District, and we were constantly uh, advised of the fact that the uh, formula was being uh, slightly changed constantly, and this was a problem both for detection uh, as well as uh, for the problem of enforcement. To be honest, uh, I'm not, no chemist. This is one of the reasons I ended up being a, a lawyer instead of a doctor. But um, I, I, I would need to look at um, what would be proposed. But I do understand the scope of this problem, and I'm in favor of doing something, either by scheduling or uh, legislation, if I'm um, um, confirmed, that would address uh, the, the, uh, the problem that you're talking about, which is an enormous problem uh, for enforcement. Yeah. Uh, I want to go to the death penalty because we have some people already prosecuted where the death penalty has been uh, advocated or sought, uh, and one of those is the people that were involved in Boston Marathon. Uh, so the, the question, uh, the Justice Department, again under the Obama administration, sought and received an appropriate death, a sentence of death. That sentence is currently being appealed Will you commit to defending these sentences on appeal? Uh, well, Senator, this now, now we're rubbing up against exactly the problem that you asked me about in the beginning. Um, these are pending cases. Um, and as a sitting judge, uh, the canons uh, bar me from uh, making comment on um, pending cases. Uh, my last question will have to deal with the investigation that's underway by some of us in Congress about Hunter Biden. Uh, have you discussed the case with the president or anyone else? And, and I don't expect you to discuss your private conversation with the president, but members of this committee always ask uh, judges or other people what your, did you discuss with the president, for instance, your appoint, uh, your uh, position on abortion? So have you discussed this Hunter Biden case with the president or anyone else? I have not. The president made abundantly clear uh, in every public statement before and after my nomination that uh, decisions about investigations and prosecutions will be left to the Justice Department. That was the uh, uh, reason that I was willing to uh, take on this job. And um, um, so the answer to your question is no. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Uh, Senator Leahy would be next, but he is outside of the jurisdiction of Zoom at the moment. <laughs> uh, I, I guess that's appropriate. Uh, and so Senator Feinstein will be recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome. Um, throughout your career, you have been praised by people on both sides of the aisle. 
When you were nominated to the Supreme Court, President Obama said you were, quote, someone who would bring a spirit of decency, modesty, integrity, even-handedness, and excellence, end quote. Similarly, Sem Senator Orrin Hatch called you, quote, a fine man who would be a, quote, moderate choice for the court. Even Carrie Severino of the Conservative Judicial Crisis Network once called you, quote, the best scenario we could hope for to bring the tension and the politics in the city down a notch. At a time when America feels more polarized than ever before, this sort of bipartisanship is truly rare. So I ask this question, can all Americans, regardless of their political affiliation, count on you to faithfully and fairly enforce our laws? Yes, Senator, that is my uh, personality. Um, that is everything I've done in my career, and that is my vision for the Justice Department, to dispense the law fairly and impartially without respect to persons and without respect to political parties. Thank you for that statement. On January 6th, a group of white supremacists launched a terrorist attack on our Capitol in an attempt to overturn the results of a democratic election. Their attempt failed and resulted in at least five fatalities, including a Capitol Police officer. It also led federal prosecutors to file over 180 charges and initiate 25 domestic terrorism cases. So this is not the first time the Justice Department has been forced to investigate and prosecute white supremacists for an act of terrorism. You received high praise for investigating and supervising the prosecution of the Oklahoma City bombing perpetrators in 1995. So here's the question. What steps will you take to ensure that the perpetrators of the attack on our Capitol are brought to justice? Senator, I think this was the most uh, heinous attack on, a on the democratic processes that I've ever seen, and one that I never expected to see in my lifetime. Um, but one of the very first things I will do is uh, get a briefing on uh, the progress of this investigation. Um, I intend to give the career uh, prosecutors who are working on this matter 24-7, uh, all of the resources they could possibly require uh, to do this. Um, and at the same time, I intend um, to, to uh, make sure that we look more broadly to look at uh, uh, where this is coming from, what other groups there might be um, that, that could raise the same problem in the future, and that we protect uh, the American people. And I know that uh, FBI director has made the same commitment. Thank you for that answer. Over the last four years, the independence of the Attorney General has been repeatedly attacked. For example, President Trump once told the New York Times, quote, I have the absolute right to do what I want to do with the Justice Department, end quote. Do you believe that, in fact, the president does have the absolute, absolute right to do what he wants with the Justice Department? The president is constrained by the Constitution, uh, as are all government officials. Uh, the issue here for us are the set of norms and standards to which this president, President Biden, has agreed that he will not interfere with the Justice Department with, its, with respect to its prosecutions and investigations, that those decisions will be made by the Department itself and by, uh, led by the Attorney General, um, and that they will be without respect uh, to uh, partisanship, without respect to uh, the power of uh, the perpetrator or the lack of power, without respect to the influence of the perpetrator or the lack of influence. In all of those respects, the department will be independent. The department is a part of the executive branch, and for that reason, on policy matters, we follow the lead of the uh, president of the administration as long as it is consistent with the law. And the role of the department is to advise the president and the administration and the other agencies about what is consistent uh, with the law. That is our obligation, and we will do so uh, uh, objectively based only on our reading of the law. Well, thank you for that. 
I think you've laid it out clearly and directly, and it's very much appreciated. Um, if the president's interest and the public's interest are in conflict, which interests does the attorney general represent? Yeah, well, the attorney general represents the public interest, particularly and specifically as defined by the Constitution and the statutes of the United States. Do you believe that the president has the authority to order the attorney general to open or close an investigation or a, prostitute, a prosecution? This, this is a hard question of the constitutional law, but I do not expect it to be a question for me. As I, said, uh, to, as I just said to you, the president has promised that uh, th those decisions will only be made by the attorney general, and that is what I plan to do. I do not plan uh, to be interfered with uh, by anyone. Um, I expect the Justice Department will make its own decisions in this regard. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to cease at this time, but I just want to say that I think you've had a remarkable career. You've done very special things and always in a very reasonable, sober, penetrating way. So I just want to say thank you for that. I'm grateful, Senator. Thank you for thank that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. We hope that Senator Graham, who is next up, is uh, ready. Senator Graham? Can you hear me? We can hear you. You have eight minutes. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, congratulations to you. And uh, Judge Garland, congratulations on your appointment. I think you're a very good uh, pick for this job. So I'm going to try to go through as much information as I can. Uh, do you promise to defend the Portland Courthouse against anarchists, the federal court building in Portland? A a any uh, attack on a federal building or damage to a federal building uh, violates uh, the federal statutes, uh, and those who do it will be prosecuted. Okay. When it comes to the people who attacked the Capitol on January the 6th, uh, will you let the committee know if you need more resources? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely, Senator. Uh, as I, uh, I, I really do think one of my first jobs is to consult with the uh, prosecutors and the agents who are investigating that matter and see what resources they need. And uh, um, I'm, I'm eager to have an invitation. I'm eager to have an invitation from the Senate to ask for more resources. Sure, please. Thank you. I think all of us want to prosecute every single person that deserves to be prosecuted. Uh, so whatever you need, uh, I'm sure you will get from this committee. Thank uh, you, you, um, have you have you read the Horowitz, Horowitz report? Uh, so, Senator, in our um, conversations, um, you asked me to read it. It's some 400 pages long, and I asked you for permission to read only the also very long executive that's summary. Okay. That's good. And I, and I have done good. that. So what's your general take? Well, my general take is that there were certainly serious problems with respect to FISA applications, particularly for Mr. Page. And uh, in the subsequent report uh, uh, to the way in which uh, FISA applications are uh, documented, uh, the um, Inspector General had a, a substantial number of uh, recommendations for how this uh, could be fixed and how it must be fixed. I, uh, I understand that he submitted those to the FBI director and I understand the FBI director agreed uh, uh, in com in totally and uh, either has uh, made those changes or is in the course of making them. I intend, if I am confirmed, to speak uh, more deeply and directly with uh, Mr. Horwitz, the Inspector General, about this and with, uh, with uh, Director Ray and uh, make sure that these and any other things uh, that are necessary uh, be done. I am, I am always concerned and have always been concerned uh, that we be very careful about FISA. It is a tool uh, that is very uh, useful and important uh, for uh, investigations uh, involving well, that, foreign that, agents. That, that's good to hear. Uh, so, Klein Smith, are you familiar with the fact that a, a lawyer for the FBI has been prosecuted, pled guilty to altering information to the FISA court? I did, I did read about that, yes, Senator. What would happen to somebody under your charge that did that? How would you feel about the behavior? Well, somebody who makes a false statement to the FBI uh, or the Inspector General during an investigation has violated 18 U.S.C. 1001, and uh, I prosecuted those myself. 
Do you believe the Durham investigation is a legitimate investigation? Um, Senator, I, I I don't know anything really about the investigation. If you've read the Horowitz report, do you think somebody uh, should look at what happened? Well, I do think somebody should look at what happened with respect to those FISAs, absolutely, and I believe the Inspector yeah, General has, and, and has done that. Pieces. Based on what the, your review of the, uh, the, the Horowitz report, do you think Jim Comey was a good FBI director? Senator, I, I really don't want to get into uh, uh, analyzing any of the previous uh, well, directors. Well, you know, and, and very critical and appropriately so at times. I just find it pretty stunning that you can't say, uh, <clears throat> in my view, that he was a terrible FBI director. But uh, have you ever been to the border? Have you ever been to the U.S.-Mexican border? No, sir, I haven't. So I'd like you to go because I just got back because I learned that drug cartels are using our asylum laws against us. They will collect people to sort of rush the border. And uh, once they're uh, apprehended, they will claim asylum. And most of these claims, 90% are rejected. And that will take resources away from securing the border and detecting drugs and protecting the nation against terrorism. This is a, a behavior by the cartels. Will you look into that? Uh, practice of using asylum claims by drug cartels to uh, weaken border security? I had not known about this, and I will certainly look into this problem. I think the uh, drug cartels are a major menace uh, to our society, and the uh, poison that they put into our streets is damaging communities of every kind. Um, if they have a well, particular... I would have if they have I'd a, ask you to I'm visit sorry. the border. I think you'll find patriots there, and when they make mistakes, uh, they need to be held accountable. But that's one of the toughest jobs in the country. Senator, uh, Sen is, Senator I apologize for speaking over, but there, over you uh, just now, but there's a, yeah. like a little bit of a lag. Um, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. It's a lag in the technology, I think. Okay. Well, I do. I have a southern accent, so I it's not the accent. <laughs> I'm familiar with southern accents. We'll get high-speed internet. Uh, uh, this is the 20th anniversary of 9/11. Are you concerned that Al Qaeda and ISIS types are going to try to hit us again? I am very concerned that foreign terrorist organizations will try to hit us again. Yes, I, I don't know enough at this point about the capabilities of those two, but it really doesn't matter uh, which foreign terrorist. Uh, uh, that, that, that the terrible thing is the attack, and as I uh, said in my opening statement, with all the other things that the Justice Department has to do, it must always keep its eye on the ball with respect to foreign terrorist attack. Um, I, 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 um, I was sitting in, in my office, uh, arriving at my office as the first planes, uh, first plane uh, hit the uh, Trade Center, and I was sitting in my office and could see smoke rising over the Pentagon. Uh, I can assure you uh, that this is top of mind for me. Well, one of the reasons I uh, am very inclined to support you is I believe what you just said is true. I think you have a very deep understanding of the uh, the threats America faces, and to my colleagues on the committee, uh, Al Qaeda has been diminished. ISIS footprint has been greatly diminished, but they're out there, uh, and they're trying to. They will this year sometime. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, let us know they're still there. So it's great to hear uh, the the potential future uh, Attorney General understanding that our nation is very much still under threat. So when it comes to interacting with the committee, we're going to be talking about Section 230 reform. What's your impression of Section 230 liability protection for big tech, and is it time to revisit that topic? Senator, I have to be the first con to confess when I have relatively limited information about a subject. I have had one case on Section 230. It was a very straightforward application of the law, so of course I know what it is. I also know that many members of this committee have uh, ideas for how it should be amended, um, and I, I would have to uh, have an opportunity, if I'm confirmed, uh, to talk with you about that uh, and to understand um, all the conflicting uh, concerns and the, uh, the complexities uh, of how to um, uh, alter it if it's to be altered. The devil in these uh, sort of things is always in the details, uh, and uh, you, you on the committee know more about this than I do. And I uh, look forward, if I'm confirmed, to having the chance to talk about it with you. 
Thank you. Congratulations on your nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Sen Senator. Thank you, Senator Graham. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, welcome, Judge Garland. Thank you, Senator. Um, people who've been prosecutors understand that it's not the legislature's business to meddle around in a prosecution. At the same time, we have oversight responsibilities. Um, in your view, is it appropriate for uh, Congress to ask the DOJ give an honest look at investigative matters? Uh, Senator, I, I know of your own long experience as a prosecutor, including some of it which overlapped with mine, and I'm deeply respectful of it and appreciative of it. Um, when you ask it that way, it, uh, it is, of course, uh, always possible for uh, any, anyone to uh, ask about matters like this. Uh, the Department has to be very careful with respect to the Congress. In the same way, it has to be respectful, careful with respect to the White House, that no investigations get started just for partisan per And I'm not in any way suggesting Correct. that that's what you were asking. No, nope, I agree with you. But we have to be careful about this. And after the fact, um, once the investigation is closed or concluded, is it appropriate in the exercise of our oversight to assure that, in fact, an honest look was taken? Uh, uh, yes, of course it is. There are obviously limitations on the department's ability to speak. Uh, they include everything from grand jury Rule material and, and so forces forth. and methods. Understood. Understood. Um, with respect to January 6th, um, I'd like to make sure that you uh, are willing to look upstream from the actual occupants who assaulted the building in the same way that in a drug case, you would look upstream from the street dealers to try to find the kingpins, and that uh, you will not rule out investigation of funders, organizers, ringleaders, or aiders and abettors who were not present in the Capitol on January 6th. Senator, Fair question? Fair question, and uh, again, your law enforcement experience is the same as mine. Uh, investigations. Uh, you know, I began as a line um, assistant U.S. attorney and I was a supervisor. We, we begin with the people on the ground and we work our way up to those uh, uh, who are involved and further involved. And uh, we will pursue these leads uh, wherever uh, they take us. Uh, that's Thank you. the job of a prosecution. As um, Chairman Durbin mentioned, there have been widely reported problems within the department in the last four years. The Judge Gleason's brief for Judge Sullivan is one pretty stunning uh, reproach of the department. Uh, judicial decisions out of the D.C. District Court and the Southern District District Court have been pretty damning. And press reports, too many to mention, have raised concerns about problems within the department during that period. How do you plan to assess the damage that the department sustained so that you can go forward with a clear understanding of what needs repair? Uh, well, Senator, uh, I, I am a strong believer in uh, following the processes of the department. That, that was my experience and all, all of my experiences at the department, regardless of whatever level um, I served. Um, the traditional process is for uh, issues to be raised before either the Inspector General or, or the Office of Professional Responsibility in the areas that, you, that you're talking about, that they conduct investigations, um, and uh, they certainly seemed uh, extremely capable of conducting thorough investigations. They then make recommendations, and uh, that would be the normal procedures in the department, and I would expect, uh, if I'm confirmed, that those would be the kind of procedures I would want to follow. Well, I would submit to you that you may want to take it on more systematically than that, but we can leave that for uh, a later day. Um, on this committee, and particularly on this side of this committee, um, we have experienced more or less a four-year stonewall of information from the Department of Justice and from the FBI. Uh, for 2017 to 2020, we had 25 DOJ and FBI witnesses who failed to answer some or all of the questions for the record that senators asked them. 21 answered none of the questions of the record from either side. Um, I have sent, during the course of those years, 28 different letters on various subjects that went completely unanswered. Um, 
It got so bad that Chairman Graham brought the Deputy Attorney General up to meet with him and me to go through the list and try to figure out why the hell we weren't getting answers and where the policy came from, the de facto policy of refusing to answer questions of senators. Um, I think we need to understand what happened during that period, why these questions weren't being answered. The base question, the point of entry is, why were these questions not being answered? Upon whose instructions were these questions not being answered? Why? What was behind? What was the motive for refusing to answer these questions? Once we've cleared that up, then I think we've got to go through the backlog of questions that the department refused to answer. As you know, um, sometimes Congress asks questions that are touchy for a department. Somebody may have misbehaved. There may be wrongful conduct that has taken place. And I hope you will agree that covering up misconduct is never an acceptable reason for refusing to answer questions of Congress. Well, I certainly agree that covering up uh, anything is never uh, an appropriate reason for not answering a question of, uh, of Congress. There will be no policy uh, de facto or otherwise, if I am uh, uh, confirmed, uh, that would direct the department uh, to not be responsive uh, to this committee and to its members. Um, I, I want the, um, uh, the department I lead to be as responsible, responsive as possible, and at the very least to explain uh, why, if it can't answer a question or can't answer a letter, why it can't do so. I Correct. Think that's the minimum you're entitled to. Correct. And I don't want this just going forward. I want to be able to go back and get answers to those backlogged questions that were wrongfully refused. Um, would you help us make sure that that happens? Uh, yes, Senator. As uh, we talked in our in our conversation um, uh, before, uh, I uh, uh, would definitely uh, direct uh, that the previous answer uh, questions be answered. I, I only ask uh, you and the other members of the committee, um, as a matter of resource and priority allocation, to give us some, uh, the department some sense of the priorities of which ones still need to be answered and perhaps Correct. even in what order. We will do that. Um, and last, I have just a few seconds left, so I'll just flag two things. Um, I think that the Office of Legal Counsel has taken a lot of hits, um, from the torture memos to the warrantless wiretap memos to the Southern District decision to the D.C. Court decision to its extremely self-serving and self-propagating view of presidential investigations. Um, this is a part of the department that I think is in real trouble. Um, another role of the departments is the policing and the intermediation of executive privilege for an administration. And I think that is an area that has been in complete collapse. And I look forward, with my time now expired, to working with you to figure out what to do about OLC and what to do about the intermediative role of the Department of Justice when executive privilege is asserted. Thank you, Senator. I look forward to speaking with you. Senator Cornyn. Welcome, Judge. I enjoyed our conversation the other day. Thank As you. As did for I. The, thank you. Thank you for that. As I told you, my sole criterion uh, for voting for your confirmation is your pledge to make sure that politics uh, does not um, affect your job as Attorney General. And uh, I believe you told me that you could make that commitment. Is that a commitment you can make here publicly today? Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I would not have taken this job if I thought that politics would have any influence over prosecutions and investigations. I do, I do want to just to be clear about, uh, to, uh, to clarify so as to not disappoint you, with respect to policies of the, of the administration, which I assume are driven by politics, although as a judge I, I wouldn't know for sure, um, I, it is our obligation to advance the policies of the department as long as they are consistent with the law, and our evaluation of the law has to be based only on the law and not politics. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I think being attorney general has got to be the toughest job in the United States government because you serve at the pleasure of the president, but you also have, as you appropriately point out, a obligation to um, equal justice and impartial enforcement of the law. If you were asked to do something that you considered to be in violation of the law or unethical, 
would you uh, resign? Well, the first thing I would do is to tell uh, the president or whoever else uh, was asking me to do that, um, that it was uh, unlawful. I do not expect this to happen with this president who has made it completely clear publicly and in private that he will not do that. But of course, if I am asked to do something and an alternative is not accepted, I would resign, yes. Thank you. Judge Garland, I think one of the biggest problems that the administration of justice has had here in the United States for the last, particularly the last couple uh, presidencies has been the perception that there is a double standard, one that applies to uh, maybe one political party or people with w of wealth, and another one that applies to uh, the opposing political party or people who don't have the resources in order to defend themselves against the awesome investigative and prosecutorial powers of the Department of Justice. Of course, you're acquainted with the, uh, with the phrase above the Supreme Court, equal justice under the law. Do you agree with me that a double standard, a perception of a double standard of justice can be a cancer that will eat away at public confidence in the administration of justice and that commitment to equal justice? Absolutely, Senator. As I um, have said to many people, I think probably including yourself, uh, Ed Levy is my model uh, for the Attorney General. His role was to be sure that uh, uh, justice was um, uh, meted out fairly and impartially without um, any um, uh, uh, special favors for anyone. This is the definition, in my view, of the rule of law, that the powerful and the powerless, uh, one party and another party, uh, 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 one community in the United States and another community in the United States, all are treated equally in the administration of justice. The chairman's recitation of things that he perceives as being uh, inappropriate at the Department of Justice ended uh, with uh, the Trump, it started and ended with the Trump administration, but let me take you back a little further into the Biden-Obama administration. Uh, you're familiar with the press conference that James Comey, the FBI director, had in July of 2016, where he discussed the investigation of Hillary Clinton for inappropriate use of her email server? I remember it, Senator, yes. According to the Justice Department norms and procedures and rules, uh, that you're well acquainted with as a result of your experience. Is that a pr an appropriate step for an FBI director to take to talk about derogatory information in a case that they say no reasonable prosecutor would pursue? Uh, Senator, I, 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 I don't think um, uh, uh, it's uh, useful for me to comment on specific um, matters involving specific uh, former officials, but I have no problem at all telling you that uh, the Justice Department's policies make clear that derogatory comments about subjects, uh, targets, uh, uh, even um, people who have been indicted except for what's in the indictment are not appropriate. And if I am uh, confirmed, I will uh, zealously uh, attempt to incul re-inculcate that spirit. When I was, uh, in, uh, when I was uh, speaking to the press after each uh, uh, court hearing in Oklahoma City, I was assiduous in making sure that I did not say anything about uh, uh, the defendants who had uh, just been before the court and who had done, um, after, now I know, we know after conviction, horrible things, that I would not say anything other than what the charges had been brought against them, what the judge reported. And I believe that is an important part of uh, federal uh, prosecution. I know uh, you don't want to t comment on Mr. Comey's actions, but what you've just described strikes me as, a, as a diametrically opposed to what he actually did. Um, Chair, uh, Senator Graham asked you if you'd read the Horowitz report on the investigation of Crossfire Hurricane. I understand that your time has been limited up to this point, but do you, uh, would you pledge to read all 404 pages of that report if you're confirmed? I, I will, Senator. It may take me some time, but I have a head start by reading the executive summary, so I think I should be able to get through it. Well, I think it's really important that okay. you do so um, because of the abuse not only of the FISA process where that FBI lawyer l lied to the FISA court in order to get a warrant to spy on, a, on an American citizen, but the uh, use of counterintelligence 
investigation, a counterintelligence investigation against a presidential candidate um, and uh, in the run-up to the election. Are you familiar with the Steele dossier? Only what I've read in the newspapers, and I have to admit that I've read only conflicting reports about it in the, in the papers. Well, it's, it's been revealed that um, the sources for the Steele dossier, which was used in part in order to get FISA warrants, uh, that the subsources could well be um, could well be Russian intelligence officers uh, using that in order to get um, as part of a Russian active measures campaign. Are you familiar with the practice of the Soviet Union and now the Russian Federation to uh, use active measures as part of their intelligence service attacks against the United States? So uh, not from my experience either as a judge or as um, a prosecutor. But again, from reading uh, media reports, um, I, I know what the words mean, and I, and I have a general idea of what you're speaking about, yes. Judge Garland, my time's about up, but I think we talked about the role of the Judiciary Committee in authorizing the tools like Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act mm -hmm. and the importance of preserving public confidence that those tools will be appropriately used and there will be appropriate oversight both at the Department of Justice and the FBI, as well as the Judiciary Committee and the Intelligence Committees. Do you agree with me that abuse of those authorities jeopardizes the availability of those tools in a way that is detrimental potentially to the security of the United States? Uh, absolutely, Senator. My entire career as a Justice Department official was aimed at ensuring that we used FISA only as appropriate under the law as it existed at the time. It's not only that um, I'm worried about losing a tool that's essential, it's, uh, it's also that I'm worried about um, uh, transgressing the uh, constitutional rights of Americans. Um, both of those are important, and I have to say, probably the latter is way more important in my, my view. We have to be careful about respecting American citizens' constitutional rights. Thank you, Judge. Thanks, Senator Cornyn. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations on your new job, and congratulations uh, to you, um, Judge Garland, on your nomination. Thank you. Um, I was I, I listened uh, with much happiness uh, in your opening remarks uh, when you talked about being the lawyer for the people, uh, that you want to serve the law and not factional purposes, and that you use the important adjective humble. I think we could need a little bit more of that in this town, so I appreciate that. Um, and I was also glad that you mentioned when um, President Biden nominated you, um, Attorney General Edward Levy, uh, who taught an iconic first year law uh, class at the University of Chicago that I uh, took. And uh, like Edward Levy, uh, who took office after Watergate, you will take on the Department of Justice at a critical time and will have the great task of restoring its ideals of independence and fidelity to the Constitution and to the law. Uh, what is the number one thing you want to do to boost morale um, in the Department of Justice on day one? Well, on day one, I'm hopefully, if I'm confirmed, I will take an oath in which I say all the things that you just said. <laughs> I want to make clear to the uh, career uh, uh, prosecutors, the career lawyers, the career employees, the career agents of the department, that my job uh, is to protect them from partisan uh, or other improper motives. I, uh, I then hope um, to have an opportunity over the next few months to visit with as many members uh, of the Justice Department as possible uh, in the pandemic. Unfortunately, this will have to be over a Zoom. Um, I, had, uh, I would much prefer to be able to go down uh, to the Great Hall or the cafeteria and uh, mingle with folks and, and, and uh, let them hear what's in my heart about this, but I'm afraid that technology uh, is the only way I'm going to be able to do it now. Okay, very good. Um, one of the things that troubled me along these lines was the pardon process that, was, that President Trump undertook, and one study found that 88% of the pardons that he granted had some sort of personal or political connection to the former president. Um, what do you think we need to do to restore integrity to the pardon process? Obviously, it's important power of the president. Um, what do you think you can do from the attorney general's position? Right. Well, Senator, you're right. This is a power granted uh, by the Constitution to the president. I think the role of the Justice Department through its uh, role, uh, pardon attorney 
uh, is to provide a careful, uh, individualized examination of uh, the people who are uh, um, uh, asking to be pardoned. That the uh, office has a, a, sense, a set of very detailed uh, regulations which describe when people are appropriate for pardons and when they are not. It provides an important screen that uh, not only yields uh, who maybe should be pardoned, but also protects the president from improper influence. Okay. Um, just a few things I want to ask quickly because I want to also get to antitrust. Um, you talked to Senator Graham about resources for um, a domestic terrorism and that you want to take a look. Do you think uh, you will need additional authorities or you want to look at that when you get in there? I'm going to be chairing a hearing tomorrow uh, with the Rules Committee on what happened at the Capitol and what we need to do to improve security. Obviously, part of it is prosecuting uh, the perpetrators. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you for that uh, question. The um, Department is probably always looking for new tools, but the first thing we have to do before we look for new tools is figure out uh, what, whether the tools we have uh, are sufficient, and that will be part of this briefing that, uh, that I, I want to have to determine whether the laws, which are quite capable and which were capable of, uh, of, uh, of the charges against McVeigh and Nichols and many other uh, terrorists over the years, whether they are sufficient. Um, and then I'd be uh, interested in speaking with you and other members of the committee about uh, what other additions might be made, but um, I first have to know whether anything more is necessary. Very good. Um, will you commit to reinstating Attorney General Holder's 2015 guidelines requiring the AG to sign off on subpoenas to journalists? Something I care a lot about as the daughter of a journalist. Yes, so uh, these guidelines came out uh, originally uh, when I was working for Ben Civiletti, and I had the great pleasure of working on them. These are things, these, this is something that I'm deeply committed to. Um, they've improved, I would say, over the years um, uh, as, as more concerns have, have arisen. Um, um, but I would expect uh, re -up the, uh, to, to re-up those guidelines. I, I don't believe that they have been rescinded in any way, though. I believe they're still no, there. No, but um, there was, I couldn't really get a straight answer from Attorney General Sessions or Barr, so right. we'll, well, I hope we can talk about this more. For you. Um, I, I know you support reforms to police practices. That's correct. Um, yes. Okay, very good. We have, obviously have a major bill on that. Uh, conviction integrity units, uh, something that I think is very important. You support federal grants for that? Oh, yeah, yes. Look, I think that uh, convicting uh, someone uh, who uh, did not commit the crime is one of the most, uh, uh, it's, it's a risk, of course, of all kinds of law enforcement. But if we uh, can, de can determine that we've made a mistake, we need to, uh, very much to correct it. And I think that uh, grants for the purpose of um, uh, supporting uh, conviction integrity units in uh, district attorney, state's attorney's offices across the country is, is a very good idea. Uh, we share an interest in antitrust law. I know that you used to uh, teach that to law students and you've handled some cases as judge. As chair of the Com Competition Policy and Antitrust Subcommittee, uh, we're going to be doing a lot in this area along with my colleague, Senator Lee. Uh, Two-thirds of U.S. industries have become more concentrated between 97 and 2012. Uh, the pandemic has um, actually made things even harder on small businesses. Um, I think that we need more resources. The uh, FTC and the antitrust division of DOJ are literally shadows of what they were um, when the breakup of AT&T occurred, and we can't expect the agencies to do what we need to do to take on the biggest companies the world has ever known on the tech side in addition to other ones with band-aids and duct tape. Senator Grassley and I have a bill to uh, greatly increase the funding to those um, divisions and agencies. Would you support that? Well, I appreciate your recognizing that uh, my first love uh, in law school turned out was in fact antitrust. And I, I studied under one of the most famous uh, scholars and was his research assistant, Phil Arita. When I was in practice, I worked with Bob Potofsky, another one of the greatest scholars uh, and the former head of the a chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And I did practice antitrust law, including trying antitrust cases. Uh, I always want to be in a position of saying thank you, yes, when you ask whether we want more resources. My expectation is that, that is what I would say, but uh, 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 I, uh, until I'm, um, uh, if and until I'm uh, confirmed, I really can't evaluate uh, what resources we might need. But I'm Will happy to work with you. Will you commit to vigorously enforcing the antitrust laws? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I 
believe that we need some changes to those laws to aid you in doing that, um, and I hope you'll be open to those. I have a bill called the Competition Antitrust Law Enforcement Reform Act uh, that I hope you'll look at, uh, changing some of the standards for mergers um, and um, for exclusionary conduct. Um, I also think uh, that if anything um, has illustrated the need to look back at the consolidation in some of these industries, it would be the lawsuits filed by DOJ and uh, the FTC. Example, Facebook's acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, I'd suggest you look at Mark Zuckerberg's email uh, where he talked about purchasing nascent competitors, and I think the answer to that uh, has got to come uh, from the Justice Department, the answer, the reply to that email, um, that this kind of exclusionary conduct um, is not the way capitalism works in America. And we've always had a balance. We've had a balance um, through Republican presidents and Democratic presidents to say um, that we believe in the capitalist system and we have to make sure we keep rejuvenating it by allowing smaller competitors to emerge. That's not happening right now in many areas, and I just need your commitment uh, that you'll take this area of the law very seriously. I take it very seriously and have throughout my entire career. Uh, the Supreme Court has repeatedly referred to the antitrust laws as the charter of uh, American economic liberty, and I deeply believe that. Thank you very much, Judge Garland. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, this is the first test of the new regime. Uh, we are going to take a break now for 10 minutes and resume at 11.20 for the much-anticipated questioning of Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that gavel, we are now in a brief break in Merrick Garland's confirmation hearing to be Attorney General. This is a Washington Post special report. I'm Libby Casey. You can see the nominee there putting his mask back on. What a different experience to be testifying before this committee without the normal uh, crowds of people there to support you and uh, listen in person. Uh, this, though, a remark, uh, uh, rather a reflection of the times. Um, and, of course, the first time we're seeing Senator Durbin, Chairman Durbin, uh, run this committee. With me this morning, Rhonda Colvin, congressional reporter who's live on Capitol Hill, the site of today's hearing. Rhonda, we'll talk about how the committee's doing, but first, let's talk about the nominee, Merrick Garland. What has uh, stood out to you so far today about the content of, uh, of what he's been asked about and what he is telling this committee? Well, right out of the gate, when you listen to his opening statement, he seems to be really drawing that contrast that Biden wants him to draw between what his DOJ will look like and what William Barr's DOJ will look like. In fact, in his uh, opening statement, I believe it was like maybe sentence number three, he started talking about how he will be a lawyer for the entire country, not just for one individual. And of course, that is a nod probably to how William Barr handled the DOJ and his allyship with uh, President Trump. So that's something that we're seeing and hearing a lot of, that he keeps saying that he will adhere to the rule of law, he will help restore the DOJ, and that's what we're also seeing Democrats try to ask him and, and get to, is how will you restore confidence in the DOJ? And it's also important to point out as well that Merrick Garland's first job at the DOJ was back in the Carter administration when they were still uh, grappling with the aftermath of the Watergate scandal and how that was a politically tumultuous time. So he, that that was one of his very first jobs, was an advisor at the DOJ under the Carter administration. So, of course, he would be able to sort of bring that, that time and that period to uh, this job when the DOJ is, is looking to repair itself um, and, and looking to uh, sort of heal after uh, a very divisive and controversial time with William Barr and Jeff Sessions as well. Um, from Republicans, we're, we are hearing some partisanship. Uh, they, uh, a few Republicans have said that he has the their vote, but they need to ask about certain issues. And one of the things that keep coming up is uh, we heard uh, from Senator Graham and Senator Cornyn talk about Crossfire Hurricane, which uh, for folks who may not remember, that was the investigation that the FBI conducted to look into the Trump campaigns, the 2016 campaign's communication with Russia. And of course, uh, Senator Graham, when he led this committee, that was a big issue that he, he wanted to have hearings about and talk about, saying that the uh, FBI overreached in that. So we heard a little bit of uh, some residual issues at the DOJ that deal with Trump. Uh, but overall, as we said this morning, this is expected to be a very streamlined hearing. Uh, a lot of them have already said that he has the, the resume and the credentials.
credentials for this job, uh, but they, of course, are taking up their time, their eight minutes uh, in this first round of questioning uh, to get in either uh, their points about what they want him to do or things they want to him, him to address about the Trump administration. Rhonda, let's step back a moment and talk about sort of the, the plan for today and the plan for the week. If people are just tuning in, what, what are we expecting to see today in terms of the rhythm of those questions, the follow-ups, and then what is planned for the rest of the week and the eventual vote on this nominee? Well, today, this is the only day that Merrick Garland is scheduled to be in front of this committee. Sometimes when you have these uh, judicial nominees, it's a few days worth of uh, hearings and questions. But uh, today is the only day he is expected to be here. Right now, we are in uh, the first round of questioning, which uh, Senator Dick Durbin said they will each have eight minutes to question him, both sides. And then there will be a later round today where they will get five minutes to ask any other follow-up questions. So after today, Merrick Garland is... Uh, done with the Hill uh, for now, and tomorrow they will bring in outside witnesses who will serve somewhat as character witnesses for him and, and detail to this committee uh, how they think he will be able to run the DOJ. After that, you have a committee markup this week of uh, where the senators will meet, discuss this nomination, and their schedule right now is saying that a week from today, next Monday, they will vote on his confirmation uh, to get it out of this committee. And then after that, it heads to a Senate floor vote, which is ex also expected at some point next week. Well, Rhonda, let's go back and listen to an early moment from this morning. Uh, it was quite striking when Senator Chuck Grassley, the top Republican on the Judiciary Committee, admitted that he did in fact block Merrick Garland's Supreme Court confirmation hearing, but said he never attacked Garland's character and he thinks Garland is a great pick to lead the Department of Justice. Let's watch. This is, of course, Judge Garland's first time appearing before this committee since ascending to the federal bench. I had uh, something to do with that after the death of Justice Scalia. My Republican colleagues and I decided not to hold a hearing on his nomination, in other words, meaning Judge Garland's nomination to the Supreme Court, having been nominated by President Obama. So yes, it's true that I didn't give Judge Garland a hearing. I also didn't mischaracterize his record. I didn't attack his character. I didn't go through his high school yearbook. I didn't make his wife leave the hearing in tears. I took a position on hearings and I stuck to it. And that's it. This, of course, is a worthy capstone on a storied career that you have had. Judge Garland is a good pick to lead the Department of Justice. That's earlier today, the top Republican on this committee, Chuck Grassley. Uh, Rhonda, obviously uh, making a reference there to Brett Kavanaugh and his Supreme Court process. Uh, remind us of the details there and also what it means for, you know, to hear Chuck Grassley talk about the fact that Republicans did not give this man, Merrick Garland, a hearing five years ago. Right, it sort of addressed sort of uh, the elephant in the room because most people probably know Merrick Garland as the uh, Supreme Court nominee who uh, never was, that uh, he never got a hearing uh, from Senate Republicans. And so Grassley is addressing that, saying that he still stands by that decision. Uh, but he also added that he uh, did not uh, make his wife cry leaving the, the hearing room or check his uh, high school yearbook. Those were all things that happened during the Brett Kavanaugh uh, hearings, which were quite contentious. Uh, so it was a little bit of um, a partisanship that Grassley injected in there, uh, saying that he stands by his decision that uh, they did not go forward with the, the Merrick Garland nomination back uh, during the time where he could have been a Supreme Court justice. Um, so it, it's, it was to address that issue, of course, but it's also addressing uh, what this Senate Judiciary Committee has often been, which is a very, very partisan committee uh, where you do see a lot of political theater, you do see a lot of contention. Uh, so I believe that's what Chuck Grassley was getting at, is this is not uh, like the days of Kavanaugh. So um, it somewhat also mimicked what Dick Durbin was trying to say, too. He's trying to set a tone, at least in his opening statements, that he will work with Grassley, he will try to work uh, with the Republicans on the committee to soften the tone in this committee. 
Yeah, we have to remember, Rhonda, that Brett Kavanaugh did have a hearing process, though. And then the Washington Post, our colleagues, uh, broke the story, Emma Brown broke the story, that Christine Blasey Ford accused Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault when they were young. And so we saw this process uh, go forward, which was very heated, very emotional, um, and, uh, and did result in uh, a lot of criticism of Brett Kavanaugh, also a lot of retribution and anger by Republicans. Um, so uh, that, that's why that went down that road, right? That wasn't just Democrats like throwing spaghetti against the wall. Um, I important, I think, to put that in context, but Chuck Grassley bringing it up here, and I think Rhonda is showing the partisan nature of this process, even as we're hearing the Republicans say generous things about Merrick Garland, we are hearing them uh, use this moment as Democrats have done in the past when the tables have been turned to go after political priorities that they have. What are we learning from their questions about the kind of relationship an Attorney General Garland might have with Republicans on this important committee? Well, it seems that Republicans are expecting him to uh, be uh, the type of attorney general that they can sort of get behind. Even though they are asking some partisan questions, they are saying that he does have the resume to do this. There was an important exchange, I thought, and this came from a Democrat, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, who uh, brought up the point that in uh, last the last DOJ, they were not able to get a lot of answers from the FBI when Congress sought them about different investigations, different classified uh, information that uh, the DOJ was not communicative with Congress and he was asking Merrick Garland to uh, affirm that he will be more communicative and, and Merrick Garland did take that as an opportunity to say that he will uh, try to work with, uh, with Congress on, on any matters where there's overlap and they need to be in communication. Um, so it seems that you know both sen senators from both sides are, are trying to uh, get Garland to uh, adhere and, and affirm uh, to how they think Think the DOJ should run and, and to look in things and, and from the the uh, from what we've been able to see they seem to be put at ease I've seen this committee many times if they don't feel uh, that the uh, person in front of them is answering the questions to their liking, they will go very hard and continue to talk and talk and talk. What we're seeing right now is, yes, some hard questions, but you're also seeing them wrap up their line of questioning rather quickly and, and also say that they um, support him uh, and will support him when this goes to the Senate floor. So that's, that's a little different than what we've seen from other Senate Judiciary confirmation hearings where it can be quite contentious and, and quite hard to watch. Let's bring in our colleague, Mary Beth Albright, who's both a reporter and a lawyer. Um, Mary Beth, you, before the hearing started, set us up for the day, reminding us that this is a different process than uh, if Merrick Garland was indeed going through his Supreme Court confirmation process, right? The one that he was nominated to five years ago by President Obama and did, did not ever get this opportunity. So what has stood out to you in, in this process focused on that attorney general job that he may indeed have soon? Well, Libby, it's the first time I can remember that I heard someone in their opening statement use the word kindness, right? Um, that's very different uh, than, than what a lot of people will talk about when they talk about the law, that he wanted to make sure that kindness was in the justice system. And beyond that, they ran the gamut, right? So he, they talked about FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, talked about opioids, talked about domestic terrorism, um, tech antitrust. I found that a really interesting conversation um, that he talked about the balance of capitalism and competition and economic liberty. That, that, that was a super interesting conversation because these are the kinds of things that perhaps a Supreme Court justice nominee couldn't mm answer because of the politics or the policy of it, but Garland can answer. Um, I also thought it was interesting when they were talking about how much they respect him, um, how important it is for him to be independent, how important it is for him to respect the work of the career employees and let them do their work. As I mentioned in the pre-show, that was what all of the uh, Department of Justice uh, lawyers who I talked to just said, will he let us do our jobs? I also thought Lindsey Graham's question was really interesting about whether Garland had ever been to the border because Garland in his opening statements did talk about the, the terror of having parents and children ripped from each other. Um, so uh, it, it'll be interesting to see in the rest of the hearing if they, if they follow along that sort of line of questioning. Um, and another thing that Garland committed to no partisan investigations, 
Um, that's sort of something that is a, is a given, but um, but maybe not in this uh, in this atmosphere that we've been having. Yeah, for the past not not necessarily a given uh, in in uh, in recent history. Mary Beth, we're just watching the committee hearing closely because we do see that Senator Mike Lee, who's the next one to ask questions, is seated. Uh, Chairman Durbin, you see Lee, Mr. Lee there. You see Senator Durbin, the chairman of this committee, running a tight ship so far, starting right on time at 9.30. So the chairman does set the tone. I, I do want to try to get in this question, though, Mary Beth, about the January 6th Capitol attack. And we are hearing Merrick Garland talk about just how, uh, what he called a heinous attack on the democratic process, just how serious this is and how seriously he will take it as attorney general. Um, reflections on sort of, you know, how he's talking about the January 6th attack. Absolutely. I, I think one of the one of the things that he said, it might not have been in response to that, but it was in response to one of the questions was, hey, Congress, tell me tell me what your priorities are. Right. So if you give me a bunch of questions and I need to answer them, like backlogged questions from the last administration, please rank them in order of importance. This is a I wouldn't call it deference to the Senate, but I would call it a, a spirit of cooperation and a spirit of understanding the 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 uh, the legislative branch in a way that perhaps other past attorney generals have not acted in that sense of cooperation like what's important to you what's important to the department of justice and how do we work together on that and i think because of that um there's going to be special attention to the january 6th attack because it's very personal to people on the hill it's very personal to people who are there mm. Great point. Uh, let's go back to Rhonda Colvin uh, to preview the senators we are hearing from next. We know that Senator Lee uh, is coming and we do have a slew of uh, Republicans who would love to be running for president in a couple years time, Rhonda. And it goes all the way from people who who have really criticized President Trump and are taking a leading voice uh, like Ben Sass to the other end of the extreme, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, Senator Josh Hawley, Senator Tom Cotton, Rhonda. Yeah, all of those. I'm, I'm waiting to hear from all of those. Uh, and most of them are usually very outspoken on this committee. They usually uh, use up most of their question and answer time. They try to highlight different uh, thoughts or initiatives that they, they want to hear uh, the nominee on. So, uh, and they're, they're sort of, um, some of those you mentioned are very close allies to the former president. Uh, so we will have uh, Senator Cruz up shortly. We will have Senator Hawley and both of them uh, haven't uh, had much uh, time on the Hill in, in these uh, hearings uh, recently, um, and, and they're being closely watched because of Ted Cruz's, uh, the situation where he went to a vacation while his state is, is dealing with some devastation. And you also have Josh Hawley, uh, who is also a subject of a, a Senate ethics uh, investigation into his comments on January 6th. So these are people that will be speaking uh, soon, and, and you also have on the Democrat side, Senator Cory Booker, Senator Maisie Hirono, uh, who will also be, Senator Coons, who will also be coming up shortly. So. Uh, watching all of them, really, uh, and seeing how they handle this confirmation hearing. One of the senators we're looking at right now with uh, Klobuchar and Coons is Senator Padilla, the new uh, senator from California, Rhonda. Um, talk to us about the Democrats who are new to this committee. Right, and we learned at the top of this hearing that uh, Senator Dick Durbin said that uh, Mr. Padilla is now going to be over a subcommittee as a part of his uh, membership on the Judiciary Committee, and he will be the first Latino senator to lead a subcommittee uh, with Judiciary. So there was some news there. Uh, you also have John Ossoff, who's the newly elected Georgia uh, senator. He is uh, brand new on this committee. Uh, so that, that also makes the, um, the tone of the committee change a little bit, too. You have new faces. You're going to be hearing from them uh, for the first time, and they will likely want to use this time uh, where they know everyone's watching uh, to put forward whatever their agenda is and, and sort of introduce themselves to the audience. Mm. I'm looking at the committee uh, assignments right now, and significant to have a freshman, Rhonda, as you said, Senator Padilla chairing this subcommittee. Um, you know, that's that's uh, um, sort of an honor for a freshman to be given. Subcommittee uh, that he will be chairing is on immigration, citizenship, and border uh, safety. So certainly significant uh, in Chairman Durbin's opinion to have someone uh, who is a Hispanic senator chairing that committee, a freshman representing California. Also, he mentioned Senator Booker chairing a subcommittee on criminal justice and counterterrorism. Um, both sides of the aisle have been criticized for having a lack of diversity on a panel as significant as this one. 
Um, Republicans even more so, Rhonda, because they ha they've had even less diversity among their ranks. Um, we finally see a woman on this committee, at least, uh, from the Republican side of the aisle, but it has taken them quite a while to try to, uh, to, to change the lineup of just who sits on this very influential committee. That's right. I mean, historically, this was a very uh, white male Senate uh, committee. And, and actually, Dianne Feinstein, who still sits on the committee, she was one of the first women on this committee historically. Uh, and she shared that with Carol Mosley Braun. Um, so they're still uh, making some uh, progress here. And it might seem slow to people, but this is uh, definitely one of the oldest committees on the Hill. And I, I believe Senator Durbin did uh, remark about that, that this is a very storied committee. Joe Biden wants led it uh, for a few terms. So uh, yes, we are now seeing a little bit more diversity. You also have with John Ossoff, he is the first, uh, I, I think we are going to go back to the hearing. Yep, and I think Rhonda was saying is a Jewish senator. And so let's go now uh, back to what's happening. Uh, Senator Durbin in the chair. Ed Levy. Uh, I've been a lifelong admirer of his. Uh, he, he truly is an attorney general in the grand tradition of that office, and he's someone uh, my family has known in one way or another for, for a long time. My late father worked for him as, uh, while he was running the civil division during Ed Levy's time as attorney general, and I've uh, had close personal and professional interactions with both his son, David Levy, a former judge and uh, later law school dean, and, um, and with Ed Levy's grandson, David's son, Will, who served with me uh, as my chief counsel, worked on this committee for several years, and, and later served as chief of staff to Attorney General Barr. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so a uh, big fan of that family, and I'm glad that he's someone that you look up to. Uh, I want to talk about a few issues today. Let's talk first for a moment about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. Uh, this is going back uh, 15 years or so, but uh, in, in a case called Parker versus District of Columbia, a, a case that later became known uh, as as, as uh, District of Columbia versus Heller. As I recall, you voted um, for rehearing and bonk uh, 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 with respect to an opinion striking down that that same ban on um, uh, handguns within the District of Columbia. And, uh, of course, uh, later in the same proceedings of the same case, the Supreme Court struck down the ban. Can you tell us why you voted the way that you did, why you, you voted to give D.C. another chance to defend its ban on handguns in that case? Yes, Senator. Uh, as I know you know, because uh, you were a law clerk yourself, uh, you know that um, a rehearing on Bonk is a vote to hear a case. It's not a vote on the merits of the case. And in my case, it's, for myself, it's never a vote on the merits. It's a vote to, to rehear the case. The panel decision um, um, was the first time, uh, I think, ever um, a uh, court of appeals had held the individual right to keep and bear arms, which you are exactly right. The Supreme Court did uphold in the end. Every uh, court of appeals had decided to the contrary. And the issue was plainly one that would require uh, looking at a, a, a deep historical record. Uh, as to the meaning of the Second Amendment and as to the way that it had been applied. Um, I thought this was an uh, extremely important issue, uh, important enough since it was the very first time um, that uh, we should hear it on Bank. I was not the only judge, uh, and uh, other judges, including a judge appointed by, uh, the, uh, by a president of a different party, also voted, and for the same reason so that we would have an opportunity to hear the case. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit about the meaning of the Second Amendment. How do you view it? And, and um, do you agree with uh, Justice Thomas's analysis in his dissent in the Rogers case that the Second Amendment right to bear arms certainly includes uh, the, the, the right to carry operable firearms uh, in public for self-defense? So my view is, is totally controlled uh, by uh, the Heller opinion. Um, and uh, in that case, Justice Scalia held that there was an individual right uh, to keep and uh, bear arms uh, for self-defense. Uh, in the subsequent McDonald case, the court said that was a fundamental right, uh, which applied uh, to the states as well. 
Um, it is a right, uh, as Justice Scalia said in the opinion, like all rights, that is subject to some uh, limitations. Uh, the court has not um, uh, given us much more to work with at this point. Um, and, I, um, and I do think, as I uh, said with respect to my vote on Bonk, this is a matter that requires careful uh, historical examination, uh, which I have never done, uh, and, and I certainly can't uh, you know, do sitting here uh, for you. So I don't have an opinion on that question. Okay. You've been in a, in a judicial role for the last um, uh, 20 going on 25 years. Yes, sir. Um, You'll be in a, in a different role, it confirmed to this position, one in which you'll have a significant impact on policy. Uh, so let's talk about policy as it relates to the Second Amendment briefly. Do you support universal background checks? Well, I, I do think um, that it's very important um, that uh, we be careful that people who are entitled to have guns uh, are, are, um, uh, get the background check that allows them to have them. Uh, and that those who are not entitled and uh, who are we, are we are concerned about because they're threats, because of felon, they're felons, or for whatever reason barred by the law, that we have uh, that there is an opportunity uh, to determine uh, that uh, uh, they not be given a gun. Um, do, you, do you support so, banning specific types of guns? I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Do you support banning banning of, of certain types of firearms? Well, uh, as I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, the president um, is a strong supporter of gun control and has been an advocate uh, all of his life, uh, uh, his professional life on this question. The role of the Justice Department is to advance the uh, policy program of the administration as long as it is consistent with the law. Um, and as I said, so far we have a little uh, indication from the Supreme Court as to, to what this means, uh, but we don't have a, a, a complete uh, indication. Um, and uh, where there is room under the law for the president's uh, policies to be pursued, then I, I think the president is entitled to pursue them. What about policies that would uh, support holding firearms manufacturers liable for damage caused by people using firearms they produced uh, to commit a, com a crime? I don't have a, I, I, I believe that uh, the president may have a position on this uh, question. I have not thought myself deeply about this. Um, I don't think it raises a Second Amendment uh, um, um, issue itself, uh, the question of a liability protection, um, but I have not uh, addressed this in, in any way, and I right. need to think about this considerably the, more. The other questions I raised potentially implicate the Second Amendment. That one uh, raises other policy concerns. I, I understand. I understand that. Um, let's talk about FISA briefly. Yes. Um, Senator Leahy and I have offered an amendment uh, to reform the FISA process by strengthening the amicus curiae provisions that are already in there in existing law uh, that have been put in there uh, by, among other provisions, uh, the USA Freedom Act, which Senator Leahy and I uh, got passed through Congress and signed into law by President Obama in 2015. Um, and, and our amendments would also require the government to disclose relevant exculpatory evidence, uh, both to the FISA court and to the amici. This is an amendment that ended up passing the Senate last year by a bipartisan supermajority of 77 to 19. Do you support reforms to FISA, uh, like those I just described in the Lee Leahy amendment? So I think FISA is an extremely um, important tool. Uh, for the Justice Department uh, and the intelligence community in general to protect the country from uh, foreign agents and foreign terrorists. Uh, on the other hand, it is extremely important that uh, everything we do with respect to FISA, and, and I have felt this way my entire professional life also, that we do so in accordance with the law and with respect for the constitutional rights of uh, citizens. Um, I, I don't know any, very much specifically about your two proposals. Uh, I do know um, the current uh, rules with respect to amicus, and I have had the opportunity to discuss those with uh, uh, judges on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and every, everyone seems uh, quite happy with the way that process is going. I don't know what more might be needed. I would have to study that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired. I've got one very brief follow-up. Can I just finish that, that question? Thank you. Now, on on uh, this topic of questions related to FISA, I also wanted to ask you, do you think that the federal government ought to be able to collect um, American citizens' web browsing or Internet search history without a search warrant supported by probable cause? Uh, I know this is a big issue. I don't 
you know, my experience with FISA comes from a slightly different era. Um, I had a lot of experience, but it was very a different era, and I followed this a little bit. Uh, I obviously haven't had any cases on it myself. I'd have to look at it. I'm, you know, I, I believe in a judicial review, um, and, I, and I'm a strong uh, supporter of uh, and respectful of uh, judicial review of, of um, uh, orders, but I don't know what the practicalities of going for a probable cause warrant in those circumstances would be, if, if there would be an emergency, et cetera. And I'd, uh, I'd, I'd be eager to engage with you and uh, other members of the committee who are concerned about this so that I can understand this problem uh, uh, more fully. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Senator Coons. Uh, thank you, Chairman Durbin, uh, Ranking Member Grassley, um, Judge Garland, welcome. Thank you. Um, congratulations on your nomination. Uh, and please convey my thanks to Lynn, to Jake, to Becky, to your family uh, for supporting what has been a decades-long career uh, at the bench and bar uh, as someone dedicated to public service, to law enforcement, and to upholding the balance uh, between justice and liberty. Um, I cannot think uh, of a more urgent task before us than restoring uh, the people's faith in our institutions and in the rule of law. And uh, your opening statement, which in part was dedicated to clarifying your view that the Attorney General represents the public interest and your enthusiasm for ensuring that the 115,000 career employees of the Department of Justice are appropriately sheltered from partisan or political influence is very encouraging to me um, after uh, what I think were some harrowing moments in the last few years. Um, as I'm sure you know, there are um, quite a few admirers of yours uh, who work uh, here in this committee, some former clerks of yours who work closely with me, uh, and many um, who've uh, reassured me not just of your um, professional skill and great insights, but also of your personal decency, um, kindness, and thoughtfulness. I was struck in reading through your uh, background that you've spent 20 years uh, quietly as a tutor uh, at an elementary school here in the District of Columbia, something I think not enough elected or appointed officials on either the bench or in Congress do. So thank you uh, for your willingness to continue your service. Um, I'm from a small town in Delaware, uh, which like many other um, cities in America uh, was torn apart uh, by concerns about racial justice and inequality, um, a city that has also struggled with uh, long-standing challenges with gun violence and uh, with insecurity and instability in our community. Our mayor, uh, Mike Przicki, our governor, John Carney, are doing a great job and working hard to try and address this and striking the right balance between uh, protecting our citizens uh, from gun violence but also um, developing an environment where law enforcement is more transparent and accountable is going to be one of the core challenges uh, which you and the Department of Justice will be involved in in partnership with state and local law enforcement and with other elected officials. Um, in Wilmington and Dover, Delaware, we're rolling out body-worn cameras uh, for law enforcement officers. Our governor's committed uh, to having that available for all of our law enforcement officers by 2025, but it's very expensive. It's something law enforcement has embraced. It's something that advocates have embraced. Um, I am an appropriator for the Department of Justice as well as a member of this committee. Um, is that something you could agree to, to be an advocate for uh, the funding and deployment of body-worn cameras to ensure both accountability and improve trust uh, between law enforcement and local communities? Well, Senator, I'm, uh, again, always uh, happy to accept more resources for the Department of Justice. I don't know what that might take away from in other areas for the department, but I, I personally think that uh, body cams are a very important uh, uh, tool um, uh, to protect, both to protect uh, officers and to protect the citizens. Um, and uh, you know, just uh, as everyone, uh, you well, you were all on the inside. Uh, I was on the outside watching what happened uh, on uh, January 6th. And the, uh, the fact that we were able to see uh, exactly what was happening to the officers uh, and the way in which uh, they uh, were caring about uh, their duties uh, in, uh, in the best way they could um, is only possible to be captured because of the body cameras. I think well, it's an I, important tool for accountability. Yes, I do. Thank you, Your Honor. If, if you might, I do think it's important that we increase investment in a variety of programs I've long uh, worked for the Victims of Child Abuse Act. Uh, COVID-19 has demonstrated a tragic rise in child abuse, and this is a critical tool that allows um, state and local law enforcement to effectively um, address uh, child abuse. The Bulletproof Vest Partnership Program, which has helped um, save 3,000 officers' lives, these and other grant programs are things I look forward to working with you on. 
Um, there's also a much needed legislation that will move us forward in terms of criminal justice reform um, and uh, protecting communities from violence. Uh, Senator Cornyn and I hope to soon reintroduce uh, the Nix Denial Notification Act, uh, which just ensures that state and local law enforcement gets notified when a person prohibited uh, lies and tries. They attempt to purchase a gun. That's something that's been discussed uh, in previous Congresses on this committee. We haven't made progress on it. I think we should. Senator Wicker and I are soon going to introduce, reintroduce the Bipartisan Driving for Opportunity Act, uh, which incentivizes states to stop suspending driver's licenses simply for unpaid fines and fees. Um, it's a cruel, uh, counterproductive way to take away people's ability to get to work and ensures people are trapped in modern-day debt prisons. It's something that has strong support from law enforcement and civil rights groups. Uh, and I'd just be interested in whether you'll work with us uh, here in Congress to move um, bipartisan bills like these two. I'm, I'm extremely interested, if I'm confirmed, in working uh, with the members of Congress, and particularly on bipartisan uh, legislation. I don't know uh, specifically about those, but each of them has the ring of something that's very important and, and quite reasonable. Well, enactable, reasonable, moving the ball forward are the sorts of things I hope we get to work on. I'll be serving as the chair of the subcommittee on privacy, technology, and the law in this Congress and look forward to working uh, with Senator Sass, uh, who will serve as ranking member. One of the core things we'll be looking at is how online misinformation uh, is contributing uh, to domestic terrorism, to division here. Um, you've discussed your own experience with domestic terrorism cases uh, and your plan to prioritize this issue. It's something uh, the FBI director has said is one of our most pressing um, threats. Um, do you think the DOJ has a role to play in examining the role of misinformation and incitement online um, to contributing to violence um, um, and uh, that, that the DOJ has a role in working to help us develop um, reasonable solutions to this challenge? Well, uh, again, Senator, I think that uh, every opportunity the Justice Department uh, has to work with uh, members of the Senate to uh, think about how to solve problems and how to craft legislation is one that we should take. Um, I, 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 I don't have in mind particular legislation in this area. I do think that um, an important part of the investigation of uh, violent extremist groups is following their activities uh, online and getting an idea of uh, what kind of information and misinformation um, is, is putting, uh, being put out. Um, well, I look forward to uh, you know, talking more about this with you. Well, there's in increasing uh, regulatory uh, schemes, both in Europe uh, and in California and other states being considered. And I look forward to working with you on striking that appropriate balance between protecting data privacy, protecting individual liberty, but also protecting um, the competitiveness of the United States and globally making sure that we're pushing back on digital authoritarianism. Last, I'm glad to see the department is prosecuting. I think there's 235 charges brought so far against rioters uh, who invaded the Capitol and attacked our democracy on January 6th. I've supported calls for a 9-11 style independent commission uh, to investigate the bigger picture of uh, what caused this and what uh, we might learn uh, from it. Um, do you think uh, an independent commission of that style would help complement the department's work and help the American people better understand uh, the root causes of that riot, that incident, and then uh, better help us uh, both protect the Capitol and those of us who serve here, but more importantly, uh, protect the underpinnings of our democracy? Uh, well, Senator, I do think the 9-11 Commission was uh, very useful and very helpful in understanding uh, uh, what happened then. Um, and, of course, uh, the uh, Congress has uh, full authority to conduct this kind of uh, oversight investigation or to set up an independent commission. Uh, the only thing that I would ask, uh, if I uh, uh, were uh, confirmed, is that care be taken that it not, uh, the invest uh, that commission's investigation not interfere with our ability uh, to prosecute uh, individuals and entities that caused uh, uh, the, uh, the capital, uh, the storming of the capital, and, and as you well know, this is a very sensitive issue about uh, uh, you know disclosing operations which are still in progress, disclosing our sources and methods, and um, um, uh, uh, and allowing people to testify in a way that then makes it impossible to prosecute them. So, with those caveats, I, I, I certainly could not object to anything that the, the Congress uh, would want to do in this regard. 
Understood. Thank you, Judge. I'm encouraged by the broad bipartisan support you've already garnered uh, from this committee and publicly and look forward to supporting your confirmation. Thank, Thank you me. very much, Senator. I appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Kuhn. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Garland, welcome. Thank you, Senator. Uh, congratulations on your nomination. Thank you. Uh, in two plus decades on the court, uh, you have built a reputation for integrity uh, and for setting aside partisan interests interests in following the law. The job to which you have been appointed is a very different job. And as I look back over the eight years of the Obama-Biden Justice Department, in my view, the most problematic aspect of that tenure was that the Department of Justice was politicized and weaponized in a way that was directly contrary to over a century of tradition of the Department of Justice of being apolitical and not a partisan tool to target your opponents. So it is very much my hope, if you're confirmed as Attorney General, that you will bring that reputation for integrity to the Department of Justice and, and, and demonstrate a willingness to stand up for what will be inevitable political pressure to once again politicize the Department of Justice and use it as a tool to attack the political opponents of the current administration. Eric Holder, before he was nominated as Attorney General, had likewise built a reputation as being relatively nonpartisan and a prosecutor with integrity. And unfortunately, his tenure as Attorney General did enormous damage to that reputation. As was previously discussed, Eric Holder described his role as Attorney General as being the wingman for President Obama. Am I right in, in assuming you do not view your role as Attorney General as being Joe Biden's wingman? Yeah, Senator, I'm, I, I, uh, as I said, I don't want to comment on any individual's um, um, conduct as uh, any of my predecessors uh, or FBI directors' uh, uh, conduct in any way. Uh, but I can assure you I do not uh, regard myself as uh, anything other uh, than the lawyer for the people of the United States. Um, and I am not the President's lawyer. Um, I am uh, um, the United States lawyer. And I will do everything in my power, uh, uh, which I believe is considerable, uh, to fend off any effort by anyone um, uh, to make prosecutions or investigations uh, partisan uh, or political in any way. My job is to protect the Department of Justice and its employees in going about their job and doing the right thing according to the facts and the law. Under the Obama administration, the IRS targeted the political opponents of the president. It targeted conservatives for their speech. It targeted pro-Israel groups. It targeted uh, Tea Party groups. It targeted individuals uh, perceived to be on the opposite political side as the administration. Will you commit as Attorney General that you will not allow the Department of Justice to be used to target those who are perceived as political opponents because they are political opponents? Absolutely. I will not. Also under the Obama administration, Operation Choke Point was used to pressure lawful organizations, lawful institutions, institutions, for example, that sell firearms, to constrain their lawful activity and to use regulatory authority to abuse and force them to comply with the administration's stated policies. Do you believe it's appropriate for the administration to use regulatory pressure to force lawful behavior to stop? Uh, Senator, I, I'm not aware of, of the specific uh, that, that you're giving, and I expect you don't expect that I would have been aware of it. But of course, I do not believe, uh, as a general matter, that regulations should be used to stop people uh, from doing um, uh, what they're lawfully entitled to do, unless the regulation is pursuant to a statute, obviously, in which Congress is given authority to uh, change the rules. As you also know, Attorney General Eric Holder was held in contempt of Congress, criminal contempt of Congress. That was a bipartisan vote. Eighteen Democrats voted to hold Attorney General Holder in contempt. They did so because he refused to produce documents to Congress for Congress's investigation of the Fast and Furious scandal. 
a major scandal that resulted in the death of two federal law enforcement officers. You've previously committed to senators on this panel that under your leadership, the Department of Justice will comply to the extent possible with requests from this committee. And I want to, in the course of this question, associate myself with Senator Whitehouse's comments and questions. He and I disagree on a great many issues. But on this particular issue, we are emphatically in agreement that senators from this committee should get answers, should get candid answers, should get substantive answers, should get real answers from the Department of Justice, regardless of the party of the senator asking that question, that that's, that is a level of oversight that the American people have a right to expect. Do you agree with that? I do think that uh, this is a level of oversight the American people have a right to expect. Uh, ex I want the department, if I'm confirmed, uh, to be responsive uh, to the extent it's possible uh, with respect to our, uh, the Justice Department's uh, appropriate uh, equities um, to be responsive to the requests for information. So you've had, previously you said you've read the executive summary of, of the Horowitz report. What, what was your reaction? to the Horowitz report? Well, I, I, I thought, uh, as Mr. Horowitz uh, explained, and uh, I don't, uh, and I, I believe uh, Director Ray agreed, there were uh, um, um, problems with respect to uh, the applications uh, for uh, uh, FI, uh, several FISAs, uh, that those uh, were not, they were not consistent with uh, the internal regulations of the department, and uh, that, that those problems had to be corrected. Um, and um, I, I think deeply that we have to be careful about how we use FISA, and that's the reason we have uh, uh, pretty strict regulations internally and policies, uh, and uh, we need to find out um, why they aren't followed and to be sure that they are followed. And I understand that was the purpose of his report and his recommendations to Director Ray. So you described the report as saying there were problems. That's a fairly anodyne way of characterizing it given the multiple material misstatements the Horowitz report details, including Mr. Klein Smith's fabrication of evidence and lying to a court, which he's now pleaded guilty to. Um, I think that was yet another example of the deep politicization of the Department of Justice, culminating in a meeting with the acting Attorney General, President Obama, Vice President Biden in the Oval Office concerning the targeting of their political opponent. Will you commit to this committee that under your leadership, the Department of Justice will not target the political opponents of this administration and there will be real scrutiny? What that report outlines, among other things, is weaponizing oppo research from the Hillary Clinton campaign and launching a criminal investigation based on that. Will you commit that that conduct will not be acceptable under any Department of Justice you're leading? So, uh, absolutely, Senator, but w without uh, trying to comment specifically on, on that matter, it's totally inappropriate uh, for the Department to target us, uh, any individual because of their uh, politics or their position in a campaign. The only uh, basis for targeting has to be uh, evidence of, um, of, of, of the risk of a foreign intelligence uh, problem or of a uh, criminal problem. And uh, it, that is a nonpartisan issue. Uh, that is a question of objective facts and law. And it can never be an effort to help uh, one party or another party. Um, in polit in uh, investigations and prosecutions, there is no party. The department uh, is an independent, nonpartisan actor, uh, and that's my job to ensure that that's the case. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Cruz. We now understand that Senator Leahy is in Zoom range. <laughs> Senator Leahy, do you read me? Can you hear me? I hear the voice. I assume there's a picture coming in here somewhere. Is there a way to turn up the volume so we can hear Senator Leahy? There he is. And I'll move this camera around just a little bit. All right, if you'll... Okay. Take it away, uh, Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad you're having these hearings. And, Judge, it's great to see you uh, seated there. I 
had wished five years ago we would have seen you seated there for your Supreme Court nomination, but I'm glad you're here today. Thank and you, I think Senator. That the, the nomination comes at probably the most vulnerable moment in the 51, uh, 151 year history of the uh, department. And you've got to restore the integrity and the respect of the department. No small job, but I can't think of anybody more qualified to do that. I know that a number of people have stated their uh, support of you. Uh, one person I know and respect greatly, former FBI Director uh, Judge Free, and uh, I know he uh, sent a letter, and Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, uh, could we have that letter go in the record if you haven't already put it there? Without objection. Thank you. Um, we're going, a lot of the things have already been covered, and of course, I, you and I have talked before, your experience in the Oklahoma City bombing is, anybody who's been a prosecutor knows what a job you did there, and I, I do appreciate that. We have other things that we have to deal with, uh, the Voting Rights Act, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act enforcement. We've seen that there's been a scourge of, of voter suppression, which would be wrong. I don't care who's being suppressed. Uh, unless uh, the Justice Department gets its tools back under the Voting Rights Act, I'm afraid that the uh, Right to vote is always going to be at risk, especially for minorities and underserved communities. Uh, do you agree that legislation like the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is urgently needed? So, Senator, um, I don't know the specifics of the act, although I certainly knew John Lewis uh, uh, well and uh, was a great admirer. Um, I think that uh, with respect to voting, um, even in this last election, where um, a, a larger percentage of Americans voted than ever uh, before, there was still a huge percentage uh, that did not, at least a third, did not, uh, did not vote. I think it's important um, that every American have the opportunity to vote. Voting is the central uh, facet, the, uh, uh, the fulcrum of our um, democracy. Uh, so anything that can, uh, any, any um, legislation that will encourage uh, more voting, uh, I strongly support. Um, specifically, uh, you were uh, averring to the Supreme Court's uh, decision in the Shelby County case, uh, which um, said that the coverage formula for preclearance uh, uh, couldn't be used as unconstitutional uh, because of uh, the, uh, the then state of the congressional record. Uh, but uh, the court indicated that a, uh, a different uh, and stronger record uh, might support preclearance. Um, and I would be in favor of, uh, uh, if I'm confirmed, of working with the committee uh, and the Senate and the House to uh, try and develop that uh, record uh, that would allow that important tool to be used. Uh, the department still does have other tools. It has Section 2, uh, which remains uh, in force, uh, as the Supreme Court clearly said, in Shelby County. And it prevents uh, interference uh, um, uh, 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 with voting uh, practices and procedures. Um, uh, that, you know that uh, interfere uh, with minorities' ability to vote, and uh, it is something that the department uh, has always uh, looked to as an important uh, tool. Um, there are uh, plenty of other tools to in, uh, increase the uh, ability of Americans to vote, which I would support. Thank you. Thank you, and. I know Senator Lee has already, has already raised this, but uh, please, please know that uh, Senator Lee and I will both be talking to you about privacy matters. Uh, this is not a partisan issue, it's a, an issue of concern, and we'll do that. Let me ask you another area that was uh, uh, an issue of concern to me. In the Bush administration, the last Bush administration, they uh, put a moratorium on death penalty in, in federal cases. They 
gave solid reasons for that. And that uh, moratorium has lasted, or did last, from 2003 during the Bush administration. And then suddenly, um, in the last six months, the Justice Department, under the last president, rushed to execute more people. And this is what's stunning. In six months, they've been executed in the past 60 years. That's a matter that many of us feel that was nothing short of being a, a killing spree. And what worries me, we all know the death penalty is used disproportionately against minorities and the poor. I was a prosecutor. I prosecuted many murder cases. I always opposed the death penalty. And Vermont has gotten rid of theirs. Uh, I'd much rather have somebody served that time for years in a prison cell thinking of what they, they did wrong. Now, I'm joining Senator Durbin and Senator Booker in reintroducing the Federal Death Penalty Act, which would end the federal death penalty. penalty. So I'd ask you this. Uh, would you go back to what President Bush did and uh, reinstate the uh, federal moratorium, uh, which was lifted just in the last few months by the last administration, have reinstated it while Senator Durbin, Senator Booker, myself, and others uh, work on the legislation eliminating the death penalty. Well, as you know, Senator, uh, President Biden is an uh, opponent of the death penalty. Um, I have to say that uh, over those almost 20 years in which uh, the federal death penalty uh, had been paused, um, I, I have had a great pause about the, about, about the death penalty. Um, I am um, uh, very concerned about uh, the large number of exonerations um, that uh, have occurred through DNA evidence and otherwise, uh, not only in death penalty convictions, but uh, also in other convictions. I, I think uh, a terrible uh, thing occurs uh, when um, somebody is convicted of a crime that they did not commit, and the most terrible thing happens. Uh, if someone is executed uh, for a crime they did not commit. It's also the case that during this pause, we've seen a fewer and fewer uh, uh, death penalty applications anywhere in the country, not only in the federal government, uh, but among the states. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, I, I'm concerned uh, uh, about the increasing um, almost randomness or arbitrariness of its application uh, when you have so uh, few number of cases. And finally, uh, and uh, uh, very importantly, is the uh, other uh, matter that you raise, which is its disparate impact. Uh, the data is clear that it has an enormously uh, disparate impact on um, uh, black Americans and uh, members of communities of color. And uh, exonerations also, that uh, something like half of the exonerations had to do uh, with uh, black men. So all of this uh, has given me pause, um, and I expect uh, that the uh, president will be given direction in this area. Um, and um, uh, if so, I, um, I expect it not at all unlikely uh, that uh, we will re uh, return to the uh, previous policy. Thank you. I think my time is probably just about up, but I would add also add, um, as chairman of the Appropriations Committee, I'm going to be talking to you about the Department of Justice and the grants they had on uh, Violence Against Women Act, the VOCA grants, other such things. Uh, those are the money that's had bipartisan support. Again, we got to make sure they, they are done. Uh, frankly, George, I am very happy you're here. But I think I have a feeling we're going to have a lot of conversations in the next few years. Well, I, I hope that's the case, Senator. I'd be happy to have conversations even if I'm not confirmed, but I uh, certainly prefer them if I am confirmed. <laughs> you're, you're going to be confirmed. I'll, uh, I'll bet my farm in Vermont on that. Never ask anybody to bet that, Senator. <laughs> thank, thank you, Senator Leahy. Senator Sass? 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, congratulations, Judge, on your nomination, and uh, thank you for the time you've spent in this process with those of us who wanted to uh, um, grill you in private before we were here today in public. Um, you're in the process of moving from Article 3 to Article 2. Uh, were, were you confirmed to the bench in 96, 97? 90, 97. Okay. In the 23 years, uh, 24 years since you left uh, an executive role, Obviously, the, the Article II branch has grown in power, and Article I seems to be uh, shriveling in lots of ways. Do you have a theory of why Articles II and III are gaining more power in American life and Article I seemingly is weaker? Well, that, that is, uh, I would say, a cosmic uh, question of our uh, civic life. I, I don't really have an answer to that. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, each uh, branch uh, has uh, enormous powers authorized by the uh, um, uh, Constitution, and it may be, um, if, if this is the case, that uh, the Congress has just not asserted it, uh, itself uh, as it should uh, with respect to protecting its uh, authorities. Uh, I don't have, to be honest, as, uh, I'm not enough of a, a political scientist to know exactly how this balance has changed. I, I'm sure from the Point of view of the Congress, uh, it, its uh, its role has uh, diminished. But you know, sometimes I'm sure the other branches feel the same way. Right. Well, I, I think it's a, a mix of overreach by Article Two and underreach by Article One. So I'm not asking the question in a way to put you on the defensive, as if <clears throat> everything that's wrong is chiefly outside the Congress, because I think we're probably chiefly to blame. But you're going to become the most powerful law enforcement officer in the nation, and obviously you'll have lots of prosecutorial discretion. But could you help us understand what the line is between prosecutorial discretion, which is understandable in any complex organization, and executive unilateralism, which I hope we can agree, at least at the definitional level, is a massive constitutional problem? What's the line? Yeah. So it's not the most <clears throat> easy line to, uh, to, to outline. the. Supreme Court's Cheney case is the best overall description. This, uh, for the entire history of the country, uh, prosecutors have, uh, um, and um, um, uh, government agencies have, dis have had discretion uh, to make decisions about um, how they uh, allocate their resources in terms of uh, enforcement priorities, both criminal and civil. Um, and uh, th th this has either uh, generally uh, been non-reviewable or deferentially reviewable in the courts. Uh, the, the opposite side of the line is that the uh, executive branch can't simply decide we're not going to uh, enforce this law at all. Um, now, where a particular uh, piece of conduct falls uh, between those two is, is, is a difficult uh, uh, thing to, uh, to say, except in an individual case. Well, I mean, obviously, in our tribal politics, it's easy for each party when they're out of power to say that the Article II branch is overreaching. But when you're in power, it turns out those mostly look like discretion. Um, how, how do you think, not just the Supreme Court line of cases, but at the level of, of you being the boss of the AAG for OLC, yeah. for instance, yeah. Yeah. How, how will you determine what actions are beyond the pale? No. Well, I do think that when uh, the department makes con uh, determinations based on uh, resources, uh, on its views about uh, uh, which are the most important uh, matters that it uh, should, um, uh, should go forward with, uh, when it thinks that uh, state and local governments are in a better position uh, to handle those matters, any of those kind of factors are all perfectly appropriate for deciding uh, to, ex uh, to exercise prosecutorial dis uh, discretion. Um, um, uh, 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 but mere disagreement with a law uh, passed by Congress uh, or a, a, a decision that um, um, uh, the department will simply not enforce regardless of uh, resources or other things um, would be uh, impermissible. But again, I think it's very, no matter how hard I try, I can't put this in the perfect words, and I'm sure maybe we'll disagree in the future if I, if I do get this position, but it will be out of a good faith effort on my part uh, to be sure that the executive is only doing what it's supposed to do. I want to move on to another topic, but one, one more finer point on it. Is congressional inaction a legitimate basis for Article Two to decide it just must act because it wishes policy were different and legislation doesn't move, therefore you have a pen and a phone? Uh, can you just act because Congress didn't? 
also, you're asking really uh, tough questions of uh, our basic constitutional structure. Uh, uh, doing so simply uh, out of uh, uh, upset that Congress hasn't done what you want, obviously not okay. Um, but uh, in the formulation that uh, Justice Jackson, who I quoted in my opening, uh, famously gave in the um, Youngstown Steel case, um, the president does have authorities um, um, when uh, uh, he acts uh, consonant with Congress. He's uh, at his highest power. Uh, when uh, Congress uh, um, um, has not acted at all, um, um, he's uh, left with only his uh, own power, uh, which uh, is clearly available under the Constitution, depending on the circumstance uh, that we're talking about. And when he acts in contravention of uh, Congress, uh, he has only the authorities uh, the Constitution gives him, minus uh, uh, the authorities that um, the Congress uh, has. And this is uh, what Jackson famously referred to as the lowest ebb of the executive's authority. So the inaction is in the middle. Um, and, um, you can't do this just because Congress uh, didn't act, but you can, uh, the president can act if it's within his authority and he believes it's something in the public interest. Thanks. I want to switch gears a little bit. I was encouraged earlier when you said um, that the department's purposes uh, are to make sure, include among them, to include to be sure that both the powerful and the powerless are treated treated equally. Um, I want to talk about one case where that obviously hasn't happened, and that's the case of Jeffrey Epstein and his many, many victims of. Uh, D domestic and international sex trafficking. Obviously, he evaded justice for years, and when the department did ultimately uh, partner with local authorities, uh, it allowed charges to be brought that didn't befit the seriousness of his crimes. Um, infuriatingly, um, he was allowed to die by apparent su uh, suicide in federal custody, despite the fact that everybody knew he was a suicide risk and many people would um, benefit from that outcome. And then most recently, his state has failed to pony up uh, to make uh, right on all of their obligations uh, to compensate his victims. Um, what do you think went wrong with the department's handling of the Epstein case? Uh, Senator, so my position as a judge, I'm and also my previous position as a prosecutor, I've always been extremely careful not to comment about uh, something without knowing the facts. Uh, the facts I know about the Epstein matter are the ones I've read in the, me in the media and that I've mm. uh, seen on television, so I, I don't think, I'm just nope. not in the position. We, we can agree that those are disgustingly Absol embarrassing uh, about uh, how weak the department's uh, pursuit of this evil man Ab was. Absolutely, but you asked me the why question and I, I can't answer the, the why question. But on the values question, I can answer. This is just horrendous. Um, and uh, he obviously should have been vigorously uh, prosecuted uh, uh, substantially earlier, but I, I don't know the why. And, and he has co-conspirators who are still um, being held and pursued. And um, as you and I discussed in private, I hope that we will make sure that the department prioritizes resources for this. Uh, scores and scores of the women he victimized um, are just in their 30s now, but they've had so much of their lives stolen from them. Um, and obviously, sex trafficking is a scourge of our time. And I, I really would hope that the department continues to do an after-action review on why we've underinvested there. I've got more questions on the department's China initiative, but my time has expired, so I'll follow up with that separately. I look Thank forward you, to it. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to welcome you to the committee, Thank you. Your Honor, and welcome your family as well, a very supportive and accomplished family, and uh, say that uh, among the qualities that you bring to this job, obviously your brilliance, your service as a judge are tremendously important, but I think the lesson today is that character counts in restoring the integrity and credibility of the leadership of the Department of Justice, I think that the character that you've demonstrated throughout your career are going to be most important. Your resilience, as well as your brilliance, you've been tested by adversity, and the kind of values that you exemplified beginning when I think both of us served as prosecutors in the Department of Justice and first met. So I look forward to your inspiring more young attorneys to join the ranks of law enforcement and 
celebrate the accomplishments of those 115,000 professionals who every day help keep us safe. I welcome your commitment to combating violent extremism. I've supported and I'm introducing a 9-11 Commission bill. But I want to turn to an area of violence that you raised, which is hate crimes, the growing incidence of hate crimes, especially against now certain groups, Asian Americans, I think is extraordinarily alarming. I've introduced a measure called the No Hate Act. Uh, Jabara Higher No Hate Act would reform the penalties, but also increase reporting. As you know, many of these crimes are underreported. I'd like your commitment that you will support such a measure and enforcement of the existing penalties against hate crimes. Well, you couldn't have any opposition from me on, on, in that matter, uh, Senator. Uh, uh, hate crimes uh, tear at the, at the fabric of our society, make uh, uh, our citizens uh, worried about uh, walking on the street and exercising even their most normal rights. Um, and and uh, the, the role of the Civil Rights Division uh, is to prosecute those cases uh, vigorously, and I can assure you uh, that it will if I'm confirmed. Thank you. Uh, on gun violence, you've been asked a few questions by Senator Lee. Three years ago this month, Parkland occurred. Parkland, Sandy Hook, other places like Las Vegas have become shorthand for massacres that are true tragedies and also preventable by common sense steps such as President Biden has supported and I have helped to lead in the Congress. Universal background checks, safe storage measures, Ethan's Law, closing the Charleston loophole, and of course, uh, emergency risk protection orders. Senator Graham and I have worked together on a measure that I'm hoping we will reintroduce. Uh, one of your predecessors, uh, William Barr, said about emergency risk protection orders, quote, this is the single most important thing I think we can do in gun control area to stop these massacres from happening in the first place, end quote. Uh, William Barr and I didn't agree on a lot, but I think I'm of the opinion that it is an important step to take. Uh, would you support these kinds of common sense steps? Yeah, I, d I don't know the specifics of all of them. Uh, uh, certainly uh, with respect to uh, emergency risk orders, um, um, when somebody is uh, acting out in a way that suggests that they're going to use uh, uh, violence against another human being, we have to be very careful that they don't get uh, a weapon in their hands. Um, I don't know the specifics of, of how the legislation would do that, but uh, I, I do think that, yes. Well, I welcome your support to that extent. For I don't mean to be non-supportive, but uh, unless I know the, the specifics, it's very hard for me to, to make a calculation. I, I understand, and you're doing an excellent job of navigating your way through the requests for specific commitments. And by the way, I understand sometimes a non-answer is the right way <laughs> for you to go in this position. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me say, uh, also, I hope you'll consider executive orders. I understand that President Biden may have some under consideration, for example, closing the Charleston loophole, redefining the nature of a firearm to prevent ghost guns from populating the world and uh, other steps. And I hope you will consider using the existing authority through ATF and other agencies to take such, such action. Um, I want to... Um, ask you about uh, two areas that are of importance, I think, although uh, they may not have reached a lot of public visibility. Uh, as you may be aware, the survivors of the 9-11 tragedy have filed a lawsuit pursuant to the Justice Against Sponsors of Terror Act, JASTA. Uh, Senator Cornyn and I were strong advocates of JASTA. 
They have asked for information from the FBI in connection with that lawsuit. They've been denied that information under the state secrets privilege. In my view, there is no justification for failing to provide that information. I hope that you will consider taking prompt action to release it. I know that you can't necessarily address it now, but I wrote to the Department of Justice last week, not to yourself, but to your predecessor, mm -hmm. and I hope that you will take that letter as a matter of priority. When I, if, if I'm lucky enough to be confirmed, I will certainly uh, uh, get the letter and um, I will give it my uh, attention. Yes, I will. And uh, similarly, the Department of Justice Inspector General reportedly opened an investigation in September 2018 of the FBI's potential mishandling of the investigation into Larry Nasser's sexual abuse. I'm sure you recall his prosecution. There was an inspector general report that goes into the FBI's possible delay and uh, malfeasance. Uh, that report is finished, we're told. I hope that it will be published promptly in the interest of the transparency value that you outlined so well. Well, I will definitely consult with the uh, Inspector General, and uh, I do believe in making uh, those reports uh, uh, public to the extent, uh, you know, permissible within the law. Yeah. Thank you. And finally, uh, you may be aware that a number of my former colleagues, Attorneys General, have taken action against Exxon and other oil companies to hold them accountable for misleading and defrauding the public about climate change for decades. Nothing could be so important as the United States Department of Justice similarly taking action against gas and oil companies for lying to the American public about the devastating effects of these products on climate change. I hope you'll consider taking action in that regard. Um, I guess from the way you began, it feels like there's probably pending litigation on this matter already, so it, it, it's something I really uh, should not be co commenting on. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Garland, thank you for being here. Congratulations on your nomination. Thank you, Senator. Since uh, June of last year, the city of St. Louis and my home state of Missouri, the homicide rate is at its highest level since 1970. 11 police officers have been shot, including former police officer David Dorn, who was murdered in cold blood during rioting in the city this past summer in Chicago. Homicides are up 50% in New York, 40%. In LA, 30%. Clearly, our criminal justice system is under renewed and fairly extreme strain. Can you tell me, if you are confirmed as attorney general, what's the first thing you'll do to confront this growing crisis? I'm sorry, at the end, did you ask me what I would do or will I? What will you do? I assume you'll do something. Yeah, what, yeah, what will you do? Yeah. So, uh, look, I am obviously, I've read the statistics myself, um, and I know that there's an upswing in violent crime. I'm very concerned about it. Uh, when, I, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, the number of murders in the district, I joined at a time when the number of murders in the District of Columbia were more than twice the number of murders that they are now. Uh, I spent much of my early, early career on this problem of violent uh, crime, uh, searching for uh, the best possible uh, ways to suppress it, uh, going after violent repeaters uh, being uh, one of the best ways, going after violent gangs uh, that supported uh, violent uh, action being another important way, and putting uh, resources in the places uh, where they're necessary. Uh, again, sitting here uh, and, and therefore uh, only having been an observer of, of, uh, of this from the outside, I don't know uh, what uh, information the department has now. Um, but I, I'm, I was uh, a strong um, uh, supporter and, uh, and, and one of the developers of uh, the Violent Crime Initiative uh, during the time when I was in the Justice Department, and it may well be time for another one. I know that the uh, administration of uh, Attorney General Barr looked at this very closely as well. Uh, so I'd have to look at uh, you know what, what's going on in the department right now and what more needs to be done. But I share your concern. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, in the midst of this, of this mounting crime wave, there has been increasing calls by some activists 
including members of the United States Congress, to defund the police. I have to tell you, I think this sends exactly the wrong message to law enforcement who feel very much overburdened, underpaid, under siege, and also sends the wrong message to folks who are suffering from this violent crime wave, especially working class communities. Uh, tell me what your position is on defunding the police. Do you support this movement? Will you support it as Attorney General? Well, as, as, you, as you no doubt know, um, President Biden has said he does not support uh, uh, defunding the police, and neither do I. Um, um, you know, we saw uh, how, how difficult the lives of police officers were in the uh, body cam um, uh, videos we saw when they were defending uh, the Capitol. Um, I do believe, and, 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 and um, um, President Biden believes in, in, in giving resources to police departments to help them uh, reform and gain the trust of their communities. Um, I do believe, and I believe he does as well, that we do need to put resources into alternative uh, ways of, conf of uh, uh, confronting some actors, particularly those who are mentally ill um, and those who are suicidal. Uh, so, um, so that police officers don't have to do a job that they're not trained for and that, uh, from what I understand, they do not want to do. And so those resources need to go to mental health professionals and other, uh, health profession and other professionals in the community so that uh, the police can do the job that they've trained for um, and, um, and uh, so that confrontations, if possible, uh, do not lead to uh, deaths and violence. So let me ask you about... Uh assaults on uh, federal property in places other than Washington, D.C., Portland, for instance, Seattle. Do you regard assaults on federal courthouses or other federal property as acts of domestic extremism, domestic terrorism? Well, uh, Senator, um, my own definition, which is about the same as the statutory definition, is uh, the use of violence or threats of violence uh, in an attempt to uh, disrupt uh, democratic processes. So an attack on a, uh, a courthouse while in operation, uh, trying to prevent judges from actually deciding cases, that plainly is um, domestic uh, um, uh, extremism, um, 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 uh, domestic uh, terrorism. Um, an attack simply on a government property at night or any other kind of uh, circumstances is a clear crime and a serious one and should be punished. I don't mean, I don't know enough of the, about the facts of the example you're talking about, but that's where I, I draw the line. One, one is both are uh, criminal, um, uh, but one is uh, a core attack on our democratic institutions. Let me ask you about uh, something that it, uh, some progressive groups have recently been saying um, with regard uh, to you. The Progressive Change Campaign Committee, which is a left-wing activist group that does fundraising for Democrat Party causes, is circulating a petition addressed to you that states, and I quote now, Trump and his criminal network of associates must be investigated and prosecuted for law-breaking, end quote. This, of course, against the backdrop judge of groups who are keeping lists of people who worked at the White House, including lists of interns who worked at the White House, trying to prevent them from getting jobs, uh, trying to uh, prevent them uh, from working, whether it's in politics or government or anywhere else. Again, uh, we have seen Senator Cruz, I know, asked you about political targeting. Uh, I have to say I'm, I'm very concerned about the specter of political targeting because it's happened before. It happened in the Obama-Biden administration. It happened, it culminated in the lies told to the FISA court during the last administration with the FBI, and sadly, the Department of Justice signed off on submissions to the FISA court, which, as you know, were falsified, actively falsified, leading to an unprecedented and historic rebuke from that court. My question is, given, given these, this pressure campaign already being mounted toward you, this, this petition that I just quoted is addressed to you personally, if you are confirmed, will you resist the calls and efforts by political groups to politicize the Department of Justice, to use political targeting? Will you adhere to the statute right down the middle and enforce the law fairly and equally? Senator, I've been a judge now for uh, almost 24 years. People on one side or the other of every single case, uh, 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 I think I've done the wrong thing in that case because uh, both sides can't win. Um, I have grown pretty immune uh, to any kind of pressure other than the pressure to do what I think is the right thing uh, given the facts and the law. That is what I intend to do as the Attorney General. I don't care who pressures me in whatever direction. The department, under, if I am confirmed, will be under my protection. 
for the purpose of preventing any kind of partisan or other improper motive in making any kind of investigation or prosecution. That's my vow. That's the only reason I'm willing to do this job. Do you agree that what the Department of Justice and the FBI did in misleading, deliberately misleading a FISA court, submitting false information to a FISA court, submitting falsified information and evidence to a FISA court, drawing the rebuke of that court, do you agree that that was an egregious violation of public trust? I think a false statement to a court is a, is a terrible thing. It is a, in, a, in a many, I, I, don't, I, I was going to say obstruction of justice, and it may well be, but that's, that's a very specific uh, concern. But I can tell you how angry judges get when they learn that somebody uh, who's made an application to them has not told them uh, the complete truth uh, or has uh, spun the truth in any way. And you, you hear those statements by judges uh, all the time, and appropriately so. Very good. Well, I thank you, Judge, and I hope if, if you are confirmed that you will indeed be that guardian to make sure that the rule of law is fairly enforced equally and that it is not used for political purposes. Mr. Chairman, my, I don't, my uh, time counter doesn't work. Do, am I, it, it's my time expired? Yes. It is. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you very, thank you very much, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Senator Hirono, are you within yes. Zoom range? Take it yes, away. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Judge Garland. It's nice to see you again. Thank you. I will start with two preliminary questions that I asked. I ask every nominee who comes before any of the committees on which I sit. And these que two questions are, since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No. Judge Garland, considering that we just had a, a president who did not think the rule of law applied to him, I'm gratified to hear that so many of my Republican colleagues are asking you whether you, as Attorney General, will follow the rule of law. And of course, you will. I want to get to uh, consent decrees, because I don't think that you've been asked about consent decrees yet. And the Justice Department Civil Rights Division has described consent decrees as, I quote, most effective in ensuring accountability, transparency, and flexibility for accomplishing complex institutional reforms, end quote. So despite their effectiveness, however, the Trump administration was openly hostile to consent decrees. In November 2018, Attorney General Jeff Sessions issued a memo that drastically curtailed their use in bringing police departments into compliance with the Constitution. The result was that the Trump administration did not enter into a single new consent decree with any law enforcement agency suspected of systemic abuse of constitutional rights, and they also actively undermined existing consent decrees. All this while excessive force by police in Minneapolis, Louisville, Kenosha, and other cities led to one of the biggest social justice movements this country has ever seen. What is your view, Judge Garland, of the role of pattern and practice investigations and consent decrees in addressing civil rights abuses by police. Look, I, I, thank you for this question, Senator. I, uh, uh, I think police accountability uh, is an essential element of the ability of a police department to have uh, credibility with the community. And without credibility and trust, a police department cannot do its job of ensuring the safety of the community. Um, police officers who uh, violate the Constitution uh, must be held accountable, and police officers who follow the Constitution want police officers who do not to be held accountable for just that reason, because it leads to a taint on all police officers, uh, which would be unfair. Uh, Congress has given um, the uh, Justice Department uh, the authority and the responsibility to uh, uh, investigate patterns or practices of um, uh, law enforcement entities' uh, conduct 
that violate uh, the Constitution and laws of the United States. That's the statutory responsibility of the Justice Department. And so um, it, it is an important tool the Department has uh, for uh, ensuring accountability. The statute further provides that if the Department finds uh, this pattern or practice of unconstitutional conduct, that it can seek equitable remedies uh, from um, the court. And one of the kinds of equitable remedies which has proven effective in the past are consent decrees. Uh, so uh, where uh, they are necessary uh, to assure accountability, um, um, it's very important that we use that tool. Um, that is not the only tool available to um, the Justice Department. Uh, we can use uh, grant making uh, uh, to uh, provide funds for uh, police departments uh, to reform themselves, to make themselves uh, more accountable. We can provide technical assistance. We can provide incentives. Um, all of these are a set of tools, and uh, the Justice Department has been given these tools by the Congress, uh, and it should use all of them. So you emphasize accountability of police departments, and the Justice Department said that consent decrees, which, by the way, are not just one-sided. They are entered into, as I understand it, after much dialogue and discussion uh, with the affected police departments. So they are definitely a tool. By your answer, uh, I, I hope that you plan to re-engage the Justice Department in enforcing and abiding by the existing consent decrees because I noted that the previous administration had undermined the existing consent decrees. Well, I think if there is an existing uh, consent decree, then we are certainly going to uh, require adherence to it, yes. You've been asked a number of questions about uh, the, in my view, the active voter suppression laws that are being, en being enacted, particularly, of course, after the Shelby County decision that got at one of the major provisions of the Voting Rights Act, leaving Section 2, that still gives the Attorney General's office some tools to go after those states that are contemplating um, legislation that, in effect, will result in voter suppression. Are you aware of any evidence of widespread voter fraud in the 2020 presidential election, or for that matter, any other election? Uh, no, Senator. Um, all I know, of course, is uh, uh, what, uh, what I've uh, been able to uh, glean uh, from uh, the public reports of government agencies. The um, um, uh, Department of Homeland Security in the previous administration uh, publicly described the last election as the uh, most secure in American history. Uh, some 60 or more courts um, uh, rejected uh, claims of uh, fraud in the election, some on legal grounds, but many after providing an opportunity uh, for the submission of uh, evidence and rejected the evidence that was submitted as insufficient. Uh, and Attorney General Barr uh, authorized uh, the U.S. attorneys uh, to investigate uh, uh, voter fraud uh, after the election and before certification. Uh, and at the conclusion, uh, he announced uh, that uh, the department had not uh, found evidence uh, uh, sufficiently material of widespread voter fraud to have had an effect on the election. Uh, Thank you, Judge Garland. I am running out of time. I just wanted to reiterate that I heard you in your earlier response that you would work with Congress to determine whether a pre-theorence provision should be reenacted. There's just one more thing that I wanted to note, and that is uh, your acknowledgement that hate crimes against the API community is definitely rising, and that you will do everything you can to make sure that, uh, that there is enforcement of the, of the laws against these kinds of crimes. And I just noted that just a few weeks ago, an 85-year-old man died after he was abruptly attacked while out on a morning walk in San Francisco and in Oakland, a Chinatown in Oakland's Chinatown neighborhood, a man violently shoved and injured a 91-year-old man, a 60-year-old man, and a 55-year-old woman. And each of these cases, the victims were API community members. Thank you. I do have additional questions, so I'm, I'll wait for a round two. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Senator Hirono. Senator Cotton? 
Judge, welcome. Thank you, sir. I want to return to Senator Grassley's questions about the Durham investigation. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Grassley asked you if you would commit specifically to ensure that John Durham had the staff, the resources, and the time that he needed to complete that investigation. You said you uh, didn't have the info yet that you needed to speak to him, but you had no reason to think um, that him staying on was not the correct decision. That's uh, yes. Why can't you commit specifically to saying that he will have the time, staff, and resources he needs to complete his investigation? Well, I, again, it's because I'm sitting here and I don't have any information about uh, what he needs um, in his resources and, how, um, and, and, and the allocation of resources. But my, uh, everything I know uh, sitting here suggests that he should, of course, have those resources. Judge, two years ago, Bill Barr made that exact commitment about the Mueller special counsel. He did not have that information. He had not consulted with the department. He was in the same posture you are. He simply said yes. Why can't you say yes today the way Bill Barr did two years ago? Again, my view about every investigation and every uh, decision I make is I have to know the facts before I can make those kind of decisions. I don't know what, in, what went into his consideration, but for myself, I have to be there and learn what's going on before I can make a decision. But as I said, I have no reason to doubt uh, that the decision to keep him in place and to continue in his investigation was in any way uh, wrong. Was it wrong for Bill Barr to make that commitment two years yeah. ago? Uh, uh, as I said, Senator, I'm, I'm not going to be making judgments about uh, my predecessors. I don't think uh, um, there's any purpose in that for myself. I want you to judge me on my own record and um, of what I do going forward. Was it wrong for Democratic senators on this committee to repeatedly demand that Bill Barr make that commitment two years ago? I think my answer would be the same. Okay, let's turn to the death penalty. You said that you've developed great pause over it, um, and you said that Joe Biden expressed his opposition to the death penalty. Yeah. Did Joe Biden or anyone from his administration, transition, or campaign ask you not to pursue capital punishment in cases against murderers or terrorists? No. Oh. Thank you. Judge, uh, you spoke at the outset, asked to have several other senators about your outstanding work in the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing case, in which you were part of a team that helped to bring to justice a white supremacist mass murderer, Timothy McVeigh. He was sentenced to death. That death penalty has been carried out. Do you regret the fact that Timothy McVeigh received the death penalty and has been executed? Look, uh, uh, I supported, the, as I said in my original uh, um, uh, Senate hearing um, when I became a judge originally, uh, I supported uh, the death penalty at that time for Mr. McVeigh in, in, in that individual case. I don't have uh, any regret, um, but I have developed uh, concerns about the death penalty in the 20-some years since then. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and the sources of my concern are uh, issues of exonerations, of people who have been convicted, of uh, sort of arbitrariness and randomness of its application because of how seldom it's applied and because of its disparate impact on uh, black Americans and uh, members of other communities of color. Those are the things that give me pause. And uh, the, those are things that have given me pause over the last, you know, as I thought about it over the last 20 years. Judge, if you were confirmed as Attorney General and there was another case like Timothy McVeigh's where a white supremacist bombed a federal courthouse killing 168 Americans, including 19 children, and your U.S. attorney sought your approval for the death penalty, would you give him that approval? So I, I think it depends on what the development of the policy is. If the president asks or if we develop a policy of a moratorium, uh, then it would apply across the board. Uh, there's no point in having a policy if you make individual discretionary decisions. So uh, if, that, if that's the policy, then that would be the policy. So, Judge, you said in your opening statement, and in addition to several questions from senators, that you would strictly regulate communications between the White House, that there'd be no partisan influence. So is this a case in which there would be influence from the White House in individual cases? The U.S. Attorney was seeking the death penalty against a white supremacist domestic terrorist? Oh, I understand the question. I'm sorry, maybe I didn't understand before. What, what I'm uh, trying to say here is if there was a policy decision made uh, by the President and announced by the President, he certainly has the authority uh, to direct, and, and uh, nothing inappropriate about it, it's within his authority, uh, to require uh, an across-the-board moratorium. This is not, uh, what I was talking about was not a decision by the President in any particular case or the direction of how any particular case should go forward but of a moratorium which would apply as a policy across the board. Uh, the Supreme Court has held that the death penalty is constitutional, but it is not required. And that's within uh, the discretion of, of the president. 
Before we move on from the Oklahoma City case, let me just commend you again for your work on it and say that I believe Timothy McVeigh deserved the death penalty. Thank you, Senator. Another co case involves Dylan Roof, a white supremacist from South Carolina who went into an African-American church and killed nine African-Americans in a racially motivated terrorist attack. The Obama Department of Justice sought the death penalty against him and received it. Do you believe that was a mistake? I, I, I'm sorry. Do you believe it was a mistake to seek the death penalty against Dylan Roof for so, murdering nine African Americans as they worshiped in church? I know I'm not supposed to be asking you the questions, but I, I have a feeling that this is still a pending matter. Um, and if it is, I can't talk about a particular, uh, particular case. Uh, in, that, in that case, let me ask you the hypothetical idea about... I know, apologize for asking you because I know that's not my role. Let's, let's suppose that another white supremacist walks into yeah. another African-American church yeah. and murders African-Americans worshiping Christ in cold blood. The U.S. Attorney seeks the death penalty against that white supremacist. Would you approve it? Again, I, uh, Senator, I, I think it, it does depend on what policy is adopted going forward. Uh, I would not oppose a policy of the president because it is within his authority to put a, a moratorium on uh, the death penalty in all cases, um, um, and instead uh, to seek uh, mandatory life without po possibility of, uh, of uh, parole, um, without any consideration of the facts of any particular case. Some on the left are calling for President Biden to grant a across-the-board commutation to all federal death row inmates to reduce their sentence to life in prison. Would you recommend to President Biden that he make such an across-the-board commutation? Um, so th this is one of the ones that I would have to think about, um, uh, and which I have not uh, thought about. And I'd have to, uh, you know, consult with the administration on such an across-the-board uh, policy. I, I haven't thought about that. Thank you. I want to turn to racial equity. Um, do you agree that a core concept, Judge, of American law is that the government can't discriminate against a citizen on the basis of their race? Absolutely. Equal justice under the law, written right there on the steps of the, uh, on the and, pediment above the Supreme Court. And not only is it unlawful, it's morally wrong as well. Uh, yes, I think discrimination is morally wrong. Absolutely. You're aware that President Biden has signed an executive order stating that his administration will affirmatively advance racial equity, not racial equality, but racial equity. Yes, and I, I read, uh, read the opening of that executive order, which defines equity as the fair and impartial treatment of uh, every person uh, without regard uh, to their status. Um, and uh, um, including um, uh, the individuals um, uh, who are in, who have uh, been in underserved communities, uh, where uh, they were not accorded that uh, before, but I don't see any any distinction uh, between uh, uh, in in that regard. That's the definition that was included in that executive order that you're talking about. So do you racial equity and racial equality are the same thing? I don't you know. This is a, a word uh, that is defined in the executive order as I, as I just said it. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what else. I can't give you any, any more than, than the way in which the executive order defined the term it was using. Thank you, Judge. Senator Booker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Garland, it's really good to see you sitting before the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, th there, if you don't mind me starting a little bit with philosophy, th there's the, the MICA mandate, uh, which I'm not sure by your expression you know, but it, you, you've heard it before. It's do justice, love mercy. Uh, that mandate I do know. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, walk, and, walk, and walk humbly. It seems like a pretty good mandate for life. Yes. Um, and this idea of justice to me is fundamental to the ideals of a nation founded uh, with a lot of injustice at the time, but the brilliance of the imperfect geniuses of our founders who aspire to create a, a society that, you know, John Lewis and others would have called the more beloved community. And one of my, uh, an activist I've read a lot, a theologian, said, what, is love, what does love look like in public? It looks like justice. And you have, to me, perhaps one of the more important positions uh, on the planet Earth uh, for trying to create a more just society. And the issues of race, and I was really grateful that you in your opening remarks, talked about your agency actually coming about to deal with issues of justice in our nation. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, white supremacist violence, which has been mentioned a lot. But before I get there, I'm actually concerned with something that I consider pernicious and very difficult to root out, 
which is the realities of implicit racial bias that lead to larger systemic racism. Now, I've been kind of stunned that the issue of systemic racism has become something argued over, but if I can just walk you through for a second, um, does our justice system treat people equally in this country at this point? Sadly, and uh, it's plain to me that uh, that is not that it does not. Uh, and I'm going to stop you there. I mean, Brian Stevenson <laughs> says we have a criminal justice system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent, because one's uh, finances make a difference often with what kind of justice one gets. Is that correct? Senator, there's no que question that there's disparate treatment um, in, in our uh, justice system. Mass incarceration is a very good example of, of, of this problem. You know, we're incarcerating 25%, uh, 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 almost 25% of the world's population, and, and we have uh, you know, something like 5% of the world's population. I don't think uh, that uh, that is because Americans are worse. Uh, but what uh, well, underlies that is the uh, disparate treatment of uh, blacks and uh, communities of color. Well, let's drill down on that for a second. Yeah. So one of the big things driving arrests in our country, stunningly to me, even that is still the case, is marijuana arrests. We had in 2019 more marijuana arrests for possession than all violent crime arrests combined. Now, when you, when you break out that data and disaggregate along uh, racial lines, it is shocking that an African-American has no difference in usage or selling than someone who's white in America, but their likelihood of being arrested for doing things that two of the last four presidents admitted to doing uh, is three to four times higher than somebody white. Is that evidence that within the system there is implicit racial bias, yes or no, sir? Well, it's definitely uh, uh, evidence of a disparate uh, treatment in the system, which I think does arise out of implicit bias. Unconscious bias, maybe, sometimes conscious bias. And, and I think that's the fair point. Unconscious or conscious, nonetheless, it results in a system. Yep. And I've had great conversations with people on both sides of the aisle, heads of think tanks that all speak to this as abhorrent to American ideals, that we still have a system that so disparately treats people at every, every point. The station house adjustment, which I know you know what that is, which I've seen happen as a mayor, that people get called in for, arrested for possession of marijuana, and the police make a decision like, just you know, leave and your parents come or whatever, and it's dismissed with. We see from station house adjustments to charging, uh, to, to bail, to sentencing, every objective analysis has shown that race right now in our country is still playing a specific uh, 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 influence in the justice that someone gets. You're aware of all of this, yes? I am, and this is a particular part of the reason why at this moment I think uh, I wanted to be the Attorney General. Right. I want to point, do the best the, I can to well, stop this. I want to get to that. To the point that a lot of my folks are making, you just made, it does not mean that the people who are engaged in this are racist overtly. It means that they have an implicit racial bias that often leads them to make different decisions about different people. That's correct. Yes, and also, uh, you you know, the, for exa the marijuana example is a perfect example that you've given here. Here's a nonviolent crime that, uh, with respect to usage that does not require us to incarcerate people. And then we're incarcerating at uh, different rates, uh, significantly different rates uh, uh, compare of the different communities. And that is uh, wrong, and it's, it, it, it's the kind of uh, problem that will then uh, follow a person for the rest of their lives. It will make it impossible to get a job. It will, it will lead to a downward ec economic spiral for their family. Right. And so, and so to that point, and now to your, to your point I cut you off on before, now I would like to give you a chance to answer to that. Here you were in an agency that was formed to deal with the kind of systemic racism that was going on at that time. When, when you have disparate in use of the law, where you see African Americans being churned into the criminal justice system, where it is concentrated in certain communities and not in others, where it has, as the American Bar Association says, 40,000 collateral consequences on the lives of those African Americans, where they can't get loans from banks, they can't get uh, um, uh, uh, jobs, they can't get certain business licenses, where it is so dramatic that, that there are estimates that it costs literally to African Americans in the, perpet in the persistence of a wealth gap in our country, where black families have one-tenth the wealth of white families, if you just look at the impact of the law and the, and the disparate impact on just marijuana, it is estimated to cost African-American communities in this country billions of dollars more. 
my question to you now is, assuming this position where you are called upon for that MICA mandate, what are you going to do about this outrageous injustice that persists and infects our society with such a toll on black and brown communities? Right. So there are many, many things that the Justice Department has to do in, in this regard, and I completely agree that uh, the uh, disparate results with respect to wealth accumulation, dis uh, discrimination in employment, discrimination in housing, discrimination in health care availability, all of which we all see now in the, in the consequences of a pandemic which affects communities of color enormously more with respect to infection rates, with respect to hospitalization, uh, and ultimately to death. So what, one set of things we can do is the mass incarceration example that I, that I, that I began with. We can um, uh, focus our attention on violent crimes and other crimes that uh, 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 put great danger in our society and not allocate our resources to something like uh, marijuana possession. Um, uh, we can look at our charging policies and go uh, and, and stop charging uh, the highest possible offense with the highest possible sentence. I, I was taught in law school never to in, uh, interrupt a judge uh, of your <laughs> I don't court. think it so Forgive here. me. <laughs> I would like to end with this uh, question, and then my time is, is up. Yeah. Um, you've talked to me a lot about your thoughts about this, and I've been re really inspired. But it gets back to me, to your conviction in this issue and your determination. Uh, to go down at a time when our nation needs this, um, uh, to go down as one of the great uh, uh, um, leaders when it comes to dealing with the daily unconscionable injustices faced by some Americans and not others at the hands of law enforcement. And I think that one thing you said to me privately particularly motivated me to believe you when you talk about your aspirations. And I'm wondering if you could just conclude by talking, telling, answering me the question, about your motivation and maybe some of your own family history in confronting hate and discrimination uh, in, in, in American history? Uh, yes, Senator. So, uh, you know, I come from a family where my grandparents fled anti-Semitism and persecution. The country took us in. and uh, protected us. And I feel an obligation to the country to pay back. And this is the highest, best use of my own set of skills to pay back. And so I want very much to be the kind of attor attorney general that you're saying I could become. Um, and I'll do my best to try to be that kind of attorney general. I believe your heart, and I'm grateful uh, that you are living that Micah mandate. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Booker. Um, I'm going to make a motion to introduce record uh, into the record letters of support for Judge Garland's nomination. There are 25 different categories of letters of support. I'm struck immediately by the diversity of support that you have. 150 former attorneys general and top Department of Justice officials, Alberta Gonzalez, Michael Mukasey, Eric Holder, Loretta Lynch, the list goes on and on. Dozens of former federal judges, former state attorneys general. For you to have both the National Sheriff's Association, the Fraternal, Fraternal Order of Police, and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights is uh, an amazing political achievement. And the list goes on. Advocates for crime victims and, and survivors, former FBI Director Louis Free, Senator Lee mentioned the Levy children and Green children. They both have written letters of support for you. Uh, I wanted to take a moment in light of your closing statement from this round uh, to tell you that uh, your work and your life has been recognized across the board. This array of letters of support speaks to fairness and honesty in the way that you've dealt with your legal profession and your public service. So without objection, I'll introduce these letters of support for your nomination into the record. And now we're going to take a lunch break. And I'm going to declare 
I guess I have the power to do that now, that we will return at 1.40, and the first person up will be from the sovereign state of Louisiana, John Kennedy. And we'll all anxiously await his contribution. So let's stand in recess. Thank you. The Senate Judiciary Committee breaking for lunch in this confirmation hearing of Merrick Garland to be Attorney General, leaving on an emotional moment as Merrick Garland talked about his own family history as well as what he hopes to accomplish as Attorney General. This is a special report from the newsroom of The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey and I'm joined right now by Rhonda Colvin, congressional reporter who's live on Capitol Hill. So Rhonda, take us through the day so far. Uh, what are the emerging themes in this confirmation hearing? Well, uh, mainly one of the emerging themes is the Democrats want to present him as uh, a nominee who's well qualified for the job, overqualified by some standards. And uh, he is taking this time to discuss what his background is and how that will apply to uh, resetting the, uh, the FBI and the DOJ after the Trump administration. Um, the, it did end on a, a very emotional note where he discussed his family history. And that also points to something that his colleagues have said about him and this nomination is that he has a, a lot of humanity for someone who uh, is a judge and has spent so much time uh, in the law as his career that he he also has a, a lot of humanity and he that was a, a lot of that was seen during his time overseeing the Oklahoma City bombing uh, investigation that a lot of people saw his humanity in that his care uh, for the uh, the victims and, and the children especially who died in that so uh, this second portion that we've just seen is sort of highlighting that but we've also seen a, a little bit of partisanship as uh, is often expected in these hearings we heard from uh, some of those who are considered presidential hopefuls in the, the next uh, presidential run, including uh, Senator Cruz, Senator Sass, uh, Senator Cotton. Uh, Senator Cotton, uh, that was uh, very uh, an interesting line of questioning. He sort of pressed Merrick Garland about his stance on the death penalty, and we know the death penalty is often a wedge issue. Uh, but also with uh, Senator Cotton, he brought up uh, white supremacy a lot, saying, would you stand for the death penalty for Dylan Roof, who uh, was the killer of African Americans who were worshiping in their church? Or if that situation ever happened again, would you set, would you uh, want to use the death penalty? And uh, Merrick Garland isn't really giving um, a, a clear stance on the death penalty other than saying that he has uh, really taken pause with it. He, uh, of course, supported it when uh, Timothy McVeigh, the architect of the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, was uh, prosecuted and charged and later killed uh, through the death penalty. But um, he, he's not saying that that's going to be an issue that he is, is going to adhere to uh, when he is over the DOJ. And he's also mentioned that uh, President Biden is not for the death penalty. So it, it will be interesting if uh, Merrick Garland is confirmed and, and we get a better sense of what might happen to the death penalty. This could be the administration uh, that, that ends that practice. So we, we have been hearing um, a little bit about his insight on that as well as other issues, guns, uh, the uh, idea of consent decrees, that was something that Maisie Hirono brought up. That's also important because if there is a criticism about Merrick Garland, one of the things has been his record on um, criminal justice reform and how that impacts black and brown communities. So uh, I know that was something that I had expected Senator Booker to push him on, which he did, uh, and other Democrats as well might try to get him more on the record about that because that, that is an area of law that we haven't seen uh, where he stands out on. And, and uh, the ACLU actually wrote a letter to this committee and to Mayor Garland asking him to take more of a firm stance on those social uh, injustice issues uh, like criminal uh, justice reform and policing reform. Um, so that, that is one area that did stand out to me because he has a very long career. Uh, we've heard a lot about how he might handle domestic terrorism, but it's that um, the issues of policing reform that are still uh, have a lot of uh, opponents for policing and reform interested to hear how he'll handle that. Well, one issue that came up in today's hearing, as Rhonda told us about, was the death penalty. So let's listen to that exchange. Uh, this is Senator Tom Cotton talking with Merrick Garland, who described his evolving belief on capital punishment. When I became a judge originally, uh, I supported uh, the death penalty at that time for Mr. McVeigh in, in, in that individual case. I don't have uh, any regret um, 
but I have developed uh, concerns about the death penalty in the 20-some years since then. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and the sources of my concern are uh, issues of exonerations, of people who have been convicted, of uh, sort of arbitrariness and randomness of its application because of how seldom it's applied and because of its disparate impact on uh, black Americans and uh, members of other communities of color. Those are the things that give me pause. And uh, those are things that have given me pause over the last, you know, as I thought about it over the last 20 years. That's Merrick Garland uh, speaking today. Uh, Rhonda Colvin, so fascinating because he, he does come at this with the background and experience and weight of overseeing the Oklahoma City bombing case. So as Senator Tom Cotton asks him questions about the death penalty, he's not asking someone who has no experience in this. And, you know, it was fascinating to kind of try to watch Senator Cotton push him and try to get him on the record in ways that could be difficult later when the man that he was talking to is the one who could probably write the book on a decision about whether you pursue the death penalty uh, for someone accused of heinous crimes, Rhonda. That's right, and uh, for those who are supporting Mayor Garland's confirmation, they are saying that uh, that part of his resume, overseeing that uh, that bombing, is really made him the, the man for the moment uh, to lead the DOJ right now when one of the top domestic concerns is uh, the threat of fringe and extremist groups. So that's something that uh, you're seeing both sides of the aisle question him on because it does apply and there are parallels to what we're experiencing now. It's also interesting too, that uh, Senator Cotton uh, brought up that uh, the issue of white supremacy and kept saying, would you support it if uh, there is a person who may shoot up an African-American church in the future? He kept saying that over and over again. And when you think about Tom Cotton being a potential presidential hopeful, you know, you're left to wonder, is he trying to recast himself uh, and using this opportunity? Because uh, very recently, Tom Cotton has uh, been under fire some, for some very uh, racist comments or comments that have been deemed racist. He once said that slavery was a, a necessary evil and was certainly under criticism for that. So for the fact that he uh, decided to use his question time to uh, devote to uh, the idea that white supremacy is a major threat right now to the country, uh, that, that was very interesting. And I, and I started to think about uh, the fact that he is one of the people on this committee who is looking uh, to a presidential run uh, in the next cycle. Well, joining Rhonda Colvin, of course, who's our congressional correspondent now, and Marimo, reporter covering legal affairs, and also Eugene Scott, reporter for The Fix, joining us. Uh, thank you to all three of you for being here. Eugene, let's kick this over to you. You know, it's interesting to hear Rhonda's analysis. I mean, to me, it seemed like Tom Cotton was just trying to put uh, Merrick Garland in a difficult spot, right? You know, try to really pin him down in a way that would be difficult because of course no one wants to be seen in any way being soft on white supremacy um, or any reasonable person and when Tom Cotton set it up that way it was like trying to force Garland a little bit into really definitively coming out for the death penalty like to find that margin of where Merrick Garland's border was of death penalty possible death penalty not possible um, what was your read of that well, we know that Republicans like Tom Cotton are tough on crime and specifically tough on violent crime and do not um, join the cries that we're hearing uh, across the country increase calling for the repeal of the death penalty. Uh, and this is something that we saw uh, the former president tap into quite a bit by highlighting examples of individuals on the death penalty who uh, perhaps were uh, guilty or suspected of being involved in like extremely violent acts. Uh, but one of the things that people like Garland and those left of Cotton are uh, draw, seeking to draw uh, increased attention to is just how disproportionately uh, the death penalty is applied to people of color and people from uh, low-income families. And uh, that right there is an example of the lack of justice when it comes to uh, how the criminal justice system is applied across uh, different groups in this country that Garland has repeatedly suggested that he wants to uh, fight and combat. And this is something that we probably could see or expect to see a lot more um, attention being paid to if his nomination goes through uh, and he is put in uh, positions of power to influence how uh, we as a country respond to issues of race and class uh, and criminal justice. Yeah, you know, Eugene, in Senator Cotton setting it up that way, right, uh, a white suspect 
potentially black victims. It, it almost tried to get around or obfuscate what uh, Judge Garland had been talking about, which was inequality in sentencing, um, the, the, the system being seen as penalizing to African Americans, to people of color, and Judge Garland saying he's had this evaluation of just how, in his mind, unequal and unfair that process is ultimately to Americans. Absolutely, and this is something that more and more people are beginning to see themselves. You know, as we um, have videos of uh, law enforcement interacting negatively with uh, black men and Latino men and black and Latino women in ways that we just don't see uh, law enforcement interacting with white people, uh, the public's consciousness and awareness of uh, unjust uh, responses, be they in the courtroom or just be there immediately in the streets, are being applied to people of color in ways that need to be addressed. And uh, we saw in the previous administration a complete rollback from the Justice Department uh, looking into these things and trying to police police departments on this issue. Um, and that's something that Biden campaigned on changing uh, if he was elected. And uh, nominating Merrick Garland seems to be the next step in the conclusion of uh, in his desire to get a conclusion to these types of um, problems that have been plaguing so many communities of color for so long and uh, don't always seem to be moving forward and making the changes that people are asking and requesting that be be made. Mm. Let's bring Ann Marimo into the conversation. Ann, uh, you told us before the hearing began that um, that Merrick Garland's experience overseeing the Oklahoma City uh, bomber trial um, was something that would be relevant and present and important to Judge Garland as well as to the senators in this room. How have, has it been coming up? How has he been talking about it? How have the senators um, you know, been thinking about it in terms of what kind of attorney general he might be? Yeah, I think the first thing um, that I was struck by is just the tone of the hearing itself. Um, after watching some of the hearings on the same committee for various Supreme Court uh, justice nominees, it's just much friendlier um, and seemingly more bipartisan. You have uh, Republican senators saying that they're likely going to support him. Um, and yes, they do keep coming back to this experience he's had as a prosecutor uh, with the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, I think he was asked about whether or not in the January 6th attack, um, that they would follow leads, not just of the people who were in the Capitol that day, but also the people behind um, the attack who organized it and funded it. And Garland talked about his experience as a prosecutor um, following the leads wherever they go and, and to the very top. Um, and then again, you saw him being asked about uh, the death penalty for Timothy McVeigh. I, I thought that was probably one of the newsier moments of the hearing. It, he did seem to say uh, that Biden was likely to reinstate this moratorium on the death penalty and that that was the, if that's the policy of the administration, then his DOJ would carry that out. Mm. And, you know, you talk about how different this tone was um, from some of the very contentious hearings that we've watched. And one moment really stood out to me when Senator Ted Cruz um, opened his questioning and discussion time by praising Judge Garland, talking about his two plus decades on the court, building a reputation for integrity, setting aside partisan interests. It almost sounded like he was talking to someone who could make a good Supreme Court justice. Um, but of course, that's something that Ted Cruz and the rest of the senators uh, did not even allow to that process to unfold five years ago. Right. It is ironic um, to see him there now and getting so much praise from both sides of the aisle um, for this role as attorney general. Um, you do see Republicans, though, they're not criticizing Garland, but using this as an opportunity to go um, back to past criticisms of the Obama administration, of Eric Holder. Um, I thought one of the funnier questions um, for Judge Garland was whether or not he would be a wingman for Biden, the way that Holder described himself um, for Obama. And he clearly stated, no, that was not his role, um, that he's the people's attorney, not the president attorney. Well, one of the most emotional and powerful moments of today's hearing came when Senator Cory Booker asked Merrick Garland about his personal motivation to combat hate crimes as attorney general. Watch Merrick Garland's response. You know, I come from a family where my grandparents fled anti-Semitism and persecution. The country took us in. and uh, protected us. 
And I feel an obligation to the country to pay back. And this is the highest, best use of my own set of skills to pay back. And so I want very much to be the kind of attorney, attorney general that you're saying I could become. Um, and I'll do my best to try and be that kind of attorney general. Merrick Garland speaking to Senator Booker. And um, reflect on us what this moment means for Judge Garland. Yeah, as you've seen with him before, um, when he was nominated to the Supreme Court and the Rose Garden family means everything to him. Um, and so he and, and Senator Booker were talking about um, how the law can be disparately ap applied to different people because of their race. Um, and that spoke to him um, because of the religious prosecution persecution that his um, Jewish ancestors faced um, when they, they left Eastern Europe and came to America. Um, so again, it's this sort of deeply personal, emotional level um, that he feels this responsibility to continue his work in public service, and this capstone to his long career. Rhonda Colvin, um, lay out for us sort of what happens from here after this lunch break wraps up. Um, what do we expect uh, from the senators yet to ask questions today and what comes next? Right, so after this lunch break, we only have about, I think, five senators left to do the, the first round of questioning. We're still in the first round of questioning, and so they each get eight minutes. And then if there are any follow-up questions, they go back through and each have five minutes then to ask those questions. And from uh, the appearances of what we've just seen, it doesn't look like there may be many follow-up questions. I think a few of them have said they'll, they'll save some time for other questions later. Uh, but this is showing that this is a pretty straightforward confirmation hearing. It's moving fairly quickly and after today's process tomorrow this committee will meet again uh, Merrick Garland will not be here but instead they will have uh, listened to character witnesses who will discuss um, his abilities to do this job and then a week from today this committee plans to vote on his confirmation and send it to the Senate floor for that full Senate vote so that's what's ahead of us in in this but um, just like Ann said this the tone of this confirmation hearing is, is really in stark contrast to what we usually expect from the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, I'm sure there are there are more contentious hearings to come at some point, but this in particular is fairly different um, and, and fairly more quiet than we usually expect from this committee. And I, I do know that both uh, Dick Durbin as well as Chuck Grassley, who is the top Republican on the committee, uh, have both said that they wanted to make sure that this was a quick process because of all the things that are facing the DOJ, somebody needs to be at the helm. So they, they both have made commitments from both of their Side to get this through committee in an expedited fashion. Mm. Uh, Eugene, the only two Democrats left to ask questions at this point are both freshmen. Senator Padilla of California, Senator Ossoff of Georgia. I'll certainly be interested in hearing them in this sort of very public and important moment of, uh, of, of Q&A. What will you be listening for and watching for from them? And these are two history-making uh, lawmakers, as you already know. Uh, the senator from California is the first uh, Latino elected from the state, and uh, Senator Ossoff is the first Jewish uh, member uh, from his state sent to uh, the Senate. And both of them have made uh, issues related to anti-Semitism and discrimination based on ethnicity and xenophobia uh, parts of their uh, desires to find justice in Washington for the people that they represent. And I think we can expect them to figure out ways to make those issues more broad, broadly applied to the American population and finding ways that the Justice Department can combat those. Uh, these are topics that, you know, have become dominant in the last year or so, uh, considering everything uh, that was experienced and uh, advocated for in the previous administration. And we're going to see lawmakers from the opposing party of the previous president try to get the current uh, individuals in positions of power and government uh, to move the country in a different direction. And I think we're going to see these two lawmakers uh, begin to show how they uh, would like that to be happening uh, in the next uh, set round of questionings after the break. Mm. Um, uh, Rhonda Colvin, I want to bring you back to talk about uh, Senator Maisie Hirono's line of questioning, just in case people were wondering, why is she asking about sexual assault and, uh, and past behavior? Um, explain to us what Senator Hirono's practice is at these hearings. 
That's right. Senator Hirono is known for asking those exact questions verbatim every time there is a confirmation hearing. She will ask the nominee about any history of uh, sexual assault. Um, uh, and this usually gets the answer that you just saw from Merrick Garland, uh, that he does not have a, a history of anything like that or related. However, this was really important during the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing because she did ask that. And I believe she asked it before we were aware of uh, the allegations facing him um, from Dr. Blasey Ford. So uh, it's an important question that she feels uh, is very uh, relevant to anybody who is uh, seeking a judicial uh, nomination and uh, or confirmation and she brings it up every time so that is important to note that if this is your first uh, Senate Judiciary hearing and you thought that that was sort of a an odd question it's something that uh, Maisie Hirono has said that she is committed uh, to asking anybody uh, who is seeking confirmation and then after that she uh, brought it around to consent decrees she talked about how uh, with the Sessions DOJ Jeff Sessions when he led the DOJ that was an issue uh, that the Trump administration did not want to use that tool that the government has to oversee any local police departments that have uh, practices of misconduct or abuse. And so she wanted to get him on the record on that area. And that, of course, goes again with that vein and that line of questioning I, I talked about earlier is that some Democratic senators want to make sure that they hear from him on his views of uh, so social justice and uh, criminal uh, issue reforms, um, something that he is record hasn't really been very clear on. Mm. Well, one of the jobs of the attorney general is overseeing that laws are fairly enforced, making sure of that. So watch this exchange with Senator Josh Hawley asking about the police. In the midst of this, of this mounting crime wave, there has been increasing calls by some activists, including members of the United States Congress, to defund the police. I have to tell you, I think this sends exactly the wrong message to law enforcement who feel very much overburdened, underpaid, under siege, and also sends the wrong message to folks who are suffering from this violent crime wave, especially working class communities. Uh, tell me what your position is on defunding the police. Do you support this movement? Will you support it as Attorney General? Well, as, as, you, as you no doubt know, um, President Biden has said he does not support uh, uh, defunding the police, and neither do I. Um, um, you know, we saw uh, how, how difficult the lives of police officers were in the uh, body cam um, uh, videos we saw when they were defending uh, the Capitol. Um, I do believe, and, 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 and um, um, President Biden believes in, in giving resources to police departments to help them uh, reform and gain the trust of their communities. Um, I do believe, and I believe he does as well, that we do need to put resources into alternative uh, ways of, conf of uh, uh, confronting some actors, particularly those who are mentally ill um, and those who are suicidal. Uh, so, um, so that police officers don't have to do a job that they're not trained for and that, uh, from what I understand, they do not want to do. Let's go to Eugene Scott for more on that exchange. Eugene, uh, what stands out to you, both in terms of uh, how the senator phrased his question as well as how Merrick Garland answered it? Well, first, I think we're, when we're talking about Garland, it was just a reminder uh, that he stated the facts. I think very often uh, Republican lawmakers like Hawley want to associate defund the police uh, with uh, President Biden, and you just can't because Biden has been very clear that this is not a movement that he supports, and he's been unequivocal and unequivocal in, in trying to communicate that uh, in ways that uh, it seems like Republican lawmakers just are not um, taking and, and keeping in mind, but it's not keeping them from going forward with trying to associate him with this very controversial uh, movement. We also see uh, that Garland has just made it very clear that he does support uh, law enforcement and wants law enforcement to have the resources that they need to keep communities safe. But that is strictly different from abusing communities in the ways that uh, have been so controversial to so many people who have uh, protested in streets in the past uh, year, asking for more accountability for law enforcement over people of color. Mm. And Marimo, you know, I, I, it's so um, essential how Eugene talked about sort of Merrick Garland just stating a position, stating uh, the situation, because he makes such an important point, Eugene does, about the efforts to politicize this, really. Um, so what do we know about Merrick Garland's relationship with police and law enforcement generally? 
Yeah, we don't know a ton of, on a policy level, um, but we do know from his rulings on uh, about 24 years on the bench that uh, he did tend to side with law enforcement um, when it came to cases uh, involving criminal defendants. Um, so typically um, he, he would side with the government and law enforcement and, and not criminal defendants. But I did hear him in his exchange with Senator Booker today seeming to open the door um, for changing policies. He said we should be concentrating on violent crimes, um, not crimes like marijuana, uh, low level crimes. He also talked about um, giving prosecutors discretion um, to not charge the highest possible sentence. So I could see the department going back to some of the previous policies from the Obama administration um, when it comes to charging crimes and uh, giving prosecutors discretion. Mm. Um, Eugene Scott, before we let you go, um, what else is standing out to you that's important in terms of uh, markers or a roadmap of what kind of attorney general Merrick Garland might be? Well, it you know, it, it sounds a bit obvious, but when I was watching him, the first thing that came to my mind is that Merrick Garland is very different from Bill Barr. And I think that's going to be very clear and evident uh, if he if becomes attorney general in terms of how he engages uh, the president, uh, how he pushes back, how he puts his own agenda to the side when uh, confronted with facts that, uh, you know, prove that what he believes to be true actually perhaps is not true. And just the idea that he is uh, going to be in position to defend and protect uh, the American public and not be, you know, uh, as we said earlier, a wingman for the president. And I think that's going to be, uh, you know, a refreshing uh, response to what we previously saw, uh, you know, in the past four years, but also a reminder to people who perhaps are less familiar with the responsibilities of the head of the Justice Department. Um, in this moment, they will have the opportunity perhaps to see what the job could be and perhaps should be when you operate more independently from uh, the commander in chief than we have previously seen. All right, Eugene Scott, thank you so much. Let's go back to Ann Marimo. Ann, uh, coming off of what Eugene just said, um, you know, what is the motivation? This may sound like an obvious question, but why are they working so hard? Uh, President Biden, as well as this nominee, Merrick Garland, why are they working so hard to try to return to quote unquote norms or trying to show that there will be this uh, autonomy uh, on behalf of the Justice Department. Uh, you know, what are they both hoping to communicate, but frankly, why? Because, you know, President Trump totally changed uh, the game and changed the way business was conducted. Right. I think there was a lot of criticism um, from people inside the Department of Justice and who had previously worked for the Justice Department uh, about the president's involvement in decisions. As we mentioned before, uh, the president's friend, Roger Stone, his former uh, national security advisor, Michael Flynn. Um, so the Biden administration wants to separate itself and make clear that this Justice Department is going to be independent. Um, I, one of the moments that struck me was uh, when Judge Garland talked about being a judge uh, for the last two dozen years and always upsetting someone, one side or the other, with his opinions and how the only pressure he feels is to get things right and to follow the law. Um, and again, I think that was making that point about the need for the Justice Department to be independent and why he's the right person to take over at this particular moment. Hmm. Well, Senator Amy Klobuchar, Democrat, asked Merrick Garland about the message he would deliver if confirmed what message would he deliver to the Justice Department on his very first day? You will take on the Department of Justice at a critical time and will have the great task of restoring its ideals of independence and fidelity to the Constitution and to the law. Uh, what is the number one thing you want to do to boost morale um, in the Department of Justice on day one? Well, on day one, I'm hopefully, if I'm confirmed, I will take an oath in which I say all the things that you just said. <laughs> I want to make clear to the uh, career uh, uh, prosecutors, the career lawyers, the career employees, the career agents of the department, that my job uh, is to protect them from partisan uh, or other improper motives. Merrick Garland speaking today. Uh, Rhonda Colvin, let's go back to you on Capitol Hill for um, how Merrick Garland's responses seem to be satisfying or not satisfying senators. 
You know, they really seem to be satisfying, these senators, because I'm noticing, and this is not always the trend, but they will ask questions and then just say that they, they are finished and they support his uh, confirmation. And that's not usual uh, when you do have these high-profile confirmation hearings. So it seems like the senators have come with the questions that they feel are the most important, that they want to get him on the record on, or whether they also want to sort of use this as a stage for their own ambitions. But altogether, they seem to want to go straight forward with this. And there doesn't seem to be any sort of major opposition to him. We knew that going into the day that he has had such widespread report. And toward the end of this last period, uh, Dick Durbin did talk about all the letters of support that uh, Merrick Garland has received and the committee has received on his behalf. They've come from off the Hill with uh, attorney generals from both the uh, George W. Bush administration as well as the Obama administration and as well as his colleagues and former colleagues at the uh, DOJ who uh, speak very highly of him. So it seems as if this is the one confirmation where you aren't seeing a, a lot of um, rockiness uh, when you do compare it to past attorney general confirmation hearings and also to, I believe it was Eugene's point, that uh, he is appearing to be a very different uh, DOJ leader than uh, William Barr and, of course, also Jeff Sessions. And I remember covering both of those uh, confirmation hearings, and, and they were, they almost seemed contentious before they even began. And the, the main issues for both of those hearings uh, was the Russia investigation. And uh, both of those candidates who were seeking confirmation, um, there was a little bit more of defensiveness when uh, Democrats would pose questions. And, and that's somewhat what we are used to seeing in confirmation hearings, but we're, we're just not seeing that. Uh, today. It seems as if these senators uh, do want to keep to their word that they've been saying in the, in the days ahead of this and, and want this expedited so that they, they can move forward with this particular nomination. Now, of course, uh, there's the, the other nomination that's been talked about uh, today and over the weekend, and that's Neera Tandon, uh, who would be the uh, director of OMB. Uh, while uh, our show began, we also found out that Senator Romney has said that he will not vote uh, to confirm her. So that confirmation is definitely in jeopardy right now. And that's certainly in contrast to what we're seeing here in the Judiciary Committee, where it seems both sides uh, want to see this one through. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Let's go now to Joyce Coe, who's been following that very story, tracking President Biden's nomination. So let's talk big picture as well as the hot stories of the day, Joyce. How's everything shaping up? Yes, yeah, so Libby, as the uh, confirmation process for Merrick Garland is underway, there is uh, an increasing um, controversial uh, uh, OMB pick that President Biden had nominated um, to be in this role, uh, but she is sort of picking up a lot of um, con controversy, as uh, Rhonda was mentioning. Neera Tandon uh, picked to lead the OMB, and she... Um, has fired off tweets in the past several years that have become sort of the center of this controversy. Uh, and it's giving senators a reason to say that they are going to be voting no on her confirmation. We first saw um, Democrat Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia coming out and saying that he was going to be voting no on her. He uh, sent out a statement saying that um, her overtly partisan statements have uh, a, toxic, a toxic and detrimental impact on the important working relationship between Congress and the members of the OMB. Um, and uh, just this morning, we saw Susan Collins of Maine come out and say that she was also going to be voting no uh, because she says that Tandon has neither the experience nor the temperament to lead this critical agency. Uh, and just recently, as Rhonda was mentioning, uh, we saw during this confirmation hearing of Merrick Garland, uh, Senator Romney coming out and saying that he would also vote no. Uh, and from his spokesperson, we heard that, he, um, quote, it's hard to return to uh, respect with a nominee who has issued a thousand mean tweets. Now, uh, Tannen was asked about those tweets during her confirmation hearing, and she apologized for those, but clearly it's not slowing down uh, sort of the noise around what she has tweeted uh, about uh, Senator Bernie Sanders over the income that he made over his book. She also tweeted uh, about Mitch McConnell calling him Voldemort, uh, tweeted about Susan Collins calling her the worst. Um, so these mean tweets are sort of being referenced within um, the Republicans and one Democrat who is saying that they are going to be voting no against her. Uh, I just listened to the um, press secretary, the White House press secretary, give her a press briefing today uh, just moments ago, and she was asked about this nomination. And really, the Biden administration is defending Neera Tandon, saying that she is 
perfectly qualified to be in this role leading the OMB. Uh, Jen Psaki saying that she is, quote, an accomplished policy expert. Uh, she would also be the first Asian American to lead this agency. Uh, and Psaki also echoing uh, some statements that she made in a tweet earlier today saying that Tandon has not just the professional experience, but she also has the lived experience having grown up uh, as a child of a single mother who has benefited from the federal programs that she would be overseeing as the uh, OMB director. So that is the response from the White House. And of course, Biden was also asked about uh, whether he would be pulling his nomination. And they, uh, he said no to that. And Jen Psaki today echoing that uh, they will not be pulling the nomination. And they think, Libby, that they have the votes to go forward. Mm, thanks so much, Joyce Co. Rhonda Colvin, let's go back to you um, from what we heard from Joyce. You know, some Democrats are saying that Republicans are giving a tougher time to uh, women of color, people of color who are nominees in this process. Um, but you know, it is interesting to see who's coming out when, right? To have Manchin come out first, then Susan Collins, then Romney. Um, the numbers are getting a lot tougher for the Biden team to get Tandon through. That's right, and it's really showing the strength of those moderates. When um, Joe Manchin came out on Friday saying he was not going to support uh, this nomination, and he, and he gave his reasons uh, saying that uh, her rhetoric on Twitter against his Republican colleagues has been so divisive, um, that, that was sort of a watershed moment, it appears. Now you have these others coming forward and kind of showing their weight, that these uh, four uh, members right now do have some weight when it comes to really tight votes and tight decisions in the Senate. Uh, this is a 50-50 Senate power structure right now, so any vote needs, uh, you know, considerable support by, by one side or the other. They, they don't, they can't afford uh, not having one vote on their side uh, when uh, they need something to get through. So this is really just kind of uh, showing us and illustrating the strength of somebody like Joe Manchin. If he says that he is not going to vote on something, uh, that, that does carry a little bit of weight because his vote is definitely needed right now. Um, so that's one of the interesting parts of uh, the new power structure in the Senate that we've really seen in the last few weeks. We saw it with the impeachment, how those moderate members were sort of able to uh, lead the way in uh, making sure that the defense, the Trump defense, was answering questions that they felt uh, weren't clear. Um, and they, of course, later uh, voted to convict Trump. So there's a lot of power right now with those folks in the middle. And we're seeing that with this uh, uh, near a tandem issue. And Marimo, that gives some, some um, a justification, in fact, of why Merrick Garland is uh, a choice by Joe Biden to head the Justice Department, because it is someone, obviously, as you've been telling us, that we're hearing these Republicans able to get behind, um, seeing him as more of someone who's a consensus builder, uh, less of a firebrand than other people that Biden could have picked. Um, so there's the political reason why the Biden administration would nominate someone who could garner all those votes, right? who could get all Democrats on board as well as perhaps some Republicans as well. But what does it also say about the country that Joe Biden wants to run, the government that Joe Biden wants to run in his pick? What does it say about Joe Biden's goals in picking Merrick Garland for this job? Right, I think he wants to take uh, politics out of um, charging decisions and out of law enforcement. Um, he wants someone who has a track record as a moderate, um, I've just been really struck by the questions from Republicans. Um, they seem to be, in some cases, not even letting him answer, just wanting to sort of make their point and move on. Um, so it's clear that he's going to have bipartisan support. Um, so yes, Biden wants to restore independence to law enforcement in these decisions. Um, that's why he's picked Merrick Garland. Hmm. And um, as this process goes forward, how important is the, the both the paper trail as, whether, as well as um, the hearing trail in terms of holding a nominee to their word or holding them to a position? Because we've got the questionnaire that he filled out that people can read. We've also got this process. I mean, how mindful are the nominees of the tape sort of coming back almost to haunt them or to, to hold them accountable, you know, a year or two, four years down the road? Yeah, I, I think Garland is being pretty careful um, to say, like on the death penalty, for instance, it's going to be the Biden administration's policy if they decide to reinstate a moratorium on the death penalty. He was asked about uh, gun policies, and he was very careful 
um, to say he supports universal background checks, but he would not give his personal opinion on bans on certain firearms. Um, he gave a little more insight into some of his rulings on uh, gun restrictions. Um, but again, he made it clear that it's the Biden administration's policy that the Justice Department then carries out uh, within the constraints of the law. When we're seeing Judge Garland uh, prepared to sit back down again. And anything else that you think we should be watching for here in this second uh, part here, the last few senators getting their first round of questions? Yeah, the only other thing I was going to say, I was struck um, also by, again, just uh, Judge Garland's personality. He talked about trying to restore morale at the Justice Here Department. And you know, if it uh, weren't a pandemic, he would want to be there on the ground meeting the employees. Thank All right, you. thanks so much, Anne. Let's go back now to the Senate uh, chamber and uh, rather the hearing room and this process. Senator from Louisiana, Republican, asking the questions next. Senator Kennedy. Um. What to you is justice? Everybody treated equally, regardless of their p position in society, powerful, powerless, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, black, white, equal treatment, equal justice under the law. I want to go a little further, press you a little bit on that. Um, is it justice if you have an unjust law that's applied equally? Well, the, the, uh, no, the unjust law is itself the lack of justice. Um, let's narrow it down to, to punishment and justice. Um, if I suggested to you that justice and the concept of punishment is when someone gets what he deserves. Would you agree or disagree with that? Well, I suppose it depends on what gets what he deserves mean, but yes, I think justice requires individualized determination of um, the kind of crime you did, the, you know, and the uh, uh, mitigating circumstances, yes. Well, let me put it another way. If, um, is a person who commits a crime a, uh, a sinner in the moral sense or a sick person? Well, uh, this is again probably beyond my uh, competence. I, I think uh, with justice comes mercy. And so I think we have to take into consideration all different kinds of things. I also think that the kind of crime uh, that we're talking about uh, is relevant to the question of, uh, of um, uh, what kind of person uh, it is. Um, um, so I, I'm not sure exactly um, what, what you're asking me. I, I'm not trying to be evasive. I just don't know, know exactly what you're asking me. Okay. Let me, let me uh, shift gears here. Uh, were you chief judge when the coronavirus hit us? <laughs> Unfortunately for my successor, I, uh, uh, my term ran out just before coronavirus hit us. Well, if you had been chief judge, yes. would you have adopted a rule that said if one of our employees in the court gets coronavirus and goes to the hospital and is treated and is released, and wants to come back to work at the court, it would be discriminatory to ask them to take a coronavirus test? No. Okay. Isn't that what happened with a lot of our nursing homes throughout the country? You know, I, I honestly don't know what happened with the nursing homes. I don't know what they were doing with respect to, to uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be evasive. Sure. I, really, I really don't know uh, the facts here. I mean, I, I think in, in, the, in the example you gave me, uh, there's nothing uh, discriminatory about asking uh, uh, people who might be infected um, from a public health point of view uh, to be sure they don't infect other people. Uh, and if a determination is made they're not infected, then, of course, that's the end of it. 
um, equal treatment doesn't mean we don't take into consideration the possibilities of, of, of a, a, a different degrees of health in a particular circumstance. And I don't, I honestly don't know um, what happened with the nursing home. I know that it was terrible that many people got uh, yeah. COVID in the, in the nursing homes and, and it was a major vector of the spread of the infection. But, but I don't know why that was, except that there are people cooped up in one place and, and it's easy to spread that way. All right. Um, I think science tells us that, that uh, keeping our schools closed has a disproportionate impact on, uh, on poor people and children in poor, from poor families and on uh, families including but not limited to children of color. At, at what point do you think our, 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 our refusal of some of our leadership in our schools to reopen becomes a civil rights violation? So Senator, I, I completely agree with your description of the consequences of the school closing. I, I, I tutor uh, 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 two children in, in, uh, in uh, uh, a neighborhood of, the, of Washington, D.C., where most of the people, uh, students in the school are people of color. And uh, uh, I've been able to uh, tutor them by Zoom every week, um, but they have, you know, and they're taking classes um, by Zoom. And uh, it's much more difficult, obviously, for them. Uh, although they've done terrifically, um, not because of me, but they have, um, than it would be with uh, people with other resources. Um, I'm sorry. You know, I, it's all right. I don't, you know, I think that, uh, you know, public officials have to weigh very serious competing concerns with respect to how to deal with COVID. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, on the one hand, we have to be very uh, worried about uh, sending kids back in their schooling. And on the other hand, we have to be very worried about not um, spreading the disease in a way that uh, okay. kills them, or more importantly, uh, not more likely, their parents or their grandparents. And I, not, I don't want to be the person who makes that judgment. I understand. I, I get it. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I hate. No, no. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. I just we just have limited time. You have written in one of your opinions. I'm gonna read. I know you haven't memorized all of your opinions. Um, you said the Constitution, quote, does not contemplate that the district, District of Columbia, uh, may serve as a state for purposes of the apportionment of congressional representatives. That textual evidence is supported by historical evidence concerning the general understanding at the time of the district's creation. Is that still your considered opinion? Yes, and uh, I would say that that is a case, mm -hmm. one of my earliest cases, which uh, taught me what it means to be a judge, which is to do something the opposite of what you would do if you had uh, public policy concern. I think that citizens of the District of Columbia should be able to vote, but I didn't think that the Constitution gave me authority on my own uh, to give it to them. And it made me sad, but it, uh, it, it reaffirmed my role as a judge. Okay. Um. In my last 20 seconds, I'm going to ask you if you agree with this statement. Uh, allowing, and I'm not suggesting the answer one way or the other, I just want to know what you believe. Allowing biological males to compete in an all female sport deprives women of the opportunity to participate fully and fairly in sports and is fundamentally unfair to female athletes. This is a very difficult societal question that you're asking here. I know what, what underlies it. I know, it. but uh, you're going to be attorney general. Well, but uh, I, I may not be the one who has to make policy decisions like that, but it's not that I'm adverse to it. Look, I think every human being should be treated with dignity and respect. Um, and I, I, that's an overriding sense of my own character, but an overriding sense of what the law uh, requires. Um, um, this, the particular uh, question of how Title IX applies in schools is one, and in light of the Bostock case, which I know, I know you're very familiar with, is something that I would have to look at um, uh, when I have a chance to do that. I've not had the chance to consider these kinds of issues in my uh, career so far. But I agree that this is a difficult question. Thank you, Judge. 
for his first question as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Alex Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Garland, and to your family, just thank you for your many, many years of public service, and uh, should you be fortunate enough to be confirmed uh, in this next chapter. Uh, I've spent uh, a little bit more than 20 years in public service myself in different capacities, including uh, the prior six years uh, prior to my appointment to the Senate as California's uh, Secretary of State and Chief Elections Officer. Uh, my mission in that role was to increase voter participation and ensure free and fair elections. Uh, as the country has become more diverse, not just states like California and New York, but throughout the nation, uh, it's no coincidence that we have seen a resurgence of white supremacy and violent extremism. And history is clear. Voter suppression is rooted in white supremacy. This is true now and has been true ever since Reconstruction and the establishment of the Department of Justice, just as this committee has acknowledged at its outset. It should not be lost on any of us that after the 2013 Shelby v. Holder decision by the Supreme Court, we've seen a wave of legislation in states across the nation which have the effect of making it harder for eligible citizens to register to vote, to stay registered to vote, or to simply cast their ballot. I know Senator Leahy touched on the subject of voting rights in his questioning earlier today. Uh, but I want to acknowledge that, this, that despite the success of the 2020 election, which has been deemed secure, new voter suppression laws are being introduced right now across the country under the false pretext of preventing voter fraud. Now, we all saw how former President Trump's years of lies about voter fraud, the big lie, radicalized many of his supporters and led not just to physical threats against elections officials, elections offices, polling places, and even voters, but they ultimately led to the violent insurrection here in the nation's capital. I know you touched on this in your uh, opening remarks, but can you expand on how you will combat the white supremacy that threatens the safety and fairness of our elections specifically? Well, um We've asked a lot of questions all in one, yeah. which is- It's complicated. It's a complicated uh, problem, right. So uh, I strongly believe uh, in um, uh, voting and in increasing every possible opportunity uh, for voting, uh, which of course uh, uh, Congress can do even on its own. Um, um, the Elections Clause of the Constitution permits the Congress to set time, place, and manner, and to alter state uh, regulations uh, in that respect. In default, the state decides, but Congress can act that way. Uh, so that is one thing that Congress could do as a matter of legislation. Um, as I said, I think uh, I'd like to work with uh, the Congress um, uh, on improving the uh, record with respect to Section 4 so that we can use the tool of Section 5. We do have the authority of uh, Section 2, it does require, um, uh, it changes the burden of proof and it requires to attack one by one uh, changes in election laws. Um, but it does give us the opportunity to um, uh, bring cases both where there was uh, intention uh, to discriminate, but also where there's a uh, overall disparate impact with respect to discrimination. So we have a number of tools available uh, to us and uh, the voting rights section of the Civil Rights Division uh, was established for the purpose of pursuing those cases, uh, and we would do so. Okay, thank you. It's, uh, I want to dig a little bit deeper on this, because you're absolutely right. We need, in my opinion, to restore the, the full strength of the Federal Voting Rights Act. Uh, there's a lot that can and should be done, not just in terms of uh, elections administration uh, with respect to, to voting rights, uh, but uh, the protection of voters themselves. You know, people should be able to vote free of any un, uh, harassment, intimidation, right. uh, obstacles, et cetera. And part of what works against that is, uh, uh, again, rooted in white supremacy, uh, this big lie. Uh, we all sat through the uh, impeachment trial, and the results notwithstanding, uh, can't 
help but be moved by the evidence presented by the House managers. Uh, again, how President Trump's big lie about voter fraud radicalized so many of his supporters. Now, I was struck by a February 19th opinion piece in the Washington Post by Jim Shudo about the parallels between the Capitol insurrectionists and foreign terrorist organizations that uh, respectfully ask be inserted into the record, Mr. Chairman. In it, Jim Shudo writes, and I'll quote, Domestic radicalism has deep parallels to jihadist terrorism. Both movements are driven by alienation from the political system and a resulting breakdown in social norms. For some groups and individuals, this breakdown leads to violence they see as justified to achieve political ends." End quote. Now, as we all know, the definition of terrorism is the unlawful use of violence and intimidation in pursuit of political ends. President Trump's political end was clear, stopping the certification of the 2020 election at the Capitol on January 6th. One could argue that right-wing groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers have acted like terrorist cells, communicating with one another, training together, and preparing for the moment they are activated for their mission. Indeed, President Trump instructed the Proud Boys on national television to stand back and stand by. And then he summoned them to the Capitol on January 6th as Congress was meeting to certify the election. What happened on January 6th was not a property crime, was not, a vandalism, was not vandalism in reference to a question you were asked earlier. Judge Garland, as we sit here in the United States Capitol, surrounded by National Guard troops and barbed wire, how will you bring the full resources of the Justice Department to bear on white supremacist organizations that pose an ongoing threat to not just our safety and not just the safety of this Capitol building, but to our fundamental democracy for which it stands? I, I couldn't agree more that uh, uh, extremist groups, and particularly uh, white supremacist groups, do pose a fundamental threat to our democracy. And they have posed that threat um, throughout our history. Um, and as I recounted, uh, that was the reason the Justice Department was originally established to fight uh, the first incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, I, the best that I can do is, uh, as I said, uh, my first priority uh, will be to have a briefing on where we are, uh, if I'm confirmed, with the um, investigations, which from the outside appear quite vigorous uh, um, and nationwide, and to find out what additional resources we need. But that is just a focus on, on, uh, on what happened in, in, in the Capitol. We also have to have a focus on what is happening all over the country and on where this could spread and where this came from. And that requires, it does require a lot of resources. Um, I, I, I am I'm very uh, pleased to have read that uh, the uh, director of the FBI believes that this kind of extremism is the most dangerous uh, threat um, uh, to the country, um, and uh, that that's where he's putting FBI resources. Uh, and that is where I would put Justice Department resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, we need very much uh, to make, it, uh, make uh, sure that that's the case. I do want to be careful that we also always worry about the foreign threat, because it is always with us. And uh, the fact that nothing has happened uh, recently doesn't mean it could not happen tomorrow. So uh, from whichever direction, inside, outside, right, left, doesn't matter, an attack on our, uh, our, our institutions of democracy and of our uh, ability to go forward with our daily lives in safety has to be stopped, and uh, that we need it. Uh, all, it's a government-wide, but also a Justice Department-wide obligation. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator. Uh, Senator Tillis would be next, but he is uh, not in Zoom range for that <laughs> possibility. And so Senator Blackburn, if she can connect with us, is next up. Yes, sir. I am connected, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. And um, uh, Judge Garland, I want to say thank you to you for your willingness to, to serve and for your career. 
in public service. And I will tell you, as I've talked to Tennesseans about this, they care a lot about law, order, timeliness at the Justice Department. And uh, after the Christmas Day bombing, you and I discussed this and the bombing that took place in Nashville. They really are interested in the principles and the convictions of our nation's top law enforcement official. And my hope is, and I think the expectation is that you will assure the American people that you are going to apply the law fairly and equitably, because in this country, as we know, no one is above the law. Now, I know you've been asked about the Durham investigation, and I will tell you that this is important to Tennesseans and making certain that that investigation is going to be completed and that you are going to work to be certain that it is not impeded and is completed and that you're committed to seeing this through to completion. Well, uh, thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity we had to discuss uh, uh, these matters uh, uh, earlier as well. Um, as I said, with respect to the Durham investigation, I don't know anything about it other than uh, what has appeared in the media. Um, the investigation has been uh, discreet with, uh, as appropriate uh, with respect to expressions of, the, of its status. Um, I understand that Mr. Durham has um, uh, been permitted to remain in his position, and I know of nothing uh, that would give me any doubt that that was the correct uh, decision. And I appreciate that. And likewise, we had discussed the investigation into Hunter Biden's business dealings. And uh, we want to make certain that you commit to allowing Delaware U.S. Attorney David Weiss to complete that investigation and bring that evidence forward. And similarly with Mr. Durham, I don't know anything about uh, that investigation other than what I've read uh, in the um, uh, media. And again, that, dis that investigation has been um, uh, proceeding uh, uh, discreetly uh, and not publicly, uh, uh, as all investigations should. Uh, I understand that the Delaware uh, U.S. Attorney um, uh, was permitted uh, to stay on as U.S. Attorney. And I, again, have absolutely no reason to doubt that that was uh, uh, the correct decision. And uh, let's talk a little bit about China, because we discussed some of that mm -hmm. for the record. And uh, our last DNI had stated that China is our greatest threat. So I would like to hear from you. Do you agree that the Chinese Communist Party is an enemy of the American people? Well, uh, I don't have the same familiarity uh, with the intelligence information that the uh, director of, the, of national intelligence has. So in terms of comparing, say, the threat from China and the threat from Russia, I'm just not competent uh, to make that. And I, that comparison, and I have learned uh, in my professional career not to make uh, judgments on which I am not uh, competent. But I uh, certainly, uh, from what the director said, uh, there's no doubt that, that uh, China is uh, a, a threat with respect to uh, hacking of our uh, computers, hacking of our uh, infrastructure, uh, theft of our intellectual uh, property. Um, um, uh, all of these are uh, very uh, difficult problems and uh, we have to defend against. Well, we do. And I know that Lindsey Graham asked you about Section 230 and some of the issues that are there. We all are very concerned about the issues that surround China, whether it is the Chinese Communist Party and their, the way they threaten our democracy and our economic leadership around the globe. And we're also concerned about uh, the Chinese military links into our American universities through things like the Confucius Institutes. And for instance, uh, recently there was a situation at Harvard with a cancer researcher and he was caught trying to smuggle 21 vials a biological material out of the U.S. and get it to China. 
and I would hope that you agree that this threat puts uh, American intellectual property and technology at risk. And I would hope that you would assure the American people that you're going to put the full force of the Department of Justice to forward to investigate and to prosecute every one of the spies that are working on U.S. soil. Well, well Senator, I'm, I'm not familiar with that circumstance, um, so I can't comment on it specifically, but I can assure you uh, that the Justice Department's National Security Division uh, was in, uh, created in part uh, for the purpose of ferreting out um, um, uh, espionage uh, by foreign agents, and that that is also the uh, the role of the FBI and the two working together. And uh, if, if uh, uh, foreign agents are uh, caught uh, uh, stealing American intellectual property, American trade secrets, um, uh, American materials, that they will be prosecuted. Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, we're about a year into this pandemic, and technology has allowed for us to do work like we in the Senate are doing with WebEx. Uh, I think we've all found that it gives a lot of flexibility, but um, as we are spending more time online, we hear from people about holding big tech accountable. As I said, you've discussed Section 2, 230 earlier, and we are hearing more about antitrust lawsuits. Of course, you all have the current suit against Google, and I will hope that you are going to allow that lawsuit to continue. Yeah, I don't, again, I don't want to talk about a particular lawsuit, but um, I, I, I don't see, uh, you know, every matter um, uh, I'd have to uh, ask uh, for a briefing on. Um, but uh, uh, much of that lawsuit uh, is public. And again, um, given what I've uh, read, I don't see uh, any reason why the, that investigation, uh, the decision to, uh, to institute that investigation uh, uh, would be changed. But I, I only know what, I, uh, what I've read with respect to, uh, to the descriptions of the public filings. Let me ask you one more question, and then I'm going to have a series of questions to come to you as QFRs. Uh, the President Biden has talked about reinstating the um, Obama administration practice of paying settlement money from winning lawsuits to third-party interest groups like La Raza, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, and the Urban League. And it's just, you know, I, I, I find it really interesting that they would choose to have that money go to these outside groups instead of to victims or to the U.S. Treasury. So do you plan on reinstating that policy, and how would you justify reinstating that policy? I, I don't have any plan one way or the other. Um, um, I know you raised that, uh, that policy um, when we were talking before, and I, I understand uh, yeah. your concern about it. Um, obviously, um, damages, uh, recoveries should uh, uh, first uh, go to help uh, victims. I don't know uh, very much at all about uh, the policy, and uh, it would be something I would have to consider uh, if I'm confirmed, um, I have to hear the arguments uh, on both sides of uh, why the policy obviously uh, started uh, and also why it was rescinded. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Blackburn. Senator Ossoff, welcome to the committee. Your turn to question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Judge Garland. Congratulations on your nomination. Thanks for the time that we spent by video conference discussing some of these issues. Thank you also for sharing your family's immigrant story with the committee. It mirrors my own. My great grandparents came here fleeing anti Semitism in 1911 and 1913 from Eastern Europe. And I'm sure that your ancestors they could hardly have imagined. <laughs> I'm sure that your ancestors could hardly have imagined that you'd now be sitting before this committee uh, pending confirmation for this position. Um, Judge, I want to ask you about equal justice. Uh, black Americans continue to endure profiling, harassment, brutality, discrimination 
in policing, in prosecution, in sentencing, and in incarceration. How can you use the immense power of the office of the Attorney General to make real America's promise of equal justice for all? And can you please be specific about the tools that you'll have at your disposal? Yeah. So uh, this is um, a, a substantial part of why I wanted to be uh, the Attorney General. Uh, as, uh, I am deeply aware of uh, the moment that the country is in. Um, when Senator Durbin was reading uh, the, uh, the statement of uh, Robert Kennedy, um, it just it, it hit me um, that we are in a similar uh, moment uh, to the moment he was in. So there are a lot of things that the department can do. One of, the, one of those things uh, has to do with the problem of mass incarceration, uh, the over-incarceration uh, of American citizens and of its disproportionate effect on um, um, uh, black Americans and communities of color and other minorities. Uh, there are different ways in which we can try, uh, that is uh, disproportion in the sense uh, both of population, uh, but also uh, uh, given the data we have on uh, uh, the fact that uh, crimes are not committed by these communities, these crimes are not committed in, in any greater number uh, than, than in others, and that similar crimes um, um, are not uh, charged in the same way. So we have to figure out ways to deal with this. So one important way, I think, is to focus on the crimes that really matter, that uh, attract our, to, to bring our uh, charging and our arresting on violent crime and others that deeply affect uh, our society and uh, uh, not have such a, an overemphasis on, on, um, on, on a marijuana uh, possession, uh, for example, uh, which has disproportionately affected uh, communities of color and, and then uh, damaged them far uh, after the original arrest uh, because of the inability to, take, to get jobs. We have to look at our charging policies again uh, and uh, uh, go ba back to the uh, policy that I helped uh, Janet Reno uh, draft uh, during her period and that Eric Holder um, uh, drafted while he was the Attorney General of, of not uh, feeling that we must charge every offense to the maximum, that we don't have to seek the highest possible offense with the highest possible sentence, that we should give discretion to our um, uh, uh, prosecutors to uh, make the offense and the, and the charge fit the crime and be proportional to uh, the damage that it does to our society that we should look at our, uh, sent, our uh, we should also look closely and be more sympathetic towards uh, retrospective of reductions in sentences, which the First um, Step Act has given us some opportunity, although not enough, to reduce uh, sentences to a fair amount. Uh, and legislatively, we should look um, at um, equalizing, for example, the what's known as the crack powder ratio, which has had an enormously disproportionate impact on communities of color, but which evidence shows is not related to the dangerousness of the, of the two drugs. Um, and we should um, uh, do as, as um, President uh, Biden has suggested, uh, seek the elimination of mandatory minimum so that we once again uh, give um, authority to district judges, uh, trial judges, to make determinations based on uh, all of the sentencing factors that judges normally apply and, and, and that don't take away from them the ability to do justice in individual cases. All of that will make a big difference in the things that you're talking about. Thank you, Judge Garland. And let's discuss accountability for local agencies. The Civil Rights Division has the authority to launch pattern or practice investigations targeting systemic violations of constitutional rights or violations of federal statutes governing law enforcement. Tomorrow will be the first anniversary of the murder of Ahmad Arbery in Glen County, Georgia, who was shot to death in broad daylight in the street on camera. But local authorities chose to look the other way, and were it not for the activism of Georgia's NAACP, there likely would not have been any prosecution in that case. How can Congress equip DOJ's Civil Rights Division to launch more and more effective pattern or practice investigations without asking you to comment on the details of the Arbery case? And how else can the Department of Justice use its authority to ensure that where local agencies violate constitutional rights or fail to uphold the guarantee of equal protection, 
there's accountability. Well, I, I appreciate it. You're not asking me to talk about a pending case. Um, um, what I will say is that, like uh, many, many Americans, I was shocked by what I saw in videos of uh, um, black Americans being uh, killed over uh, this last summer. Um, that's, uh, I do think, um, created a moment in the national life uh, that uh, brought attention from people who had not seen what uh, black Americans and other members of community as of color had known for uh, decades, um, but it did bring everything to the fore and created a moment in which we have an opportunity to make dramatic changes and, and really bring forth equal justice under the law, which is our commitment of the Justice Department. So the Civil Rights Division is the place where we uh, uh, focus these, uh, these um, operations. You're exactly right that pattern and practice invest pattern or practice investigations are, are the core of our ability to bring actions here. Uh, that these lead to all different kinds of remedies, sometimes consent decrees um, as, as a potential remedy. We also uh, 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 can, can uh, criminally prosecute uh, violations of uh, uh, constitutional rights. Um, and um, uh, we can also uh, provide uh, funding for uh, police departments uh, to uh, uh, reform themselves. Um, I do believe uh, that uh, officers who uh, follow the law and the Constitution want um, that accountability. They want uh, officers who do not uh, to become accountable because if, if that doesn't happen, their, their, their uh, law enforcement agency is tainted they lose uh, the credibility in the community, and without the community's trust, they can't bring safety. So we have this, this, this number of tools. Um, whether we need additional tools in this particular area, I don't know. No, obviously the resources are necessary. I'm probably gonna be like a broken record in every one of these areas uh, for us to, uh, to do our job. And, and, and Judge Garland, with, with my time so I'm short, sorry. will you I, commit to working with my office and with this committee to determine what additional authorities the department may need and what resources you may require in order to be able to bring more and more effective pattern or practice investigations where appropriate? Absolutely, Senator, I'm sorry to have gone on. No problem. Long. Thank you, Judge Garland. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Judge, and thank you, Senator Ossoff. And so only in the Senate would we characterize a five-minute round of questioning as a lightning round. <laughs> but that's uh, what we're gonna shift to at this moment. And um, those senators who wish to ask a second question will have five minutes to do so. And I'm going to kick it off if I can. I wanna address an issue which doesn't come up very often in this type of hearing, but should and that is the state of America's federal prisons. We talk a lot about justice under the law, sentencing, enforcement. We know the outcome in many, many cases is that a person is incarcerated for sometimes a very lengthy period of time. How long that period of time is and how that person is treated in prison should be our concern as well. It's a reflection on our values as a nation, just as many other things are. So the first thing I would say is that I made a serious mistake, along with many others, including the current president, in supporting a bill more than 25 years ago, which established a standard for sentencing, crack cocaine, 100 to 1 compared to powder cocaine. The net result of it uh, was a failure of policy. It did not reduce addiction. It did not raise the price of crack cocaine. Just the opposite occurred. We ended up arresting thousands of Americans and sentencing them to lengthy sentences, primarily African Americans. And so I introduced a bill several years ago, the Fair Sentencing Act, uh, which was signed into law by President Obama. And then I worked with Senator Grassley, Senator Lee, who's here today, as well as uh, Senator Booker and others to pass the First Step Act. The idea was to reconcile some of the injustice in our sentencing under that earlier law. Uh, Senator, uh, President Trump, much to our surprise, signed it into law and even spoke positively about it at, at the State of the Union. Unfortunately, it has not been implemented, and the provisions in there to prepare people for release from prison as well as to reduce sentences have not been effectively enforced. So 
point number one. I hope you will put that on your agenda because I'll be back in touch with you to ask. Second point, the United States has 5% of the population of the world and 20% of the COVID infections and deaths. It's a terrible commentary on our failure to deal with this public health crisis. But to make matters even worse, the infection rate in federal prison populations is four times what it is in the surrounding community. And more than 230 federal prisoners have died. We need to have a sensible and humane response to compassionate release in this time of pandemic. Senator Grassley and I have introduced legislation along those lines, and I'm going to ask you to look at that carefully as well. And the third is the um, last item that I'll bring up for your response. Uh, was an article written several years ago in the New Yorker magazine, and I think I may have mentioned this to you, by Dr. Atul Gawande, who is a surgeon in the Boston metropolitan area, a prolific writer and a very insightful man. And he wrote an article about the impact of solitary confinement on the human mind and went further to talk about how people in a perilous situation can be reduced to an inhuman level just by isolation, 23 hours a day sitting in the cell by yourself. Uh, it, it just has that impact. And I looked into it to see what was happening at the federal level. I'm happy to report to you that things are marginally better, but only marginally. I think that isolation is cruel and unusual and has to be used in some circumstances for an extremely dangerous inmate, but unfortunately it's used in too many circumstances now. Many states are way ahead of the federal prison system in looking at this issue. I only have a minute left, and it's all yours to react. Well, these are all easy because I had already thought about all of them, and uh, in each case, I think um, I, I will be looking at each one of these problems. The First Step Act, uh, both with, with respect to our, uh, uh, the, the, if, if I'm, uh, obviously, if I'm confirmed, the, the uh, First Step Act with respect to the uh, reentry um, uh, 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 education that's required so that uh, people don't are, don't become recidivists. They're able to go into societies. The First F, uh, Step Act, with respect uh, to uh, the coverage of the act uh, uh, for retroactive reduction in, in sentences. Um, 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 I also, um, over the years, uh, maybe like you, I've learned more and more about the crack powder distinction and how, by reading the Sentencing Commission reports, uh, about how there seems to be little, uh, if any, support for making that. So I, I, I now am of, of the view that there is no uh, reason, so I'm very interested uh, in reform in that area. Um, I, 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 I have read but don't know a lot about the solitary confinement issue, but I can't imagine that I, uh, obviously it's uh, uh, required in some circumstances to protect people uh, 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 from other people, uh, but it's not uh, any kind of uh, regular measure for uh, uh, incarceration. So all three of these areas are ones that I was already planning to look at, and I can assure you that I will. Thanks, Judge. I see Senator Lee is here, and I'm going to recognize him next in the lightning round. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Judge Garland, uh, consistent with the idea of this being a lightning round, I'm going to start with some questions that can be yes or no. Um, if they require more than that, you can say yes uh, with uh, this or that minor caveat, but I'd prefer a yes or a no if you can provide one of these. Do you believe that individuals who advocate uh, for uh, the rights of unborn human beings are, are rendered unfit for public office by virtue of having engaged in such advocacy? No. Do you believe that efforts to purge voter rolls of individuals who have either died or have left the state in question uh, or to require voter identification are, are racially discriminatory and uh, a, a, an assault on voting rights? This one is one I can't answer yes or no because um, you're asking about uh, um, motivations of uh, individuals, uh, some of whom may have discriminatory uh, in, uh, uh, purpose and some right. of whom uh, have uh, no discriminatory purpose. Okay, okay, I think that answers my question there because I, uh, I guess what I'm asking is does an individual, without knowing more than that, is there anything about those comments or support for those positions that in and of themselves would make that person a racist? or an assault on voting rights? Again, um, it, 
there's nothing about the comment itself, but um, when, you know, there's such a thing as circumstantial evidence, obviously, gotcha. and if there's enormously disparate impact of, of things that somebody continues to propose, uh, you know, it's not unreasonable to draw conclusions from that. But I, 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 the mere fact of the statement, no. Do you believe that Republicans in the United States, and by Republicans I mean uh, as, as a whole, uh, are determined to, quote, leave our communities to the mercy of people and institutions driven by hate, bigotry, and fear of any threat to the status quo, close quote? I don't make generalizations about members of political parties. I, I, I would never do that. I, I appreciate that and uh, w w wouldn't expect otherwise. The reason I raise these ones is that these are um, questions that have been drawn from comments made by Vanita Gupta, who's been nominated to be the Associate Attorney General, has advocated for each of these positions. Well, well Senator, I, I know uh, Vanita Gupta now uh, quite well. I didn't know her before, but since the nomination, I've gotten a chance to talk with her and uh, speak with her. Um, I have to tell you, I regard her as a person of great integrity and a person who is dedicated to the mission of the department and particularly equal justice under law. And, uh, understand, so, I don't know I'm not that asking I'm you to weigh in on her, on, on, on her as a person. Yeah. I'm just talking about the comments. Let's move on. Would, um, would an, an individual's past statements, uh, statements in the past uh, as an adult, uh, declaring that one racial group is superior to another, would statements like that be relevant to an evaluation of whether such a person should be put in charge of running the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. So, Senator, I've read uh, in the last few days these allegations about Kristen Clark, who I also have gotten to know, who I also trust, who I believe is a person of integrity, whose views about the uh, Civil Rights Division I have discussed with her, and they are in line with my own. I have uh, every re reason to want her. She is an experienced former blind prosecutor of hate crimes, and we need somebody like that to be running the- I'm asking about security. the statement. I'm not asking about her as a person. I'm asking about the statement. Would, in the abstract, would someone who has made that comment, would that comment itself be relevant to the question whether that person, having made that statement, should be put in charge of running the Civil Rights Division. All I can tell you is I've had many conversations with her about her views about the, about, um, the Civil Rights Division, about what kind of uh, matter she would investigate. What, they, what about anti-Semitic comments? They, would those be relevant to someone wanting to run the Civil Rights You know my division? views about anti-Semitism. Right. Uh, no one needs to question uh, those, I'm obviously. not questioning your I know, I know you're not, but I also want you to know I'm a pretty good judge of what an anti-Semite is. And I, have, and I do not believe that she is an anti-Semite, and I do not believe she is discriminatory in any sense. Okay, tell me this, Judge, you, you are a man of, of integrity uh, and, and one who honors and respects the laws. What assurances can you give us, as, as one who uh, has been nominated to serve as the Attorney General of the United States, that you, if confirmed as Attorney General of the United States, uh, what assurances can you give Americans who are Republican, who are pro-life, who are religious, uh, people who are members of uh, certain minority groups, you know, in short, half or more than half of the country, uh, telling them that the U.S. Department of Justice, if you're confirmed, will protect them uh, if, if Department of Justice leaders have condoned uh, radical positions like those ones, uh, those that I've described. Right. Look, I'll say again, I don't uh, uh, believe that uh, either Vanita or Kristen condone those positions, but, uh, and, and I have complete faith in them, uh, but um, um, I'll, we are a, a leadership team, uh, uh, along with uh, Lisa Monaco, uh, that will run the department, and the end, every, uh, the final decision is mine. Uh, the buck stops with me, as uh, Harry Truman said, and uh, um, I will assure uh, the people that you're talking about, uh, I, have ever, I, I am a strong believer in religious liberty and there will not be a, uh, uh, um, uh, any discrimination uh, under my watch. Thank you. I might remind the committee that the statements, I might remind the committee that the statements are being alleged can all be asked of the actual witness committee is going to have a hearing on these individuals, and it would only be fair to take the question to them as opposed to asking for a reaction uh, from someone who did not make that statement. Senator Klobuchar? Um, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate it, um, uh, Judge, your uh, full-throated uh, defense, not only of religious liberty, uh, which I know is important to Senator Lee, but also of your team and the people that you want to work with going forward. And while uh, the chairman is correct, we can ask questions of those nominees. I think it's important to hear from you um, with their hearings coming up of your beliefs about how they can do the job. So I appreciate that. I know both of them and have a lot of respect for them. Th thank you, Senator. They have skills that I do not have. They have experiences that I do not have. Uh, likewise, Lisa Monaco has experiences in intelligence world that I do not have. Um, no human being can do have all of the skills necessary to run the Justice Department, and I need this leadership team if I'm going to be successful, if you confirm me. Very good. Well, thank you very much. And um, I, one thing that we didn't touch on uh, when I asked my first round of questions was the Violence Against Women Act, and I'm going to be working with Senator Feinstein and others on that this committee to finally get that done. I don't know if you followed this, but we've had a, a delay in getting that reauthorized. It's tended to be a, a bipartisan bill in the past, and um, I have several provisions in the bill, including one on um, to fix a loophole that exists um, involving, it's called the boyfriend loophole, but it's not as positive as that sounds, um, <laughs> um, about um, owning, getting guns after people have committed serious crimes. Um, but the second piece is a bill called the Abby Hunold Act, which uh, is a rape victim in Minnesota who worked with us, um, and Senator Cornyn is my uh, co-sponsor of the bill, um, to be able to do a better job with law enforcement to investigate sexual assault crimes. Uh, but just in general, do you want to talk about your views on the Violence Against Women Act and the Justice Department role in training and the like across the country? Yes, yeah, so uh, as I know you know, uh, the Violence Against Women Act uh, uh, was uh, pressed by uh, Senator uh, Joe Biden um, uh, many years ago, and he has a deep uh, commitment uh, to its continued reauthorization, uh, as do I. I was in the Justice Department when we set up the first uh, office uh, for uh, uh, violence against women uh, for the purpose of coordinating departmental uh, programs in this area. I know this requires resources. Both of the examples that you give, uh, see, again, I don't know the specifics, but from the description, I can hardly imagine a, a, a serious disagreement. Uh, we have to do uh, uh, provide the resources necessary uh, uh, to help uh, rape victims, obviously, and uh, I don't see any reason why um, you know somebody uh, who commits a uh, violent crime um, uh, against a uh, uh, a, 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 a person but isn't married or have an intimate relationship uh, should be treated any differently um, uh, than one who does. So uh, I think I'm all in on the violence against uh, women uh, 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 re-upping the statute very good. authorization, I guess. Thank you. Um, another thing that I've been very focused on, part because uh, my dad struggled with alcoholism um, most of his life and um, as um, got through that thanks to treatment and recovery is to give that same kind of opportunity to people in the criminal justice system. And drug courts um, are a big presence in Minnesota as is treatment. We're home of Hazleton Betty Ford um, as well as many other fine treatment centers. And uh, we've worked really hard here. I've led some of the efforts on diversion with federal courts, uh, with drug court. And of course, there's much use of them um, on the state courts. Could you talk about your views on that? Yeah, no, I think uh, drug courts and diversion are an excellent idea uh, 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 for people uh, um, uh, who have addiction and uh, need to be treated. Um, I think and now that the uh, opioid crisis has struck uh, large parts of America, uh, many Americans now uh, understand uh, that uh, um, Sometimes it is just not a question of willpower uh, uh, to turn this stuff down. Uh, that this is, uh, uh, these kind of drugs uh, take control of your lives and you just can't do anything about it. Uh, and treating, uh, treating people in those circumstances uh, um, uh, in the criminal justice system is a, a, a abuse of them, but also it's a terrible uh, misallocation of resources. So the drug courts that are able to get people into addiction programs uh, are godsend. Uh, and I, I'm in favor of them. And uh, thank you for also mentioning opioids, uh, which has been such a scourge. Uh, we lost Prince 
uh, in Minnesota uh, because of opioids, but we lost a lot of other people that people may not know their names and a lot of kids to opioids. And actually, um, Senator Whitehouse and I, along with Senator Portman, Senator Graham's been involved in this and many others, Grassley, um, have been leading the way for a while before um, people were even identifying this as an issue. And uh, commitment to the treatment side of it, which you've already made just now, but also uh, to the um, prosecution of synthetic uh, production and distribution, synthetic opioids, uh, continues to this day. Could you comment briefly? I think maybe Senator Graham asked you about this, but if you could comment. Yeah, yeah, he did, and of course I think that that's uh, right. Um, the people who are putting the poison into the communities are the ones we should be focusing on. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I think that's what the DEA uh, uh, is well known for doing, and I, I'd like to put as much uh, effort into this as we possibly can. Okay, I see the chairman is looking at me in a very <laughs> polite Midwestern way to tell me that my time has expired, so thank you. I'm familiar with the polite uh, Midwestern <laughs> way. <laughs> Senator Kennedy, your diligence, diligence has been rewarded. You have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge, I'm really curious about your thinking on this. And I don't want my questions to be interpreted as uh, suggestive or, or inconsistent with your thinking. But you and I are about the same age, I think. I think so. That's right, Senator. Uh, what is, when you refer to systemic racism, what is that? I think... I think it is um, plain to me that uh, there is uh, <coughs> uh, discrimination and uh, uh, widespread disparate treatment of communities of color and other ethnic minorities uh, in this country. They have um, a disproportionately lower uh, employment, disp uh, disproportionately lower home ownership rates, disproportionately uh, lower ability uh, to accumulate wealth. This, uh, this so can I stop you? Because this five minutes goes so fast. I'm sorry. So you're basically saying there's a, there's a disparate impact. There's disparate impact, which um, in some cases is the consequence of um, uh, historical patterns. Sometimes uh, uh, is the consequence okay, of let me, let me uh, unconscious this. bias and some sure. kind of uh, 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 consciousness. Uh, when you were at the Department of Justice, yes. Was the Department of Justice then systemically racist? I think each, we look for a pattern or practice in each institution. When you talk about a specific institution, you look for its pattern and practices. But, but you, how do you know what you know? In other words, you say an institution is systemically racist. I, I didn't say any particular institution. I, I know, I'm not, I'm not saying you did. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying if you say an institution is systemically racist, how do you know what you know? Do you measure it by a disparate impact, controlling you for other factors? Well, the, the very specific... Or do you, you just look at the numbers and say the, the system must be racist. Well, no, now you've asked me a, 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 a slightly different question, which I think I have a slightly different answer for. Okay, So cool. the, the authority the Justice Department has to investigate institutions is to look for patterns or practices of unconstitutional conduct. And if we find a pattern or a practice of unconstitutional conduct, I would describe that as, as a, a, a institutional racism within that institution. Um, that may not be the be perfect definition, but that, that's what I would think. So of. it's just a product of the numbers? Well, if there is a pattern and a, a practice, this is not just a question of individual numbers. What we're looking for here under those investigations are patterns. Why is it that, you know, a series of similar events are occurring uh, like that? Uh, look, uh, looking into any individual's heart is not something we can do. Who bears the burden of proving that? The institution? Or no, the God, no, no, no. Like, uh, as in all, in all, all uh, uh, matters of law, the burden is on uh, the, the investigator to, to prove, first by investigation, then it, before a court. Is there any other way to measure institutional racism other than than the numbers, the disparate impact? 
Well, yes, I mean, you can look at uh, large numbers of individual cases in which discriminatory conduct is actually found, intentional discriminatory conduct. Then it's not just a question of numbers. But, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if an institution has a very large number of, uh, of, of uh, incidents of unconstitutional conduct, the entity is uh, responsible in the same way a corporation is responsible for the behavior of its individuals. So, so same way, as, uh, same way. Uh, 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 What's the difference, though, between people who are racist and institution that's racist? Yeah. Now we do have a cosmic question, but I think institutions are made up of... Yeah, but this is important. I know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you. I'm, I, I totally agree with that. Corporations are nothing other than the collection of their individuals. And the same is true for a public entity, which is in a, in, in a certain way a corporation. Okay, I've got to get one more in. I'm sorry. i got 24 I'm seconds. I'm sorry. You asked a very hard question. I'm well, we, we can answer. talk about this later, but I want to ask you about this concept of implicit bias. Yeah. Does that mean I'm a racist no matter what I do or what I think? I'm a racist, but I don't know I'm a racist? Okay, the, the label racist is not one that I would apply uh, like that. Implicit bias just means that every human being has biases. That's part of what it means to be a human being. And the point of uh, examining our implicit biases is to bring our conscious mind up to our unconscious mind and to, 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 to know when we're behaving in a stereotyped way. Everybody has stereotypes. It's, it's not possible to go through life without working through stereotypes. And uh, implicit biases are the ones that we don't recognize the, our behavior. That but doesn't make you racist, who, no. Who judges that? Doesn't the person judging me have his own implicit bias? How do I know his implicit bias isn't worse than my implicit bias? <laughs> I agree, but I'm not judging you, Senator, and I don't know I'm who, not would, asking who you would to, be judging. But somebody, if you say you have implicit bias, that's a pejorative statement. Uh, 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 I'm not saying you're being mean. You're not a yeah. mean guy. That's obvious. You're a nice guy. If you say somebody has implicit bias, somebody's got to make that subjective judgment, yeah. and the person making that subjective judgment has implicit bias if it's part of being a human then how do you know who wins? Fair enough, but if we say that all people have implicit bias, it's not, uh, you shouldn't take it as pejorative. This is just an, an element of the human condition. Uh, so you shouldn't take that as, uh, as pejorative. Implicit bias is just a descriptor of, uh, of the way people's mi everyone's mind works. How about if you say that America has racists in it, just like everybody else? Does that necessarily, just like everywhere else, does that make America systemically racist? I, to, I think, uh, I, I, I don't want to waste your time because I think this is what I said before. Um, what I mean by systemic uh, racism is the patterns of uh, uh, discrimination and disparate treatment uh, across the country. It doesn't mean that any particular individual is, is a racist. Judge, I'm in big trouble. I've gone way over. I'm developing a bias. <laughs> Thank you for the exchange. It's a pleasure, a pleasure talking with you, Senator. Same I here, appreciate Judge. It. Be a good Attorney General. All right, so I'd like to let the committee know that uh, Senator Hirono <clears throat> will be the next up, and then we're going to take a break and return to five-minute rounds. Uh, Senator Hirono, are you tuned in? Yes, I am. Take Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to ask a uh, what I think is a very straightforward question. Uh, over the past couple of years. The Justice Department has initiated a number of efforts related to missing and murdered indigenous people and women, including U.S. attorney-led pilot projects in Alaska and Oklahoma to implement tailored tribal community response plans. To what extent do you plan to continue to focus on these and other regional engagement efforts that could help address the missing and murdered indigenous people crisis? Well, I, I certainly do uh, intend to continue those. Uh, again, when last time I was in the Justice Department, the Office of Tribal Justice um, uh, was established, and uh, I believe uh, from looking at the org chart that it's still there. Um, this is uh, an important uh, aspect. We have a responsibility uh, to indigenous peoples, uh, both statutory uh, and otherwise. Um, um, 
uh, to protect. And um, um, you know, many of our, our problems in this country are regional, and uh, uh, we must focus our resources uh, uh, on, on problems that are regional. Not every problem is a national one, and uh, regional problems have to be addressed uh, uh, directly uh, with respect uh, to the problems caused in those regions. And this Thank is you, Judge Garland, because this is, uh, this, I think this is an under, um, uh, possibly underreported, and definitely we don't pay enough attention to what is happening to uh, murdered and missing and indigenous women. So uh, I think we need to put a lot more emphasis on what's going on there. Now, the past four years have seen a reawakening of right-wing extremism. Last year, FBI Director Ray testified that the greatest domestic threat terrorist threat facing the United States is white extremist groups. And of course, last month we had an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol led by white supremacists and right-wing extremists. Late last month, the New York Times reported that President Trump, with the help of his Attorney General Barr, diverted law enforcement resources from combating the serious threat posed by right-wing extremist groups. Will you reprioritize Justice Department resources to address white supremacists and other right-wing extremists? Uh, yes, uh, Senator. Um, if anything was necessary uh, to refocus our attention on uh, white supremacists, uh, that, that was the attack on the Capitol. And um, I expect um, uh, to put uh, uh, the, all departmental resources uh, necessary to combat this problem. Um, uh, into this uh, uh, area to make sure both our agents and our uh, prosecutors uh, have the uh, uh, numbers and the resources uh, to accomplish that mission. Thank you. My next question has to do with the uh, immigration courts. And uh, we discussed immigration and the courts when uh, we were able to meet a few weeks ago. And it's worth highlighting that under the Trump administration, the backlog of cases pending in the immigration courts has exploded to almost 1.3 million cases. That is an amazing number. Uh, in some jurisdictions, the wait to hear a case is four years, and there are cases that have been pending for more than five years. And this not only affects families trying to reunite, but students trying to study or train in the U.S., victims of crime, who are working with law enforcement and members of our military trying to adjust status. 1.3 million backlog. How will you address this backlog and increase the efficiency of the immigration courts? Yeah, this, this is an extraordinarily uh, serious problem. You know, looking from my uh, uh, pampered perch as an appellate judge who uh, has a limited number of cases and uh, weeks and weeks to study those and then weeks and weeks to write those. I can't imagine uh, how judges uh, can operate under the conditions that uh, you describe uh, and that I, I have uh, heard uh, even from other judges exist. Um, when I get into the department, if I'm confirmed, I will uh, certainly look into what can be done about this. Um, uh, I suppose this must mean an increase in the number of uh, resources and judges. It uh, uh, must mean some ability to, uh, to give to the judges to prioritize uh, their cases. Um, even in our uh, own appellate uh, uh, courts, we have uh, developed ways in which we handle some cases uh, more swiftly and some cases uh, take longer, some cases are summarily resolved, some uh, require full opinions. Um, uh, some way of evaluating this uh, is required, uh, but I can't give you any specific exam uh, idea with respect to court administration, which I know something about, but not an enormous about, uh, until I have a chance uh, uh, to get into the department if confirmed uh, and uh, to understand uh, what the cause of this huge backlog and number of cases is. There is an executive office for our immigration review that oversees these, but I think the really important thing is an acknowledgement that uh, this kind of serious backlog has got to be addressed and we, because lives are at stake here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rono. We're going to break now and come back at five minutes after three. 
a break in today's hearing of Merrick Garland to be the next Attorney General of the United States. We're in the midst of a second and final round of questioning from senators, questions lasting five minutes each, generally. This is a special report from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. We've got about 15 minutes here until the hearing resumes. With me this afternoon, Washington Post reporters Rhonda Colvin and Mary Beth Albright. Um, so Rhonda, just give our viewers a sense of how this is working now. We saw that longer round of questioning. This one seems to be a little more freewheeling. Um, Senator Kennedy of Louisiana seems to be stretching his five minutes to their very maximum there. Um, wh what are we doing here? How much longer do we anticipate senators being able to have this back and forth with the nominee? Not quite sure how long this will take, but this is what they're calling the lightning round. So they finished up the uh, eight minute question round, which was what the earlier part of the day was about. Those are the formal questions about those things that are top of mind for these senators that they want to present to Merrick Garland. Now it's a sort of a grab bag where uh, senators are able to ask just pretty much anything that they feel needs to be followed up on. So what we are seeing is sort of um, uh, very different questions from, from everyone. You uh, heard uh, Macy Hirono from Hawaii talk about the deaths of indigenous women, how he might handle investigations into that. You mentioned uh, Senator Kennedy from Louisiana. He talked about implicit bias. It wasn't clear how uh, he was matching that to anything uh, related to Merrick Garland's experience, but they basically had a very interesting back and forth about bias and racism. It actually reminded me of uh, some line of questions questioning from the Amy Coney Barrett hearing when she sat in front of this committee and uh, discussion of bias in the judicial uh, community was brought up by Cory Booker and I believe Republicans also talked uh, about that as well. So uh, it, it was a very interesting and somewhat unrelated uh, moment there with Senator Kennedy. Uh, but that's what we are in right now is sort of this, you know, last round of ask him what's on your mind, ask him, you know, anything that you didn't get to put in your formal line of questioning earlier so you're likely going to see for the rest of this day just all sorts of questions uh, related to things that these senators care about uh, what we saw from Dick Durbin when he started the lightning round he asked a lot of questions about um, reform in uh, the Department of Justice, uh, namely when it comes to mass incarceration and discrimination uh, in policing. And he wanted uh, Merrick Garland to continue to express some of the things that he had already talked about when it comes to civil rights and, and how that plays out in the DOJ. So uh, right now we're just waiting for them to come back and, and uh, the leader of this committee, Dick Durbin, said they will continue on in this uh, lightning round until they're finished. That's right. Uh, the chairman joking that only in the Senate could lightning rounds be, you know, five minutes plus really um, in this. And Rhonda, we are seeing a sense of the priorities that these senators have, including Senator Klobuchar uh, talking about the Violence Against Women Act. So it is a chance to get that uh, another beat, another moment to, to get your priorities uh, aired here in this very public forum. Um, uh, let's bring Mary Beth Albright into the conversation, a reporter, also uh, a lawyer. Mary Beth, what's standing out to you today in this Q&A process? Libby, I am loving this. I, I, I think this is so interesting. Um, the the conversations about uh, legal process, the, the conversations about what is equal justice, with a few things that Merrick Garland said about equal justice. Number one, focus on crimes that really matter. That's a really interesting thing for an attorney general, um, an incoming attorney general to say, um, that we need to focus more on violent crimes and less on you know, marijuana possession or crack cocaine possession. Um, number two, that uh, it, it's about changing uh, the charging policies. So I thought this was really interesting that um, don't ask for the highest offense that you possibly can and don't ask for the highest sentence that you possibly can. Again, this is a very, it goes back to at the very beginning of his opening statements when just, when uh, Merrick Garland was talking about kindness. I think he's looking to bring that humanity to the Justice Department um, and seeking the elimination of mandatory minimums, reducing sentences um, that, that have already been given. It's really interesting stuff. What I really respect about his comments were um, when he said that, that when he's talking about the death penalty, he's gotten a lot of federal death penalty questions. And when he talks about the death penalty and says, yeah, you know what, I, I searched for it uh, in the Oklahoma City bombing case. Um, I think that was the right thing to do at the time. And in the past 25 years, there's been a lot of information about how 
um, disproportionately the justice system treats um, people of color. And I'm reconsidering that. I, I mean, that's the kind of honesty and integrity that I think um, that I that I think is refreshing in the legal system that has undergone a little bit of battery in the past few years. Um, I think his centrist self is coming out, certainly when he talks about um, focusing on objective facts and law. What One thing that I thought the Justice Department career attorneys are really cheering over is when he was defending um, people who are coming up uh, for confirmation um, next week, uh, who are going to be his deputies. They won't be career attorneys, but, um, but knowing that he has your back, I think, um, is a big deal uh, in, a, in a department. Let's bring in Matt Zapatowski into the conversation. He covers the Justice Department for The Washington Post. So, Matt, give us the headlines, the big takeaways. Uh, what have we learned that really stands out for what a Justice Department under Merrick Garland would look like? So to me, I think there are three big headlines. One is the obvious one, right? That the January 6th attack on the Capitol is absolutely going to animate the Merrick Garland Justice Department. That there's gonna be a real crackdown on domestic terrorism, that there's gonna be a real crackdown on white supremacy, and that he's even going to explore possibly the Justice Department backing new laws in this front. You know, there has been a, a long running debate about whether there needs to be a specific criminal charge for domestic terrorists. There does not exist that now. Or maybe other legal steps uh, that Congress could pass, the Justice Department could take to crack down on domestic terrorism. And Garland signaled an openness to that because this January 6th attack on the Capitol has been so transformative. Two is he just is refusing to give an inch in terms of any commitments on these politically sensitive, high-profile investigations. Republicans asked him a lot about the Durham investigation. This is looking at the FBI's 2016 investigation of um, the Trump campaign and possible ties to the Kremlin. You know, he just wouldn't commit to, to keeping Garland around, to giving Garland resources. The most he would offer is sort of, well, I need to talk to him, and I see no reason that he shouldn't be allowed. And similarly, with the investigation of Hunter Biden, I, I need to be briefed up on that case. I see no reason that it couldn't continue, but no specific commitment. And that is different than you saw with Bill Barr, say, in the Mueller investigation. He sort of publicly committed to letting the Mueller investigation finish. Democrats would tell you they were quite unhappy with the way it finished. And then three, I think the death penalty stuff is very important. You know, Merrick Garland signaled today that it's likely that the department might reimpose a moratorium on the death penalty. If it works like it did in the Obama administration, which he sort of referenced back to, that would be that they would continue to seek death penalties in some cases, but they wouldn't actually execute the penalty. Perhaps we'll see Joe Biden go further. Merrick Garland did sort of indicate he would be deferring to the president on that question, but whatever the president decided, he would support because that's sort of a policy question as opposed to what is the law question. So for me, those are the three big takeaways. The animation of January 6th, uh, the death penalty, and then on these politically sensitive cases, just suggesting they would proceed apace, but not offering any firm all right, Matt Zapatowski talking with us. Let's go back to Mary Beth Albright. Mary Beth, this morning we got breaking news from the U.S. Supreme Court that it issued a ruling that essentially paves the way for a New York City prosecutor to obtain former President Donald Trump's tax returns and other financial records as part of a criminal investigation. It's a big blow to Trump's ongoing quest to conceal details of his finances. So what happens next? Well, this has been going on for a while. We know this, you know, he didn't, but the former President Trump didn't want to reveal any of his uh, financial records for a long time. This particular subpoena has been going on for more than a year that they've been um, trying to get him to turn over the past eight years of his tax records. This is significant for a few reasons to the conversation that we're having right now um, about the Department of Justice. In a, it's for a grand jury, so those proceedings are secret. Um, but if there, and, and it's also a state proceeding, right? Because it's the Manhattan District Attorney that's trying to subpoena these. But if he gets those tax records, and he should now, there's there's no legal recourse. You just they they have to turn them over. If he went, if and when he gets these tax records, they're being kept secret within the grand jury. Um, if there is a prosecution. If, if, if there is a charge issued against former President Trump, those tax records will likely be made public. And once those are made public, 
the Department of Justice can use those. Um, and so I'd really be watching this um, to see if and when they, these are going to be turned over. I, I saw that um, our uh, colleague Jim Acosta had tweeted a, a statement from um, former President Trump saying he's going to continue fighting and we will win. Um, there's there's no legal recourse at this point. The the court said it, it's um, it's not overly broad. The the request for the subpoena for all eight years um, it's not harassment. There's no malicious intent. So it's it's tough to see where he could go from here. So I guess the question is how would that decision affect anything that the Justice Department could pursue? Right? How does that what happens in New York, how does that affect what happens on the federal level? Well, we don't, we have, once you have evidence, you can use it. <laughs> right now, because uh, former President Trump hasn't released any of these, we don't know specifically what is in his tax records. This, this subpoena is for his, um, his accounting firm to release the actual tax returns that they filed for Donald Trump. And so once we have those in the in the system, once you have those as evidence in, in New York State, if there is a charge made, again, right now it's going to be kept secret because it's a grand jury, but if there is an actual charge made, that evidence is going to be made public. And once that evidence is made public, the Department of Justice can pursue what they pursue. Uh, Rhonda Colvin, one of the questions that any Justice Department and any administration has to make, as well as any Congress, is how uh, backward looking do they want to be? How forward looking do they want to be? And you know, we are hearing a real focus on the need to figure out January 6th, right? Deconstruct what led up to the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, you know, find the responsible parties, bring people to justice. Um, but it's also fascinating to hear callbacks to the Obama administration, right? Um, criticisms and complaints of how Democrats acted during the Trump administration. So uh, there will be a question of just how hard Democrats go after former President Trump at this point for uh, those issues Mary Beth was just talking to us about, the financial records and things like that. Do we have any sense of where Merrick Garland would take a Justice Department in terms of investigating former President Trump? No, we don't. And I'm actually surprised that this question hasn't come up as much as we uh, thought before, uh, because the news with the, uh, the taxes from his accounting firm, Trump's accounting firm being subpoenaed, that's pretty big news. That's something that Democrats here on the Hill have been talking about and waiting for for a long time. So, And with that falling under the jurisdiction of the DOJ, I'm surprised that it hasn't really come up a lot among Democrats right now. But I'm also suspecting that within this panel, they don't want to sort of bring uh, sort of that partisan fireball into this by bringing Trump and his taxes or any sort of other illegalities into this hearing. They kind of want this to go along um, and run smoothly, which it for the most part has. So I'm wondering if that's why Democrats haven't really brought uh, any investigations into Trump, into their line of questioning with Merrick Garland. Uh, from what we can see, Merrick Garland, when he is talking about Hunter Biden or when he is talking about existing investigations, he is saying that he doesn't have enough information about those things, but he will seek it and, and he will make determinations later if they need to move forward or have more resources. So uh, he seems to be open to any sort of investigation that is about prior incidences or, or prior you know, executive officials. Uh, the other question, too, that's been brought up is uh, what about investigations into Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer? Will the DOJ look into things there, too? So uh, there are a lot of uh, what would seem like partisan issues that the Democrats could bring up in this panel, but it seems like they are kind of stepping aside from that right now mm -hmm. and trying to just highlight Mayor Garland's uh, abilities to run the DOJ and, and his long resume. Yeah, Matt, uh, you know, it all depends on who's in power, right? And because Democrats are in power, they're controlling the White House, they're controlling the House and Senate, um, it's not really in their interest to bring up Trump a whole lot in this context and try to sort of put Merrick Garland on the spot uh, in terms of how he would treat uh, possible transgressions by the former President Trump. Yeah, I have a, a few thoughts on that. One is that you've seen them hint at that. You know, when they ask about, well, will you charge not just the people who rioted at the Capitol, but those who incited them or possibly funded them? I think that's a subtle way of saying, will you get to the Trumps, the Giuliani's of the world who spoke on stage before this 
riot happened. Two, I think the Democrats sort of have rightly seen you're not going to get very far in getting Merrick Garland to commit to either initiating an investigation or stopping an investigation, right? Just as we've seen him deflect and deflect and deflect on Hunter Biden and on the Durham investigation, I don't expect if a, if a Democrat sort of outright asked him, what are you going to do about the Giuliani investigation? What are you going to do about investigating President Trump that he would give them an answer that would be relevant for you in any way? And I do think they might face some criticism for, you know, sort of living in the past instead of focusing on the things that Merrick Garland wants to do, just getting him to talk about, you know, investigating their political opponents. The Matt, Democrats I'm going to stop you there and, uh, and thank you. You summed that up quite well. Thank you. Um, thank you. We'll go back to the hearing room now. Chairman Durbin turning the microphone Sorry, over I on the phone, I said I was to going Chuck to Grassley. You a binder. I'm not going to ask you to come up and give it, and I'm not going to take it down to you, but I'll have my staff give it to you of letters going back to the last two years of the Trump administration that haven't been answered by the department, and also maybe just a very few letters of the recent administration. So I hope that you will do what you can to get those answers. So six months from now, I don't blame you. It's uh, the fact that the Trump people didn't answer it. I, I would like to keep the blame on the, my predecessor. Okay. Yes, Senator. Thank you. And then I'm going to say something about your uh, answering questions for us. <clears throat> and this goes back now that I'm ranking member. I want to give you a quote that I said to Senator Sessions when he was sitting where you are. And if Senator Feinstein contacts you, do not use this excuse, as so many people use, that if you are not a chairman of a committee, you do not have to answer the questions. I want her questions answered just like you would answer mine. So I hope that uh, whether I'm ranking member or chairman of the committee, you will help me uh, get answers to the questions, and I hope Senator Durbin will do the same thing. I will not use any excuse to not answer your question, Thank Senator. You. And then the other thing is uh, just uh, uh, I don't want to dwell on Durham, but uh, several people have asked you, and you've given the same answer, and I understand why you give that answer, but would it be impossible for you to have some sort of a briefing on Durham between now and the time you get our written answers back so you could give us a more definitive answer? So I, I don't think it's appropriate. I mean, I assume, um, among other things, that uh, the Durham I'll, investigation... I'll, I'll accept your answer. Okay. You don't need to go any further. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then let's go to a subject of domestic terrorism. And that... Uh, in, Obviously, in a democracy, we need to be able to disagree with each other without violence. Political extremism, the willingness to use violence to advocate one's political views on either side is a threat to our democracy. The Capitol attack shows us that very directly. Uh, I think you've answered this question, and, and uh, so just a very short answer. I think you've assured all of us that the Justice Department has all the necessary resources to investigate and prosecute all cases connected to the attack on the United States Capitol. I can't yet say we have all the resources. Um, I, 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 what I th said was I would I would uh, look into the question of whether we. I just don't know. Okay. But uh, we certainly have uh, we certainly have authorities to look into it. Uh, whether we have the money and the and the and the person power, I just don't know yet. Okay. Then likewise, in the previous year, there have been numerous attacks, not only on other institutions of the government, like the White House and the Federal Courthouse in Portland, but on hundreds, if not thousands, of police officers who were injured, as well as on fellow citizens and their businesses, particularly small businesses. The Justice Department op opened over 300 domestic terrorism cases due to that violence and started an anti-government extremism task force. So I hope you could commit absolutely as you did for the Capitol rioters, that you will see those investigations of the 2020 riots and continuing Antifa uh, riots in the Pacific Northwest through to the very end. Um, I, I, okay, the, the, the Justice Department, I think, 
Director Ray said it exactly right, which is we investigate violence. We don't care about ideology. Okay. There are investigations going on like those, and of course they're going to continue. Okay. And then uh, taking off a little bit what you referred to what the FBI said, former Attorney General Barr noted that the FBI, while it had robust programs for white supremacism, supremacism and militia extremism lacked a similar infrastructure for anarchist extremism cases. Former acting uh, Department of Homeland Security Secretary Wolf stated that this may have contributed to law enforcement being blindsided by the civil unrest that, became, uh, that began in 2020. So I hope that I can get you to say that you'd be willing to review your anarchist extremism program for weaknesses and fixing those weaknesses based upon what Barr said that the FBI said that they had better programs to, con to go after white supremacy uh, than they did other anarchist extremism. Uh, you know, I think we need to go after violence uh, from whatever direction, left, right, up, down. It doesn't make any difference. We need to go after uh, oh, uh, to go after that. I think what Director Ray had said was the uh, um, what he was uh, most concerned about uh, was the rise of uh, uh, white supremacist extremism as an element of domestic terrorism. But it doesn't matter uh, what direction it comes from. It doesn't matter what the ideology is. We have to investigate it. I guess my time's up. Huh? I'm going to have a lot of questions for answer. I'm going to have a lot of questions for answer in writing. Fair enough. So I'm. I want to try to give an indication of the sequence. Dick Blumenthal is going to be next, and then on the Republican side, I think it's going to be John Cornyn. Then it'll either be Senator Ossoff or Senator Booker. Uh, they can arm wrestle until I have to make that decision. And then Senator Cotton, I believe, you were the next arrival. This has become kind of a, a little difficult to predict uh, the sequence. I want to make sure you see it coming. I, I would never want a rookie senator to go between Cotton and Cornyn, so I'll go there. <laughs> senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to pursue a couple of the questions that I was asking when we ran out of time, uh, just to say that on the issue of climate change, President Biden, as a candidate, committed to hold accountable the oil and gas industry for any lies or fraud they had committed in denying the effects of climate change. And I hope you'll take that into consideration in determining what the Department of Justice will do in those kinds of cases, pursuing any kind of pollution or climate change or lies in connection with the oil and gas industry. And just to kind of ask a threshold question, uh, do you have any doubt that human beings are a cause of climate change? No. No doubt at all. Thank you. Uh, you, you may That wasn't call. a trick question, I guess. It wasn't a trick question. Okay. I ask it because uh, the last major nominee before this committee, back in September, it was a Supreme Court nomination, seemed to have some trouble with that question, but I'm glad you don't. Uh, let me move to this, the issue of racial discrimination, which has been pursued, and I really welcome your very sincere and passionate commitment to ending racism and racial injustice. Uh, we're in the midst of a racial justice movement right now. One of the areas that most concerns me is holding accountable public officials when they violate individual rights and liberties. As you know, Section 242 makes it a federal crime to willfully deprive a person of their constitutional rights while acting under color of law, but prosecutors have to show that that public official had a specific intent to deprive constitutional rights, which, as you also know, is a pretty high bar. I believe, and I have advocated that we, in effect, lower the state of mind requirement, Section 242, from willfully 
to knowingly or with reckless disregard because this stringent mens rea requirement makes Section 242 prosecutions rare or impossible. And so I hope you agree that we need to adopt measures that will enable criminal accountability where all of the elements of the crime are committed and the mens rea intent requirement can, in effect, fit the crime. Well, uh, what I can agree is that I'll consult with the uh, uh, career lawyers uh, in the uh, Civil Rights Division who are the ones who are, would be uh, bringing these cases and who have brought them in the, few, in the past. I, I honestly just don't know. Um, uh, I, I know everyone says that, it, that they're very difficult to make. I, I, on the other hand, uh, in the Clinton administration, we did successfully make quite a number of those cases. So I, I'd like to know um, from talking to them um, what kinds of changes might be necessary in the statute um, and what the consequences of changing the mens rea requirement would be. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to ask you, uh, about Section 230. I've proposed various measures, one of them actually adopted in law and signed by the President, that imposes accountability on the big tech platforms for certain kinds of really horrific material, human trafficking mm -hmm. under SESTA, and Senator Graham and I have led an effort it's called the Earn It Act to hold accountable the tech companies for spreading child sexual abuse material. Uh, I think reform of Section 230 is long overdue. I led these kinds of targeted and indeed bipartisan efforts to revise Section 230 to hold big tech accountable. And I hope that you will consider joining with the Congress in those kinds of targeted, deliberate efforts to reform Section 230, which no longer fits the world that currently it applies to. So um, I, I don't know that much about 230, except for the case I mentioned that, that I worked on myself, which was a pretty direct application of the, of the provision. I know that a number of members, including uh, you, spoke to me about this in, in our meetings, and I know people have different w uh, views about how it should be altered. Um, I, I really would have to study that, but I'm very eager to study that. There's no doubt the Internet has changed uh, from uh, when 230 was originally adopted. Um, so um, I, I would be eager and interested in studying it and, and speaking with the members about it. Great. Thank you very much. Jeff. Thanks, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Cornyn. Judge, are you familiar with Title 42, which is a public health measure which restricts uh, traffic across the international border uh, as a public health measure to mitigate the spread of COVID-19? Are you familiar with that? I, I, I don't know the statute specifically. I, you know, I, I know that there must be uh, provisions that do that, but I, I don't know the statute, no. Well, one of the things I hear from the Border Patrol and Customs and Border Protection is they're fearful that when the current Title 42 restrictions on cross-border traffic are lifted, there will be no plan uh, in its place and certainly no transition to get back to normal uh, cross-border trade traffic and uh, visit. And this is a huge issue that I've raised with the with the Director Mayorkas and others as well, and I just want to make sure that's on your radar screen. But I also want to take up what uh, Senator Hirono was talking about, the 1.2, 1.3 million asylum cases that are backlogged. Uh, there's no way that the United States government is ever going to clear that backlog, but I would want to suggest to you that that, was, that is part of a conscious strategy by the cartels who, uh, who make a lot of money moving people across the border into the United States along with drugs, uh, whether it's human trafficking, uh, whether it's, uh, as I say, drugs, whether it's uh, just uh, migrants who are trying to flee uh, poor economic circumstances and dangerous conditions in their home country. But if the Biden administration is not going to enforce uh, current laws with regard to uh, immigration, and there are many people suggesting, including the nominee for Health and Human Services, that we ought to give free health care to people who are not legally in the country. 
All of this is going to be a huge incentive for more and more people to immigrate illegally into the United States. And obviously, the Department of Justice has a very important role to play there. But I, I want to suggest this is not an accident. This is not a coincidence. This is part of a conscious strategy by the cartels who are enriched uh, by each and every person, each and every load of drugs that comes across the border. And I hope that you will commit to working with me and all the other members of Congress uh, to try to address this uh, humanitarian and public health crisis in addition to the other aspects of immigration. Will you uh, agree to do that? Certainly, I will commit to working with members of Congress to address the public health crisis. Um, um, I have to say, I'm, I, I wasn't aware that the cartels were doing this, but this is, seems like uh, something that the Justice Department needs to focus on. Well, at different, t different times, it's referred to as transnational criminal organizations, uh, cartels. Basically, it's for people who are engaged in criminal enterprises for money. Mm -hmm. uh, that's. That's why they do it. They care nothing about the people uh, that they leave, some to die en route to the United States. Uh, they, all they care about is money. So I appreciate your willingness to work with uh, me and others about that. China and Russia, to a lesser extent, have um, perfected cyber espionage on the United States for many reasons, but in part to steal our intellectual property. The billions of dollars that Congress appropriates uh, for development of the next generation uh, stealth fighter to um, nuclear modernization, uh, you name it, uh, if the Russians and the Chinese can get it without making those investments, then the years-long delay necessary to, uh, to, to roll them out, uh, they have a tremendous advantage in terms of competing with us economically and also militarily. Uh, 80% of the all economic espionage cases brought by the Department of Justice uh, involve uh, the communist, uh, communist China. And uh, there are at least some nexus to China in about 60% of all trade theft cases. I've told people that uh, Director Ray, uh, who's a pretty stoic individual, gets positively animated when he begins to talk about the role that China is playing and its rivalry with the United States, both from an economic standpoint, and if you look at the South China Sea and some of its aggressive and boisterous actions there with the potential for military conflict at some future, this is our number one, number one challenge, I believe, uh, today as we speak here. Do you, do you share my concerns about uh, China's uh, role as a rival in the world, what they're doing in terms of stealing intellectual property, what that means to us economically and from a national security perspective? Uh, well, Senator, I don't have any uh, inside information with respect to what the intelligence agencies know, but I've read uh, uh, quite a lot about this, and I'm, uh, it seems quite clear to me that uh, the, the Chinese are involved in uh, hacking of stealing uh, our intellectual property. Um, uh, we're in an age where individual espionage um, prosecutions don't, co don't quite cut it, uh, given uh, the internet and uh, how uh, uh, so much can be stolen in, in, in just a single hack. So this has to be an all of government uh, response uh, to this problem. Um, there has to be a forward look as to what's happening to us. There has to be a defensive look. I know that that's the purpose of Cyber Command. Uh, that's some, certainly something that the DNI is very concerned about, and then, of course, the FBI with respect to enforcement. But this is a dangerous problem for all the reasons you said, uh, and it requires a whole-of-government response. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Cornyn. Uh, based on who is present and apparently interested, it'll be Senator Booker, Senator Cotton, Senator Ossoff, Senator Hawley. Those are the ones I see. So. Senator Booker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the grace of Senator Ossoff for allowing me to go before him. Um, I'd love to just jump in real quick, if I may, and um, a lot of been to talk about your incredible work with the Oklahoma City bombing, but I'm also aware that you have a long record of working on domestic terrorism in pretty significant ways. Uh, in the mid-1990s in a response to a wave of bombings and arson attacks against black churches in the South and other houses of worship, the Clinton administration formed a national task force where you and your leadership 
along with others, helped to make this uh, Justice Department priority, resulting in several hundred investigations and arrests. And I, I just really appreciate the totality of your record on fighting domestic terrorism. I do just really quickly uh, just wonder, just in terms of proportionality, um, since that time till now, uh, we've seen just this rise of uh, right-wing uh, terrorist attacks in our country. In fact, since 9-11, the majority of domestic terrorist attacks have been right-wing extremist groups. The majority of those have been white supremacist groups. And I'm just hoping, and again, you're not in the position, God willing, you will be, but just the proportionality of the resources we are directing towards trying to stop, stop the scourge of domestic terrorism. Uh, is this something that you will look at as in terms of the degree of the resources of the agency? Yeah, as I say that, I think the first thing I should do um, uh, as part of the, uh, my briefings on the Capitol bombing, our briefings with um, Director Ray as to where he sees the biggest threat and uh, whether the resources of the Bureau and of the Department are allocated towards uh, the biggest threat and the most uh, dangerous and direct threat. Um, we do have to be careful across the board. We, we can never, uh, you know, let, let uh, somebody sneak around uh, the end um, because we, we're not focusing, but we also have to allocate our resources towards the biggest threat. Great. And I'd like to shift back to marijuana. I was, our earlier conversation, we were talking about the systemic racism there that has, I've watched tons of friends in elite colleges not worrying at all about being arrested for marijuana while the inner city black and brown community I live into, it's a much different reality, much different set of laws applying to them. But I actually want to get to the, the, the good news, I think, in the United States of America is that red states, blue states, America, general, if you want to call those states that way, or American states are moving towards more and more legalization, medical marijuana, loosening up of laws, decriminalization. It's an amazing thing. But the federal government is out of step with that, right, as of now. And I hope to work in a bipartisan way to see if we can advance the federal government, maybe to delist the legislation, think of some restorative justice elements. Just today, New Jersey signed its first major um, uh, effort at legalization and restorative justice. But one thing I, that was done uh, by the um, Obama administration was uh, putting forward a the Cole Memorandum, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, but Attorney General Jeff Sessions rescinded the Cole Memorandum, which gave guidance to U.S. attorneys that the federal marijuana prohibition should not be enforced in states that have legalized marijuana in some form. Um, and so do you think that the guidance in the Cole Memorandum to deprioritize marijuana enforcement should be reinstated? Uh, um, that is, should the Justice Department respect states' decisions on marijuana policy? So I don't have every element of the Cole Memorandum in mind, but I do, do uh, remember it and uh, I have read it. This is a question of the um, uh, prioritization of our, our resources and prosecutorial discretion. It does not seem to me a useful um, um, uh, uh, use of uh, limited uh, resources that we have to be pursuing uh, prosecutions in states that have legalized uh, and, re and that are regulating uh, the use of marijuana, either medically or otherwise. I don't think that's a useful use. I do think we need to be sure that there are no end runs around the state laws that criminal enterprises are doing. So that kind of uh, enforcement uh, uh, should be continued. But I, I don't think it's, uh, it's a good use of our resources uh, where states have already authorized. And it only confuses people, obviously, uh, within the state. So really quickly, the violence against black trans Americans is uh, unconscionable with many murders every single year. The bullying and violence against a lot of uh, trans children, um, about a, a third of LGBTQ American children report missing school because of fear, fear of violence and intimidation. Uh, is this something that you will um, uh, uh, make a priority to protect um, all children from uh, violence and discrimination, uh, uh, is particularly in this case, uh, transgender children, and uh, transgender children. And would you uh, also uh, commit to taking seriously the targeting of uh, uh, transgender adults, specifically with the trend we're seeing with the alarming numbers of murders of, of black, tran black transgender women? These are hate crimes, and uh, it's the job of the Justice Department to stop this, uh, to find them, to enforce, and to penalize. And that's what the uh, section of the, uh, uh, the special um, litigation unit in the um, uh, Civil Rights Division uh, is intended to do. 
There is the Shepherd um, uh, Bird um, Act, which was particularly aimed at this, and I, I think it's, fun uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it needs broadening, but it's clear to me that this kind of uh, hate, hate, hateful activity has to stop, and yes, we need to put resources into it. Thank you for your time. I look forward to voting for your confirmation, and I'm gonna stop here because I do not want to make Tom Cotton mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the remaining senators for five minutes each Senators Cotton, Ossoff, Hawley, and now Senator Whitehouse is going to make a return. Senator Cotton? Judge, I want to return to where we stopped this morning, the question of uh, racial equality, specifically uh, race discrimination in higher education. Last year, the Department of Justice sued <coughs> Yale University for discriminating against students on the basis of race. Based on Yale's own data, if you look at one of its top academic categories when you control for academic achievement, the admission rates by racial category were as follows. Asian Americans, 6%, white applicants, 8%, Hispanics, 21%, African Americans, 49%. Do you think that evidence suggests discrimination based on race in Yale's admissions process? So again, I, I'm, my best recollection is that uh, between my nomination and now, the department has uh, made a decision about that. The case was voluntarily dismissed on February 3rd. It's no longer a pending case. So, so my recollection is correct. So. Uh, these kind of cases obviously uh, depend on application of the Supreme Court's opinion in the Gritter case and the Fisher case. And um, they require um, uh, a lot of factual uh, uh, development and examination of the facts. Uh, these cases do not only depend on, uh, the sti on uh, sti dis disparate uh, uh, statistics, uh, but uh, on all the factors the Supreme Court instructed uh, the lower courts and the government as to what kinds of affirmative action in uh, higher education are permissible and which ones aren't. So I can't, uh, I honestly can't draw any conclusions uh, without knowing the facts of, of the case. So some of that Supreme Court case law about racial discrimination in higher education says that race can only be used as a plus factor. It can't be decisive in practice. It can't be a defining feature. It can't be the predominant factor. When Asian American kids are eight times less likely to be admitted in the same band of academic achievement, you don't think that at least suggests a facial case of racial discrimination? Well, I think that's, that's the question that uh, you look at for the underlying uh, facts to know. I, you are, I think, uh, I don't remember exactly the words of the Supreme Court opinions, but they seem pretty much exactly you know, what, what, what you just said. You can't have a rigid uh, quota. You can't have a fixed, uh, uh, this was the consequence of, of the uh, Gratz case, uh, which uh, was the companion case to Gritter. Gritter was the, um, uh, University of Michigan Law School, Gratz was University of Michigan uh, as a university. Uh, with respect to Gritter, the court said it was a holistic approach and was permissible. With respect to Gratz, it said it was a fixed ratio or a fixed uh, number and not permissible. Uh, but those are things you find out by uh, discovery uh, in the <coughs> case and uh, examination of uh, what the actual practices of, of the university were, and I have no idea what they were. Judge, did anyone in the Biden administration consult with you about the decision to drop the lawsuit no. against Yale University? No, I've, I have assiduously kept out of those. It's not, my, it's not appropriate uh, for me to be examining anything like that unless you confirm me. Will the Department of Justice, uh, under your leadership, pursue cases of obvious racial discrimination in higher education? Well, if you put it that way, the answer is, of course, yes. Obvious well, I, I think this presents an obvious case of discrimination against Asian Americans. I, I suspect some Asian American parents and their kids are a little disappointed in those answers, Judge. I want to turn to the... I just want to say I'm only giving the answer to uh, uh, what the Supreme Court said the law was. I can't do any better than that. Eight, eight times less likely to be admitted? All I, my answer was you have to look at the facts inside. Okay, I, I want to turn to another very important topic, which is the rising rates of violent crime in the country. According to FBI's crime statistics, only 45% of violent crimes in this country result in an arrest. Would it be better or worse if 100% of violent crimes in this country resulted in arrest and prosecution instead of just 45%? It would be better if, uh, if you gave, uh, if, if, if the Congress gave the department enough money to arrest every single uh, person? I, I, I assume you're talking both about state crimes and, fe and federal crimes. That's according, yes, to Department yeah. of Justice, FBI crime statistics, uh, So those are almost all, or a large percentage are talking about local crimes. So, do you, do you yes, think the, do you better think the department... To, uh, do you think the department today solves too many crimes or prosecutes too many criminals? The Justice Department? Yes. 
I think it, it may uh, bring charges in areas uh, which are uh, not a good allocation of its resources, but I don't think it has sufficient resources to, uh, and probably never will, to pursue every crime. That seems impossible. One final point, Judge, I just want to get on the record. We spoke about this last week in our telephone call um, about the importance of state and local law enforcement to work together in a collaborative and cooperative fashion, right. or fashion with the Department of Justice, both its local U.S. attorneys and the law enforcement over agencies that you oversee. I was glad to know that you agree with me. Those partnerships are vital to reduce crime and keep our community safe. I just wanted to have, give you the chance to put that on the record today. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, my experience in Oklahoma City was close cooperation with the DA's office, the local police there, and with the governor and with the state police. Um, I think these joint task forces are an ex exceedingly good idea. They're a force multiplier. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm completely on board with this. Yes, sir. Thank you, Judge. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi again, Judge Garland. I uh, want to return to the question uh, of the Department's authorities and mission to defend voting rights. And uh, note that Sunday would have been Congressman John Lewis's 81st birthday. And as you know, he committed his life and indeed nearly lost his life in the struggle for voting rights. But as we speak, Georgia's state legislature is considering legislation that would make it harder for Georgians to vote. For example, to end Sunday early voting, uh, which is used heavily by black and working class voters, to cut the window during which voters can participate via absentee ballot, which would make it harder for seniors to vote. And I'm not asking you to comment on these specific bills, but what I'm hoping you can provide is an assurance that the Department of Justice will diligently and fully enforce constitutional and statutory guarantees of the rights to vote. I give you my complete assurance. Yes, Senator. Thank you so much. I'd also like to discuss with you uh, resources available for public defender's offices around the country. And uh, a visit to a municipal court in any major American city will reveal that uh, a steady stream of low-income defendants lacking the resources to hire their own attorneys are often represented by overworked and under-resourced public defenders, um, which contributes to class and race bias in the justice system and, in my view, is an affront to the constitutional guarantee of due process as well as of equal protection. So will you work with my office and this committee to determine whether grant programs which may already exist at the department to support local public defender's offices or may, which may need to be created can be considered in legislation that this committee and the Senate uh, may consider. I, I will, Senator. There is no equal justice in the United States unless everybody has equal access to justice. My own experience, uh, our federal public defender's office is terrific. Uh, needs uh, resources, uh, the federal public defenders across the country. I've tried my best uh, when I was in an administrative position to provide as um, uh, many resources as possible. The same for our lawyers who uh, volunteer under the Criminal Justice Act. Uh, the difference between having an, an excellent lawyer and not can make all the difference in the world. Um, and I, I think uh, we should give all the resources that we can. And with respect to the uh, uh, local um, um, uh, courts uh, and local public defenders would have to be through grant programs, but of course, uh, to, to the extent Congress is willing, I'm, I'm strongly in favor. Well, I appreciate that answer, and I, I look forward to working with you, I hope, and the chairman and ranking member uh, on those grant programs. And, and finally, I want to return to the discussion that we had earlier about pattern or practice investigations. <laughs> and I just want to urge you that if you are confirmed and as you take this office, and there will be so many demands on your time and your attention and important missions for the department to fight violent crime and to defend our national security, that you personally exercise leadership within the department to ensure that the Civil Rights Division's mission is elevated and emphasized, and that you come to this committee to seek and secure any resources that you need to make that real. And just to illustrate, why I believe that's so important. The South Fulton Jail in my home state of Georgia has been known to the public for years to have appalling conditions for incarcerated people. 
And actually, in the last month, a federal court ordered changes to practices within the jail. But it was after years of litigation. The U.S. Attorney's Office did file a brief in the case, but the litigation was brought by independent nonprofit plaintiffs. Years it took for changes to be ordered by a federal court. I'm going to read you a quote from the plaintiff's brief to illustrate the conditions in this jail. And I want to warn the public viewing this on television that the material is graphic. Quote, the cells were covered in bodily fluids, rust, and mold. In these conditions, the inmates deteriorated, leaving them incoherent, screaming unintelligibly, laying catatonic, banging their heads against walls, and repeatedly attempting suicide. This refers to the solitary confinement of women with severe psychiatric disorders in the South Fulton Jail in Georgia. And these conditions are not unique to this facility. So I want to urge you and ask you one more time, please, respectfully, Judge Garland, your commitment to elevate this mission within the department and to work to secure the human rights of incarcerated people and the American public with all of the power you'll have in this position. Well, uh, you have my commitment. Uh, the the uh, Civil Rights Division has responsibilities and some authorities in these areas. Um, and, and so is quite uh, capable of pursuing uh, these kinds of uh, cases. Um, I took to heart what uh, um, uh, chairman, um, um, uh, uh, the chairman said uh, with respect to uh, the role that uh, Robert Kennedy played when he was the attorney general. And um, I regard um, my responsibilities with respect to the um, uh, Civil Rights Division as uh, at the top of my uh, 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 major priorities lists. So uh, you have my commitment to do everything I can in this area. Thank you. And just with the chairman's indulgence, Judge, will you commit to reviewing any materials that are sent to you by Congress or by entities such as the NAACP or the Sovereign Center for Human Rights where it pertains to conditions of incarceration? So, uh, uh, so that I have some time um, to be able to read everything that I, I need to read. Uh, if it's all right with you, I'll commit to being sure that the head of the Civil Rights Division and the Associate Attorney General, uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Clark and Ms. Gupta, who are directly responsible, uh, do that and then brief me uh, about it. Um, I, I will, to the extent possible, uh, read them myself, but I've already committed to, to reading a 400-page uh, document, and there are only so many hours in my day understand the department's conditions, what I'm looking for. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Garland, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the law enforcement challenges at the border, which I know a number of other members have brought up with you. Just a, a fundamental question. Do you believe that illegal entry at America's border should remain a crime? Well, I haven't thought about uh, that question. Uh, uh, I just haven't thought about that question. I, I, I think, the, you know, the, the president has uh, made clear that we are a country of, uh, with the borders and with the concern about national security. Um, I don't know of a proposal to uh, decriminalize but still make it uh, unlawful to enter. I just don't know the answer to that question. I haven't thought about it. Um, it, will you continue to prosecute on unlawful border crossings? Well, uh, this is again a, a, a question of allocation of resources. Um, um, we will, uh, 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 the department uh, will uh, uh, prevent unlawful um, uh, crossing. Um, I don't know, I, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I just don't under, uh, know exactly what the conditions are and how this is uh, uh, done. I think if, um, um, I don't know what the current program even is with respect uh, to this. Um, if there, um, so uh, I, I assume that the answer would be yes, but I don't. I don't know what the uh, 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 issues around surrounding it are. Uh, let me ask you about uh, the guidelines on asylum eligibility. The issue as part of the Executive Office of Immigration Review. Uh, the your your predecessors have have issued quite a number of guidelines about asylum eligibility. Several senators, Senator Harono, I think Senator Cornyn talked about the very significant backlog that we have currently uh, in asylum cases. Will you continue to use, uh, keep in force, the current guidelines on asylum eligibility, or do you anticipate changing them? Uh, again, um, given my uh, uh, current professional uh, occupation, I, I've had no experience whatsoever 
uh, with the guidelines, so I can't give you a direct answer to that question. Uh, asylum is part of American law, and uh, the, uh, the Justice Department and the State Department have an obligation uh, uh, to, uh, to apply that law. I don't know what the guidelines are uh, that you're talking about, and I don't know even about the rescissions of guidelines that you're talking about. Um, will you, uh, if confirmed, I'm, I'm sure that you'll be reviewing this and considering these questions. Will you well, uh, pledge to keep us fully posted as you do so? Yeah, if there's a change in the government policy, if I'm confirmed, of, of course, uh, there will be a public change because you can't apply those kind of guidelines without making them public. Um, uh, let me turn to the subject of antitrust. Mm -hmm. I heard your answer to Senator Blackburn about the ongoing uh, Google antitrust prosecution. I believe your answer was you did not anticipate any changes in that ongoing prosecution, that it, the case would go forward. Did I hear you correctly? Is that right? I don't want to talk about a pending case because uh, it is, after all, a pending case, and it's just what a judge can't talk about. But uh, as is true with most of our investigations, I will, you know, when I get in. If I'm confirmed, I will examine them. But I don't have any reason to think that I would uh, stop uh, that kind of investigation. Uh, recent news, recently, news outlets, various news outlets have reported that Susan Davies is being considered to lead the DOJ antitrust division. Uh, Susan Davies, of course, has defended Facebook from federal antitrust laws. Facebook has been another target of antitrust scrutiny. Do you think it's appropriate to have someone who is a defender of these massive corporations leading the antitrust division? Well, let me say a number of things in response to this. First of all, the department has recusal rules, which prevents somebody uh, who had a role from um, uh, taking a role in a case like that. Uh, Susan Davies is a fantastic lawyer, a woman of enormous integrity. Um, and I have every confidence that were she in that division, uh, she would uh, proceed uh, as completely appropriate. But it turns out that the press reports are completely incorrect. So um, we can she's have not under consideration. No, not, that uh, I, not that I know of. No. Oh, and is and is not going to be, to the best of your knowledge. I assume it would be your decision. I don't. I don't look. I. I, I I don't think either she or I have aspirations for her to be in the antitrust division. So I, I'm not exactly sure with, where this came from, but she is a woman of remarkable ability uh, who has uh, uh, helped me in my uh, uh, previous role. And uh, I I'm, uh, would be very eager to rely on her good judgment and, uh, uh, and, her, and a woman of strong uh, ethical judgment. So if she were in a position, any position anywhere in the department, uh, she would know when to recuse or not. But this particular issue, I, 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 she's not, as far as I know, uh, she's not going to be in the antitrust division, not because uh, she wanted to be or I wanted her to be in there and because somebody said she couldn't. Good. Well, I, I think that that's news, I think, and, and welcome news. And I just want to register my own point of view here, which is I think that the recusal or not, the message it would send, the, the Google case is perhaps the most significant antitrust case the department has undertaken since Microsoft, uh, easily, maybe more significant than that, because Google, frankly, is significantly more powerful than Microsoft was. The message it would send to have a, a lawyer defending these well, massive I don't, companies I don't, and the, the antitrust division I don't division know who was sending terrible. this message um, or why this message was being sent, um, but uh, there is no... I don't have any intention of, of, of this, but I am confident that uh, had, had this been the case, this would not be a problem. Uh, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, a lot of the best antitrust lawyers in the country have some involvement one way or another in some part uh, of, uh, of uh, high tech. And uh, we can't exclude every single uh, good lawyer uh, from being able to be in the division. But that's not an issue, nothing you need to be concerned about. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Garland, I want to go back to the topic of protecting the Department of Justice from political influence and being weaponized politically. Uh, a number of Senate Democrats at this hearing have used the opportunity to cast aspersions to the job Bill Barr did as Attorney General. Um, I, I think those aspersions are false. I think he showed enormous courage in fighting to defend the rule of law. But Bill Barr, when explicitly asked about whether he would terminate Robert Mueller at his confirmation hearing, the same situation you find yourself, he said he would not terminate him absent, quote, good cause. Are you willing to meet the same standard of integrity that Bill Barr demonstrated? And will you make that same commitment to this committee that you will not terminate Mr. Durham 
absent good cause. Yeah. What I've said to committee and is, is, is that I need to uh, get information about this investigation, which I do not have here. I understand that a decision has been made to keep him in place, and I have absolutely no reason to doubt that that was the right decision and that he should be kept in place. But I can't go any further without uh, learning the facts of the investigation and uh, what the status is. So, that Judge, Judge Garland, with, with all due respect, and I recognize you've been a judge for 23, 24 years, uh, judicial nominees sit in that chair and, and decline to answer just about every question senators pose them as, as saying, well, as a judge, I can't commit how I would rule on, on any given case, and that's appropriate. You're not nominated to be a judge in this position. You are nominated to an executive position, and you're a constitutional scholar. You understand fully well the difference between attorney general versus an Article III judge. Bill Barr didn't know the details of the Mueller investigation at the time, but he knew that Bob Mueller was investigating President Trump, that it was highly politically sensitive. And so to show his integrity and commitment to being nonpartisan, he said he wouldn't terminate Mueller absent good cause. You have the opportunity to do the same thing. The investigation into Durham is highly political. It potentially implicates Joe Biden and Barack Obama. And I, I just want to be clear, you're refusing to give that same commitment you, you, you're, you want to keep the options open to, to terminate the, the investigation. Look, I'm not refusing to give that uh, commitment because I am a judge. I'm telling you what um, I think uh, uh, an, an attorney general ought to do, which is to look at the facts before making a decision. I'm also telling you that I will never make a decision in the department based on uh, politics or on partisanship. So whatever decision I were to make, it would not be based on that. And all I can ask you to do is trust me based on a record of uh, my 24 years as a judge, my entire career before that as a prosecutor, um, and my life before that. Now that's, that's my record of integrity, and that's what you have before you. So a similar line of questions that you were asked concerned the Google antitrust investigation. And, and Google, big tech as a whole, contributed over $15 million to the Joe Biden campaign. They're enormously important Democratic donors. There will be enormous political pressure to abandon that case against Google. Can you give this committee assurances that you can stand up to that political pressure just because yeah. Democratic fundraisers want to, want to be lenient on Google that the Department of Justice will not give in to that pressure. So, Senator Cruz, I'm old enough to remember when uh, there was a political effort to end the case in the Justice, and I trust case in the Justice Department against ITT, uh, which gives you an idea of how old this is, that there is no IT&T any, anymore, the International Telephone and Telegraph Company. This, uh, I, I, if I'm not wrong, this was uh, uh, one of the um, uh, paragraphs in the indictment, uh, the proposed indictment uh, um, of impeachment of uh, President Nixon, I think, but it was around the same time. And it had to do with a partisan effort uh, to influence the Justice Department and the Antitrust Division. I grew up knowing that this is uh, not something that is permissible for the Justice Department to do. And uh, my whole life has been in, in uh, uh, looking at Ed Levy and the uh, Watergate, uh, post-Watergate attorneys general who stood up to that kind of stuff. And I can assure you that there will, I don't care what kind of donor talks to me about what of anything. I don't expect to talk to any donors. I have no conflicts. I don't own any Google stock and I will do whatever is the right thing, and I don't own any stock, I, or I won't once uh, uh, if I'm... Let me ask two very quick questions, because yeah. my time is expiring. Yeah. Number one, you voted to rehear the Heller case, or actually the Parker case on Bonk. I did. Uh, I argued the Parker case in the D.C. Circuit. Um, as Attorney General, will the Department of Justice argue for the Supreme Court to overturn Heller versus District of Columbia? Look, uh, uh, the department, um, uh, uh, you know, makes all kinds of judgments like that. I, uh, uh, I, I can't promise, but I, can't, I find it hard to believe that the department could think that there was any possibility of overturning the Heller case. Okay, and then There's the final no one, with the chairman's indulgence, because I'm at the end of my time. Yeah, Nine senators wrote a letter to Chairman Durbin asking this committee to investigate Governor Andrew Cuomo's policies concerning COVID and sending COVID positive individuals into nursing homes, a senior aide of his 
admitted to a cover-up to hide information from the Department of Justice. You've committed to a number of investigations here at this hearing today. Will you commit to investigating the extent to which the government of New York broke laws or covered up their policies concerning COVID positive patients in nursing homes? With all, all of these investigations, the Justice Department is open to evidence of fraud, false statements, violations of the law. They normally begin in the appropriate way in the US, relevant U.S. Attorney's Office. And that is the way that, that uh, something like this, without commenting on this in particular, because I don't know the facts. But, but in this instance, the acting the U.S. attorney is the mother-in-law of the senior official in the Cuomo administration that admitted to the cover-up. Will you at least commit to not having the, the investigation done by a person with a conflict of interest? Of course. Uh, I, I, I don't know any of the facts, but I can guarantee you that somebody with a conflict <clears throat> of interest will not be the person running an investigation of any kind. Thank you. Since it is uh, appeared, reappeared, and then appeared again, this question about the uh, Durham Special Counsel. For the record, the President of the United States and the White House, when they reported their policy on the future of U.S. attorneys, made two exceptions, if I remember correctly. One was for the Delaware U.S. attorney, and the second one was in this situation with Durham. The administration is clearly committed publicly to allowing Durham to complete his investigation. I don't know that any additional comments are needed beyond that, though you've been asked many, many times that, that question. Uh, in terms of Secretary or Attorney General Barr, we do remember that he wrote an unsolicited memo questioning the legitimacy of the Mueller investigation before he was under active consideration for the uh, office of the Attorney General. Uh, I don't know why the other side keeps returning to this, but I think your position is consistent with the White House position and is uh, what we would expect of any attorney general when it comes to making an assessment after they learn the facts. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. And I may be the, am I the final questioner? Could be. So you, I may be all that stands between you and relief from these proceedings, Your Honor. <laughs> Um, I would summarize our earlier conversation um, as you uh, telling us that when we ask you questions or the department or the FBI questions, we're entitled to an answer. And if the answer is no, we can't tell you that, we're entitled to an explanation as to why you think that. Is that correct? Yes, that's right, Senator. Good. Um, I touched on the problem of executive privilege because the Department of Justice has a role as kind of an arbiter for the whole administration of executive privilege determinations. We, ha we had documents sent in here blank that had the phrase constitutional privilege stamped on them. No articulation of what constitutional privilege it was. We have had witnesses um, claim to assert executive privilege, but the administration never backed them up by actually asserting the privilege, so there was never actually a test of the proposition. Um, but our chairman wouldn't force an answer, so we were stuck. And I um, urge you to, maybe we should even have a hearing on it, think through what executive privilege ought to look like, what the process for declaring it ought to look like, and try to get that cleared up so that in this committee, we're no longer being treated the way we were in the last um, administration. Um, you, answer, you, you mentioned that false statements were a way that cases kind of traditionally came in, went to the U.S. Attorney first, worked their way up. There's one sort of strange anomaly, which is false statements to the IRS. The administration before this one took the view that a false statement to the IRS was something that they wouldn't look at unless it had been referred by the IRS. So I get the policy of not getting into criminal investigations of tax law without the IRS saying, hey, we'd like you to prosecute this. We are the tax law experts, and we really um, we have some equities here, and we, we either want you or don't want you to proceed criminally in this matter. I get that. When it's a plain <laughs> vanilla false statement, I did that as U.S. attorney. You did those cases. Anybody who served in, as a U.S. attorney has done those cases. Um, I'd urge you to reconsider 
a policy of deferring to the IRS before proceeding on a simple false statement case. Obviously, it'll be fact specific, but I, I flagged that uh, for you. Um, and the last point I'd like to make is, is that it seems to me, and I'll ask you to agree or disagree with the statement, it seems to me that failing to proceed, failing to proceed where an investigation or a prosecution is warranted and doing so on political grounds is just as bad as proceeding with an investigation or prosecution on political grounds. Would you agree that that's a yes. correct proposition? Of course, absolutely. Um, last of all, um, we all need something to believe in, I think. People who worked in the department um, very much believe in the Department of Justice. They believe in the merits and the norms and the values and the traditions of their service and of the department. Um, people across this country need to believe. And there was a lot that happened in the last administration to cause doubt about whether the Department of Justice met that standard. They were worthy of the public's trust and belief. Let me ask you as your closing comments to respond to how you view the importance of the public's trust and belief in the Department of Justice and your commitment to salvaging if necessary, restoring as needed, and upholding those ideals. Yeah, look, uh, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, it's not just uh, that the department has to do justice, it, that it has to appear to do justice, and that the people of the United States have to believe uh, that it does uh, justice. Otherwise, uh, people lose their faith in the rule of law. Uh, they take the law into their own hands. Uh, they become cynical uh, about uh, 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 law enforcement, uh, about, about public servants. Um, I would like, uh, uh, for the time that I'm in the Justice Department, uh, to turn down the volume um, um, uh, uh, on, the, on the way in which uh, people view the department, uh, that uh, the Justice Department not be the center of uh, partisan disagreement, um, uh, that uh, you know, we return to the days when the department does uh, its law enforcement and, and uh, uh, criminal justice policy, uh, and that uh, uh, this is viewed in a bipartisan way, which uh, for a long time in the history of the department, that's the way it was. Uh, I, I know that these are uh, divisive times. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm not naive, but I would like to do everything I can to uh, have people believe uh, th that that's uh, um, uh, what we're doing. Um, People will disagree, people on uh, the left side, the right side, the Democratic side, the Republican side, will disagree uh, with things uh, that I do. Uh, and and uh, that has happened as a judge. Uh, the only thing I can hope is that people will uh, understand that I am doing them, doing what I do, uh, because I believe it's the right thing and not out of some improper motive. Uh, that's the best I can ask. And uh, if you uh, uh, confirm me, and if at the end of my time people still uh, believe that, I, I will uh, consider that a singular accomplishment. Godspeed to you, sir. Judge Garland, uh, I'm going to say a few words about what the committee is going to do tomorrow in pursuit of your nomination, and then a few closing comments. Tomorrow, the second day of the hearing begins at 10 a.m. We'll hear from a panel of outside witnesses. Reminder that questions for record from uh, the senators on the committee must be submitted by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, February 24th. I hope people will show good faith and common sense in the number of uh, questions that they submit because you have been open now for two full rounds to ask whatever people have had on their minds. Let me say a few words in closing. My appreciation of your background is a little different than some. I know one of your earliest inspirations was a man named Abner Mekva who proceeded to serve with distinction all three levels of government uh, in the uh, federal branch, as well as his initial service in the Illinois House of Representatives. 
One of his closest friends and allies and colleagues over the years was a man named Paul Simon, who um, picked me up and dusted me off a few times when I lost elections and said, you'll get them next time. He was right. I eventually did, but it took a while. Uh, I knew Abner Mikva personally and through his relationship with my mentor, Paul Simon. They represented the very best in public service. Integrity, honesty, hard work, all of the above, time and again. We are lucky to be uh, heirs of that legacy, and I think that that has inspired both of us in our different pursuits of public service. When President-elect Biden told me that you were under consideration for this job, I thought instantly, this is the right person. At this moment in history, this is the right person to put in as Attorney General. The Department of Justice needs to have its morale restored. It needs to have its reputation restored. It needs leadership that is honest and we can respect from every corner of this country. You are that person. Your testimony today is evidence of that. I want to thank your family in particular. I don't know that they have, you mentioned it, but it's well worth repeating. Lynn, thank you for being here. Rebecca and her husband, Alexander, that would be Becky and Zan. And Jessica, Jesse, thank you for being here today in support of uh, an extraordinary person who is ready to serve again and uh, is being called by the president to be there at a moment in history when he's needed the most. This president has put faith in you, Judge Garland. We will do the same. Thank you again. I look forward to your swift confirmation. And with that, the hearing stands adjourned until 10 tomorrow. A gavel out by new Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Dick Durbin ending day one of Merrick Garland's confirmation hearing to be the next Attorney General of the United States. This is a special report from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. Joining me now to recap today, Washington Post reporters Rhonda Colvin and Mary Beth Albright. So Rhonda, we're saying day one, but this was really the heart of it. Uh, today is the day that we heard from Merrick Garland and he underwent that questioning tomorrow. Other witnesses speak on his behalf. Uh, but what are the major takeaways from this encounter he had with the senators, Rhonda? Well, I think today's major headline is that he said on day one that he will receive a briefing on January 6 investigations. He said he will be committed to following through with what the uh, Justice Department is already looking into when it comes to the insurrection. And that he also remarked that this is really a serious uh, part of his focus right now. Uh, domestic terrorism is going to be something he wants to devote a lot of resources to. And he said not only is it January 6th that we need to look into, but we also need to look at these groups and how they're operating around the country and uh, how uh, what type of strength they have to potentially do something similar again. So uh, his uh, words about January 6th and what he intends to do on day one, that's really the main takeaway uh, right now. And I think uh, senators from both sides of the aisle uh, felt assured that that is uh, one of his top focuses when he gets there, uh, uh, presumably within the next couple weeks. Uh, his nomination process and confirmation is moving pretty quickly. So as you said, today uh, was day one really of the whole process, uh, but this is the only day that he will be on the Hill. Tomorrow we'll uh, hear from outside witnesses. Uh, both the majority and the minority members of this committee are able to call witnesses uh, to talk about uh, what they know of him and his ability to do this job. Among the minority witnesses uh, is uh, Ken Starr, and uh, you'll all remember him as the independent counsel uh, for the uh, Clinton impeachment. Also, he was on the legal team of uh, Trump's first impeachment. He will be uh, one of the outside witnesses, and he was uh, very supportive of uh, Merrick Garland's nomination uh, for the Supreme Court uh, justice opening uh, when Obama had nominated him for that. So you're likely to hear um, some very collegial words from him and, and the other outside witnesses that will be there tomorrow. Uh, but overall, I, I think if Biden and the Democrats uh, wanted to portray Merrick Garland as the person uh, for this moment. I, I think that might have been accomplished today because you saw uh, both Democrats and Republicans t tell him that he had uh, the resume and, and the credibility for this job at this time. Mary Beth Albright, let's go to you. Um, as a trained lawyer, uh, what did you hear in terms of Merrick Garland being pinned down on 
ways he would lead the department or ways that Merrick Garland was able to deflect and say, you know, I can't answer that right now? Well, Libby, you know, Merrick Garland finally got his uh, day in the Senate, and I, I think it was a really good day for him. I'm really enjoying watching him. You know, he could just like get out the door and get out of there. He's actually just chatting with people, and um, I think that's that's kind of the the person that he is. Um, there were three big takeaways for me. Um, the first one is about his his focus on domestic terrorism and uh, civil rights enforcement. Um, that those are two things that we expect him to say, but even in his answers to all those questions, he really focused on it. So I, um, that was a huge takeaway for me that those will be top priorities. Number two, about the equal application of justice. And he got into the weeds on this, talking about sentencing minimums, talking about the death penalty and how his, how his interpretation of the death penalty has changed um, in his time as a judge, as he's seen justice applied to actual people. Um, and then the third thing I took away from this was um, there's a lot of sort of sleeper conversation about tech antitrust. And we all know that that's going to be a big issue this year, that there are going to be antitrust suits against the tech industry. But I did find it interesting, the conversations that happened between Garland and um, some of the senators about that. And look, it's a one of my favorite moments was um, when Senator Ted Cruz said to Merrick Garland, oh, remember this case? I argued it in front of your court. You know, that to me shows it is such a small legal world, right? That Ted Cruz, as a litigator, um, went and, and argued a case in front of um, Merrick Garland's court, in front of the DC circuit. I just think, um, to me, that's like the takeaway uh, of what how small the legal community is here in in Washington and in the United States, and I think um, Merrick Garland did a really good job of 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 comforting people and attorneys and citizens that um, there's going to be an equal application of the law. Well, while Merrick Merrick Garland did his best to not weigh in on many political issues today. Biden's nominee for attorney general was very clear on where he stood in regards to Donald Trump's immigration policy that separated families at the U.S. border. Let's watch. Senator, I think the oversight responsibility of this committee is one, is one of its very most important things. It's a duty imposed by the Constitution, and I greatly respect it. I think that the policy was shameful. I can't imagine anything worse than tearing parents from their children. And we will provide all of the uh, cooperation that we possibly can. Merrick Garland speaking earlier. Rhonda Colvin, I do want to point out that we saw an interesting exchange between Senator Josh Hawley and Merrick Garland talking about crossing the border and, and Hawley trying to get very specific about whether illegal entry at the border is a crime or should be a crime. And, and Merrick Garland really wouldn't commit to an answer there saying, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if a proposal to decriminalize it uh, is, on, is in the works, but make it unlawful to enter. He said, I haven't thought about it, which was sort of fascinating that he not only wasn't really taking a position, but saying he just hadn't thought about that situation, Rhonda. Yeah, that is interesting. And also uh, in his prep probably for this uh, hearing, you would think that he would go over an issue like that um, if he were looking at all the people who would be questioning him because Hawley has brought that question up about border policy, Trump's border wall. Uh, he's asked uh, uh, other Biden uh, nominees about that as well. That's been a big issue for Hawley. And Hawley is actually uh, the one Republican who has voted against all of Biden's uh, confirmations so far. So so uh, it, it wasn't uh, perhaps an unexpected question to hear a Republican member and especially Hawley to bring that up. But in the clip that was just played um, where he talked about uh, Trump's border policy and separating children from their families, he seemed to get a little emotional there. And I think we saw that a few times actually throughout the day. And, uh, you know, you've heard from his colleagues uh, that former colleagues with the DOJ, uh, those who have worked with him throughout uh, 
his entire career talk about his humanity, that yes, he is very, he adheres to the law, he loves the law, but they also remark about his humanity, that that was the one reason he decided to be the lead investigator on the Oklahoma City bombing case was because it involved kids. He had young kids at the time, uh, very similar in age to the kids that died in that, and that was what drew him there. And the humanity that he applied to that investigation was noted by uh, some of his colleagues who were asked about this nomination. So I think that exchange, too, that you just played uh, showed uh, some of the things we saw today with him, that he was expressing humanity. He was also invoking his own personal experiences and his family's background and how that applies to him being at this moment right now. Let's watch one of those exchanges that Rhonda was just talking about. Uh, this is when Senator Cory Booker was asking Merrick Garland about his personal motivation to combat hate crimes as Attorney General. And uh, watch the judge's response. You know, I come from a family where my grandparents fled anti-Semitism and persecution. The country took us in. and uh, protected us. And I feel an obligation to the country to pay back. And this is the highest, best use of my own set of skills to pay back. And so I want very much to be the kind of attor attorney general that you're saying I could become. Um, and I'll do my best to try to be that kind of attorney general. That's from earlier today. Uh, Rhonda Colvin, we also saw a bonding moment when it got personal between Senator John Ossoff, a freshman, a Jewish senator, uh, and Merrick Garland as they talked about uh, their immigrant story, their, their personal history in their past and that, that story of how their ancestors had come to this country. And, uh, and, and you did see that bonding moment as then Senator Ossoff pivoted right away uh, to talking about questions and getting to, to, to details of content, Rhonda. That's right. That was a, a very human moment as well. You don't get those <laughs> many times in these confirmation hearings. And, and it was interesting, too, to see sort of the split screen between those two because uh, Senator Ossoff is the youngest member, uh, a sitting member of, Congress, of uh, the Senate right now. He's 34. And then, of course, you have him talking about a shared experience with someone who has had decades worth of uh, history here in Washington. So that was a, a very human moment that they were able to, uh, to bond over. But again, Again, I think it highlights something that uh, uh, Biden, uh, in his thinking, in choosing Merrick Garland, uh, wanted him to be that attorney general that is far different from the ones that we had in the last administration, Jeff Sessions and uh, William Barr. And, and I was here on the Hill for both of those confirmation hearings, and, and they were quite different. And of course, the times were different, too. Uh, but both of those men didn't have uh, quite the same uh, demeanor in front of this committee as uh, Merrick Garland did. Merrick Garland seemed to bring uh, a very personal tone uh, to his answers. And uh, it was just to give people some color about a Senate Judiciary confirmation hearing. Um, they usually are full of people in there. You have people who are able to come in and sit uh, and listen, just members of the public, tourists who want to sit and listen. Sometimes you even have protesters. They can be very contentious proceedings as well. So this was a little different. Just the tone overall was very um, striking to me because it was far different from what we've experienced before. And that also has to do with COVID. Uh, the cap is still uh, shut down to the public because of COVID precautions and right now also because of the heightened security. But it was a, a very relaxed confirmation hearing and, and one that is not very uh, typical of a Senate confirmation hearing. Let's bring in political reporter Joyce Coe now. Uh, Joyce, thanks for joining us. You've been monitoring President Biden's cabinet nominees. So what's the latest on where things stand? Well, Libby, of the 23 cabinet secretaries and cabinet level positions that President Biden has made nominations for, seven of those positions have so far been confirmed by the Senate. And when you're looking at prior administrations, uh, Biden's four predecessors, uh, Trump, Obama, Clinton and Bush, 
The Biden administration is actually moving slower. Uh, all four of those administrations at this point in their presidential uh, administrations have had already had more confirmations through the Senate at this point. Uh, and that could be uh, for a number of different reasons. Obviously, the impeachment trial of former President uh, Trump slowed things down for the administration uh, in the first several weeks of um, you know, getting the ball rolling there. And then in addition to that, um, the Democratic controlled Senate flipped quite late uh, after the start of the new year. So a couple of um, things sort of slowing down the Biden administration and getting these uh, appointments through. A additional um, roadblocks could be in the way for the Biden administration. We are seeing growing opposition to uh, Biden's pick to lead the Office of Management and Budget, uh, Neera Tandon. Over tweets that she uh, has made, she's very active on Twitter, at least she was prior to uh, her nomination, and uh, it's given senators a reason to say they will be voting against her confirmation. We heard from uh, the conservative Democrat Joe Manchin saying that he would be voting against her. And then as of today, we heard from Susan Collins of Maine, uh, as well as Senator Mitt Romney, uh, who have said that they will be voting against her because of her temperament and because of these tweets where she went after uh, both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, in addition to this, we are seeing um, some opposition to uh, Xavier Becerra, who is the who's nominated to be Biden's Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services. Ted Cruz and several other Republican senators, as well as some members of the House, have signed this letter and sent it over to the Biden administration, uh, discussing their opposition to Becerra, saying that they disagree with his position on things like Medicare for all and abortion. Uh, in their letter, they also say that Becerra doesn't have experience with. Um, health care. Uh, and, and another nomination that we'll be looking for this week is uh, Deb Haaland, the uh, nominated to be the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, and that's a department that really deals with protecting um, Native lands. And she would be the first Native American uh, to, to head that department. So a significant uh, confirmation there. But we're hearing as of late that um, Senator Joe Manchin, who is the chairman of the Energy Committee that she will be in front of tomorrow, is still undecided on whether or not to vote yes on her confirmation. So those are sort of the three that we are looking at right now that could have uh, some opposition. Neera Tandon, of course, uh, really at the top of that list because it, with this 50-50 uh, split in the Senate, every vote counts and it's looking like the math uh, could potentially not be on her side, although the White House has said uh, today during their press conference, uh, press briefing, Jen Psaki saying that uh, they are confident that her nomination will go through, that Biden is not going to be pulling that nomination, and they are working to get the votes. Uh, Becerra and Halland will be in their own confirmation hearings tomorrow, uh, and they are a part of the four other hearings that we will be seeing later this week. Libby? Joyce Co. thanks so much. Well, one issue that came up in today's hearing of Merrick Garland is the death penalty. So let's listen to Judge Garland describe his evolving belief on capital punishment. When I became a judge originally, uh, I supported uh, the death penalty at that time for Mr. McVeigh in, in, in that individual case. I don't have uh, any regret, um, but I have developed uh, concerns about the death penalty in the 20 some years since then. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and the sources of my concern are uh, issues of exonerations of people who have been convicted of uh, sort of arbitrariness and randomness of its application because of how seldom it's applied and because of its disparate impact on uh, black Americans and uh, members of other communities of color. Those are the things that give me pause. And uh, those are things that have given me pause over the last, you know, as I thought about it over the last 20 years. Merrick Garland speaking earlier today. Let's go to Mary Beth Albright uh, for more on that. His experience overseeing the prosecution of Timothy McVeigh for the Oklahoma City bombing uh, is something that's been held up as a, as a hallmark by both Democrats and Republicans. So what did we learn today in terms of his viewpoint on capital punishment, Mary Beth? Well, I'll start out just by saying that the reason that it's held up by both Democrats and Republicans is because he was on the ground like the next day in Oklahoma City, which is unusual for a prosecutor, right? Um, or for, at that point, an investigator. Um, and he, there was that human side to it. So now we see him exhibiting that human side 
um, when he's talking about, look, I, I do have an opinion on the death penalty. I did ser- seek it for, for this person I was prosecuting. Um, but my, but my views have evolved. Um, and, and they haven't, they've evolved because of more information available to us. And I think that, think about the, the, um, the progress that we've made in DNA testing, right? In the past 25 years, in the way that we can collect evidence and the way that we can look at, at it, the technology is just completely different than it was 25 years ago. And so I, I really appreciated um, that he is somebody who is, who looks at the technology, who looks at the way things are different than the last time that he was at the Department of Justice and says, you know, I, I have to look at this. I have some stuff to learn. And I think that the career attorneys at the Department of Justice are really going to appreciate that about him. I think they're really going to appreciate that this idea that he has their backs. Every time he was asked about another attorney that there were questions about, he was, uh, this person is a great attorney. This person is a person of integrity. And, you know, that holds a lot of weight with Merrick Garland, because when you have a person who is known for integrity the way that he is, saying that another person is known for their integrity, you give it a lot of weight. And I got to say, Libby, I think he's the most patient man in Washington today, maybe the world. I don't know. Definitely in Washington, because the way that he answered those questions and some of them got contentious. And I feel as if he answered those questions in such a way that it brought the temperature down, which is what you're really looking for in somebody who runs an agency that is as sprawling and with as 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 big intellects as the Department of Justice. Let's bring in Dave Weigel, national political correspondent. So, so Dave, if you're going to undergo a confirmation process, you got to stay cool in the seat, right? Um, so that that's that's definitely a, a prerequisite for undergoing this process for the most part. Let's talk about your big takeaways from Merrick Garland's performance today. Uh, well, it's very clear that he's not going to have a problem getting confirmed. Uh, he's, he's been vetted several times now. Uh, his The positions he's taken... In various cases that Republicans brought up, I don't think any of them were at the top of people's minds. Uh, I thought it was interesting when Tom Cotton went a couple of rounds of asking Garland about the death penalty, something where the politics has shifted, uh, you know, in light speed in the Democratic Party, but there's still political opposition to getting rid of it t- uh, totally. Uh, that was the, the closest I saw to Garland being a little bit stuck on a point because he he was asked, you know, uh, to consider a hypothetical Biden administration policy and how he'd implement it. On the rest, and a lot of stuff that Republicans had uh, had previewed going to the hearing, none of that really tripped him up. And why would it? And the I, the one question that Senator Durbin uh, again pointed out, he kept getting and getting, was about whether it'd interfere with this uh, John Durham probe that the Bar Justice Department created. Uh, I did never seen the political point of that because this is a probe that does not affect Joe Biden or people of the administration. It's kind of litigating something the former president was obsessed with. Uh, really for half of his presidency, was finding out who was uh, investigating his campaign over its Russia ties. And so at least four times I counted, maybe more, he said he wasn't going to interfere. Uh, you saw Ted Cruz also, again, he previewed this, and he was going to say, uh, get Garland's commitment to n- both not interfering in the probe of um, Andrew Cuomo and criticizing the U.S. attorney, or saying the U.S. attorney uh, who's related to, the, to that situation, to, you know, familial related relations should recuse, which Garland said. Um, so, no, I mean, this is fairly, I think, as the week goes on, as you get people who have clashed more with Republicans, I think you're going to see more heat. This seemed like a pretty smooth, smooth uh, operation, with uh, the exceptions being, you could see some questions that might play differently with hotter nominees, you know, nominees who are less used to just sitting there and being lectured to than Merrick Garland is. I guess that, that experience as a judge does help you in that respect, Dave. Um, before we let you go, uh, you know, I want you to reflect on the broader confirmation fights that the Biden team is going through right now. We heard from Joyce Cohen update on where things stand, but are, are you sensing any sort of movement now to, to sort of push back by Republicans or by moderates uh, against the, the nominee pool that have yet to be confirmed, Dave? Uh, yeah, and so... Things changed a little bit on Friday because you had Joe Manchin say that he would object to uh, Neera Tannen's confirmation based on her tweets about Republicans. Uh, that's fairly unique. And, and it, no aspersions cast on Neera Tannen, but most people nominated for this cabinet have just not had very active 
punchy Twitter personalities. I mean, uh, then people might bring up some stuff from uh, Jennifer Granholm's TV appearances, but not to the level of why were you arguing on you know, it late in the night and calling somebody Moscow Mitch, et cetera. So I think uh, that more than anything that happened today uh, influenced how Republicans think. But the, the nominees that they're most aggressive in targeting right now, if that's the right way to put it, uh, are Deb Holland, who uh, Republicans object to because she is very outspoken against building natural gas pipelines over in places where people don't want them, uh, and, and Javier Becerra, who they're outspoken to on issues basically that, that did not win the election. I mean, the Republican objection to Becerra is that uh, he you know, sued the Trump administration a lot, which is pretty popular, uh, that he is against the or he's for birth control mandates, even in religious institutions. That's less popular, but it's not unpopular. And he's very pro-choice, very pro-Medicare for all. Again, neither of those is the kind of thing that in the past people have said you can't you can't serve in the government without that. They've kind of emphasized that he's not an, an MD. Well, in this century, there's been only one MD as health secretary, who's Tom Price, and kind of a mess who couldn't last a year. So I think those are the ones to to poke out. Uh, I think those I can't predict how effective Republicans will be, but you saw both some of their tactics and some of the traps they set for themselves. I mean, I really didn't get the sense that having half of their conference go back and back to the Durham investigation, something that if you are not clued into the Russia response, the Russia investigation and the counter investigation uh, goes right off over your head. I mean, if I if we still had cocktail parties, I'm not sure how many cocktail parties I could have a conversation about that scandal with. Ah, cocktail parties. Remember those? Uh, Dave Weigel, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Really appreciate it, Dave. I'd also like to thank my colleagues Rhonda Colvin and Mary Beth Albright. Thanks to both of you. And thank you to our viewers for watching this special report from the Washington Post newsroom. We'll be back here tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, for a rare joint hearing. This one's between the Senate Rules Committee and the Committee on Homeland Security. They'll join forces to investigate the security failures that led to the breach of the Capitol on January 6th by pro-Trump rioters. And the witnesses include the acting chief of police, Robert Conti, and the former chief of Capitol Police, Stephen Sun. So tune into that tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. I'm Libby Casey. See you then. Sometimes you have to see to believe. Sometimes waiting isn't an option. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written with our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer. An entire year of The Washington Post for $29. Go to WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you.